Honorable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Senators. <clears throat> At the commencement of business, I wish to acknowledge the coronation of King Charles III on the weekend and extend congratulations to His Majesty on this occasion. I am pleased Australia was represented by a diverse representation of our nation at this event. Thank you. Uh, Clark. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. As President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Uh, senator Wong, I believe. Um, I seek leave to make uh, a statement to the Senate in relation to the events in Sudan. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Wong. Uh, I thank the Senate. Uh, President, I start by extending my thoughts uh, and the thoughts of all of those in this place to the people of Sudan and to the Sudanese Australian community. What is taking place in Sudan is deeply troubling. Hundreds of innocent people have been killed and thousands more injured. Despite the reported ceasefire, heavy fighting continues across Sudan. And I reiterate Australia's call for all parties to return to negotiations and agree to a permanent cessation of hostilities. Since the beginning of the crisis, Australia has worked to assist Australians and their families to leave Sudan. Without an embassy in Sudan, we have worked closely with our friends and partners who have a presence on the ground just as we support our friends and partners in, a, in the event of a crisis in our region. I've been in close contact with my counterparts on this effort, including Indonesia, the United Kingdom, Germany, France and the UAE. More than 240 Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade officers have worked on Australia's response, making calls to more than 400 Australian citizens, permanent residents and family members in Sudan, as well as hundreds of their concerned family and friends here in Australia organising departure options, remotely arranging travel for Australians across disrupted cities, engaging diplomatically to push for ceasefires to inform our understanding and our decisions, and working around the clock in our crisis centre. Uh, we have deployed additional consular staff to Djibouti, Saudi Arabia, to Cyprus and Egypt to, to support Australians arriving from Sudan. We prioritise visa applications for those impacted by the conflict and embedded Australian officials in the United Kingdom's crisis centre as part of our efforts. We facilitated the departure of more than 230 Australians through Sudan via more than 20 flights, ferries and convoys, and more than 130 of these Australians is now, are now in Australia. As part of our contribution to international efforts, we sent ADF assets, a defect crisis response team and members of the Australian Border Force to assist. And across two Australian flights, 153 people were evacuated, 57 Australians and their families, as well as 96 foreign nationals from 10 partner countries. So in this Senate, I wish to thank, on behalf of the government, 
uh, all those officials from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade who have worked as part of the crisis response, as well as members of the Australian Defence Force and Australian Border Force deployed to assist in the evacuation effort. Some Australians remain in Sudan because they have chosen to or because they are not in a position to leave, and they do so for many reasons. Family is often one of those, security is another. Uh, we remain in direct contact with registered Australians and their families in Sudan, and I again reiterate uh, my request that those who have not registered should do so. There are still departure options available from Port Sudan. However, of course, any travel routes should be assessed carefully as the situation remains volatile and it remains dangerous. This conflict has exacerbated the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Sudan, which was already suffering high levels of food insecurity with large numbers of displaced people. In response, the government will provide an initial $6 million in humanitarian assistance, a $1 million to the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is still operating in Sudan, which, will, which provides much-needed medical supplies, food, water, sanitation, emergency shelter and protection for the most vulnerable. $5 million to Australia's international partners delivering life-saving humanitarian assistance in the region. And this is, of course, on top of the flexible core funding to humanitarian partners and UN agencies that Australia provides. We again call on all parties to the conflict to uphold international law and, provide and protect civilians, including health and humanitarian aid workers, and I've no doubt all in this chamber would uh, support that call. The Sudanese people deserve a chance for peace and a pathway to civilian-led government. I thank the Senator. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. The President, the Coalition joins with the government in expressing our concerns at the ongoing violence in Sudan, uh, a conflict, violence and humanitarian crisis, which in its now latest element of this ongoing tragedy is in its fourth week of more intense conflict and battle. We join the government in calling for the parties, the National Army, the Rapid Support Forces and others engaged in conflict to urgently cease hostilities, to return to negotiations and also to settle arrangements to protect humanitarian assistance that people across Sudan desperately need and deserve. We also urge them to continue to work to provide for safe passage for those who want to leave areas where fighting is taking place including the capital, Khartoum and Darfur. President, more than 100,000 people have reportedly fled Sudan into neighbouring South Sudan, Egypt and Ethiopia, sparking further humanitarian crises in parts of the world already struggling with such challenges. At least 700 are estimated to have been killed, although those estimates may be far too understated. According to humanitarian groups, the majority of those killed have been civilians. The opposition welcomes the government's initial contribution of $6 million in humanitarian assistance, including the provision of $1 million to the International Committee of the Red Cross for immediate relief, such as medical supplies, food, water and sanitation, emergency shelter and protection. We welcome also the provision of $5 million to Australia's international partners who are leading the delivery of humanitarian assistance. I join the Minister President in acknowledging publicly the work of the members of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Consular and Crisis Management team for their efforts alongside those of the Australian Defence Force, other officials, NGO supporters who have all helped with efforts uh, to ensure the safe evacuation of Australians who are in Sudan and indeed nationals of other partner countries in Sudan. Their evacuation required intense effort negotiation and assistance. I also thank on the record the numerous partner nations who helped to provide for the early evacuation of Australians and ensure their safety. Often unheralded, often unheralded these officials in our consular and crisis management team deal with Australians and their loved ones, often at their very worst and in the most difficult of circumstances, and this event demonstrates yet again the worth of their tireless efforts right around the clock each and every day of the year. The Coalition joins with members of the Australian Sudanese community who remain concerned about loved ones still in Sudan and about the future of their country. We urge the Australian Government and all nations to continue to provide support to ongoing efforts with partners and allies to evacuate Australian citizens and others who need to leave 
and to continue to support efforts towards peaceful resolution. And we urge the parties within Sudan and their supporters to use any and every opportunity uh, to pursue a peaceful end to this conflict, including through the current talks occurring in Saudi Arabia. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Steeljohn. Uh, seek leave, President. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Steeljohn. Thank you. The outbreak of violence in Sudan has been nothing short of a tragedy. With thousands of people having been killed over the past weeks, millions trapped without access to food, water or electricity, uh, this is an emergence of a humanitarian crisis of the most severe nature. Whilst countries around the world have rushed to evacuate their citizens, the Australian Greens want to extend our solidarity to the people of Sudan left behind desperately seeking an exit route towards democracy uh, in the nation itself. We also extend our thoughts to the families of the diaspora community here in Australia, painfully waiting to hear of news of their families in Sudan. The capital of Sudan, Khartoum, has been the centre of violence and outbreaks of the most horrific nature of conflict uh, in the recent weeks, with a 100,000-strong uh, force of the Rapid Support Forces uh, the relevant paramilitary group to the conflict, uh, fighting for control and for power. This follows four years of Sudan's attempt to build a civilian-led government arising from decades of military rule. Plans for civilian rule have been jeopardised as ceasefires across the country uh, are repeatedly breached. The two clashing forces have been linked to war crimes across the nation, including ethnic uh, cleansing in regions uh, such as Darfur, uh, the Nubian Mountains and the Blue Nile region. The battle follows uh, on from killings of over 2,000 peaceful protesters in front of military headquarters on the, 3rd of on the 3rd of June in 2019. This is a continual battle the people of Sudan have been in for democracy in their nation. Sudanese people in the country and across the diaspora have repeated their wish uh, to remove the military dictatorship and to see democracy come to Sudan. They wish to see a reckoning with the reality that many nations throughout the world have failed to engage as diligently and as continually as they should have in relation to the promotion of democracy in Sudan and fear now that there is a potential for a global and more broader, a broader global conflict uh, within the particular region involving external powers. The Australian Greens join uh, with the government and are pleased to see the actions that have been taken uh, by the government in relation to the provision of humanitarian assistance. Uh, but we continue uh, to call on the Australian government broadly and the foreign ministry specifically uh, to engage ahead of time uh, in regions beyond uh, the Asia-Pacific to ensure that Australia's engagement is truly global in the world and we are playing a full role as a responsible actor in that global community. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. If no other statements, um, I'll call that up. Senator Faruqi. Um, uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the consideration of the education and other legislation amendment abolishing indexation and raising the minimum repayment income for education and training, training loans bill 2022. Is leave granted? Our leave is not granted, Senator Fruki. To contingent notice, standing in the name of the leader of the Australian Greens in the Senate, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion relating to the conduct of business, namely a motion to provide for the consideration of the education and other legislation amendment abolishing indexation and raising the minimum repayment income for education and training, training loans bill 2022. President, more than 3 million Australians will see their student debts swell by a staggering 7.1 per cent on 1 June. And 1 June is approaching fast. The clock is ticking. This parliament needs to act, and it needs to act now. This matter is urgent because in a few short weeks, people with an average debt of $24,000 will be hit with a $1,700 increase to their debt. For more than half a million people with debts of around $40,000, their debts will go up by 
$2,840, and it will be much higher for others. What's about to hit is nothing short of a student debt avalanche, and this is on top of the 3.9% increase last June. The government knows the avalanche is coming and knows it will hit young people, women, and those on lower income the hardest. Yet, they are doing absolutely nothing about it in the budget tonight. And the Greens won't let them get away with doing nothing. People deserve better than to be caught up in a student debt spiral that is out of control. That's why I'm seeking to have the Greens bill, which would abolish indexation and raise minimum repayment income to median wage, brought on for consideration right now. We can't wait any longer. The clock is ticking. People right now are struggling with the cost of living as it rages on. People right now are living in poverty. They are having to choose between heating and eating, between buying medicine or a train ticket, being paying rent or paying back their ballooning study debt. Their study debts are rising faster than they can pay them off. Something needs to be done, and it needs to be done right now. Students were out there in force today in a rally outside Parliament demanding action. Some of them are in here right now. And I applaud, I applaud your activism and your courage to fight for the right thing. We have the opportunity to act on student debt before indexation hits on 1 June. And this bill is a clear and immediate step to start tackling the student debt crisis while providing cost of living relief as we work towards wiping all student debt and making lifelong education fee-free for all. This bill immediately halts indexation of all study loans, effectively freezing debt levels and saving 3.2 million Australians from being hit by a deeply unfair 7.1% rise in student debt. The bill lifts the current minimum repayment threshold of $48,361 to median wage, which is $65,000. No one with a study debt will have to repay a cent of that debt until they're earning above the median wage. The system that asks people to start paying off student debt, which is unfair from the start, when they earn barely above minimum wage, is a cruel, unfair, and deeply cooked system. These measures are desperately and urgently needed to bring some fairness to this broken student loan system and to provide relief to millions of Australians struggling under the weight of ballooning student debt. Soaring student debt is already locking people out of the housing market, making it harder for them to get personal loans. It's crushing their dreams of further study and causing people to rethink starting a family. And it is causing young people enormous financial and mental stress. The growing burden of student debt is having an enormous impact every day on people's lives. It is actually making news every day. Yet, a Senate committee inquiry, which heard overwhelming evidence of why student debt should be frozen, indexation scrapped, and minimum repayment income raised, where young people, students, graduates, women, unions, all said that these measures should be taken, yet Labour refused to accept that evidence. Today, we can choose to make life easier for millions of people. And senators today can actually show people that they care about changing a deeply unfair system. Not just talk about it. Talk is cheap. Action is what we need. Or otherwise, they can be held accountable for their actions. If the Labour government can afford to splurge hundreds of billions of dollars, on war machines and stage three tax cuts for the billionaires, then these modest measures can surely, can surely be affordable. We need action on student debt and we need that action urgently. So I urge the Senate to listen to the loud and desperate calls of the community, of students, of young people, and support the motion so we can make a decision in the interests of the people we serve, not corporations and billionaires. Thank you, Senator Fariki. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, and I rise to respond to this because I want to put some facts on the table about what is actually driving this. The Greens are moving this, uh, this motion, a procedural motion, to upend the Senate's procedures uh, to, so that they can continue with blocking billions of dollars being invested into Australian housing. That is why you are doing it. You've had this private senator's bill in this parliament since November. 
you have chosen not to bring it on for debate at the appropriate time. You have chosen. You have times when you can debate this bill if you cared about it so much. But no, you want to use it as cover, and all those people who care about this as cover for not debating $10 billion investment in Australian housing. So you are trying to continue to block more investment in affordable housing in this country, and this is cover for it. The government wants to debate the housing bill. We want to debate the housing bill because a it was an election commitment. B we actually want more affordable housing in this country, and we have the Greens and the Liberals teaming up to oppose more investment in housing. Who would have thought the Greens party would be lining up with the Liberals to oppose more investment in housing? Now, we know on this side of the chamber too many Australians hit by growing rents, too many Australians struggling to buy a home, too many Australians experiencing homelessness. So your solution is to block investment in supply. That's your solution. Let's not add more money to let's not add to supply because you want a political stunt. Because you want a political oh, yeah. stunt. It's so cynical. Oh, it's yeah. so cynical to, to, to pretend you care about people who are struggling with rent, struggling with homelessness, then turn up to the Senate and vote with the Tories against more investment in housing. That's the, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, we're not in London. Vote with the coalition, with the Liberals and the Nationals, against public investment in housing. Now, uh, to, uh, now let, let me say this. This government understands what is happening in housing in this country and the way in which it is turning, frankly, into an inter, inter, intergenerational uh, disadvantage. It is turning to an uh, intergenerational injustice. It is. And that is why, after 10 years of inaction on those that side, we have locked $575 million from the National Housing Infrastructure Fund with houses already under construction, a housing accord with the states. Order. Yeah, they don't like it, do they? Order. You can keep pointing and yelling, but everybody knows you're voting against money for housing. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing, uh, Senator Shoebridge. No amount of yelling is going, to, is going to distract from the fact you're voting with the Liberals against more investment in affordable housing. Uh, Senator Wong, I return. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson Young. Of order, Chair. I'd just like um, to remind the Minister to speak through the Chair and not to individual senators. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. I will also remind this order. Order. Senator Wong. I will also remind all senators in this chamber that when Senator Faruqi was on her feet, people, every single senator in this chamber listened in respectful silence. I expect the same for every other speaker that follows after. Thank you, Senator Wong. One of the ways in which the federal government, particularly after 10 years of inaction or by those opposite, can, can uh, work to improve uh, access to housing is to improve supply. And that is what we are seeking to do. $575 million National Housing Infrastructure Facility, Housing Accord, which includes federal funding to deliver 10,000 affordable homes, the Regional First Home Buyers Guarantee, which is helping thousands of Australians at home ownership, to a, 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 a budget which will deliver billions of dollars, $2 billion for financing more social and affordable rental housing through the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Uh, and a significant expansion of eligible, eligibility criteria for the Home Guarantee Scheme, as well as a boost to homelessness funding to states and territories. So the HAF, the Housing Australia Future Fund, is not all we are doing. We are, it is not all we are doing. It is one aspect of a multi-pronged plan and substantial investment to start, try and deal with it. Uh, because we actually understand that the Commonwealth can do more to put more supply on the table, and that will have an effect on affordability. Uh, now, I've watched over the years the Greens and the Liberals team up on some things that we've watched them over the, previously, as you know, team up against the carbon price. Uh, but this really, uh, this stunt today to try and give yourselves cover for not debating a bill, I mean, really. At least have the courage of your convictions. What we keep hearing is, oh, they're just going to make sure they don't have to vote for it. If you really believe this is so bad, if you really think that $10 billion of, of, gov of taxpayer funds to provide more housing supply in this country is not worthy, then stand up and have the guts to argue it.
But no, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to do, uh, and Senator McKim, I heard on today on the radio, you know, you're trying to find a way to not actually have the argument. We're for more investment in public, social, and affordable housing. You're with the Libs against it. End of story. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Ruston. Thank you very much, um, President. Well, the coalition will not be supporting this suspension because intrinsically we believe it is the right of the government of the day to set the legislative agenda uh, for the week. So therefore we will be voting against this. But in doing so, I also put on the record that using the procedures and mechanisms of this chamber to try and divert delay um, uh, just because the government is not able to reach an agreement with the party, the other party of government that they need in order for them to be able to get their bill through, I think is also quite an egregious breach of the use of the, the procedures of this chamber. Um, you know, this is a government who works with the Greens and the crossbench to often breach conventions that have held this place in such good esteem for many, many decades. Um, and it's the pride with which we have always come into this chamber and said it's the processes and the procedures and the conventions that we have all upheld that has made this chamber work the way it is. But of recent times we've just continued to see that eroded and eroded and eroded for the convenience of those to try and get through whatever it is that they're trying to shove through without going through those appropriate processes. And, you know, there are many examples I could use of how this has happened, whether it be committee referrals that go through the wrong committees, committee referrals that are denied, um, OPDs that are not answered, responses that come back into this chamber that show complete and utter contempt for the procedures of this place. And I think you'll probably see over the coming days a number of those OPDs uh, that we have received back and FOIs that we've received back, but particularly OPDs where the ministers have just point blank refused to answer a question, a legitimate question that this chamber has asked and has voted and required the government to return, and they're just refusing to do so. Um, we also continue to see legislation that's not even been consulted on, um, and yet they use their numbers in this place to shove it through. Um, we see constantly um, legislation that's brought in here that has got absolutely no substance to it at all, and apparently we've just got to trust the government and trust the Greens and trust everyone that it's all going to be fine, everything's going to be contained in supported legislation, so we have just got to go through on trust. I think it's time that this place actually took a very serious look at itself and thought about what its intention really is in terms of upholding the most important job that we have here, and that is to constantly review uh, everything that comes through this place, instead of doing dirty deals on the side and using the conventions and the mechanisms of this chamber to play your games, which I fear that once again this uh, this uh, uh, motion that is before us from Senator Faruqi today is absolutely doing that. In relation to the substance and the argument that's going on between uh, the Greens and the Labor Party um, around the substance of the particular bill that they're trying not to debate and the substance of the bill that you are now seeking to debate. These are both very important issues that this chamber should be able to have the opportunity to prosecute appropriately. But to come in here and ask us to allow you to bring on for debate a bill that we didn't know anything about the intention of it to be, mm -hmm. to be debated now, with giving us five minutes' notice, and expect those in this chamber who didn't know you were going to do this to have the opportunity to make sensible contributions yeah. around something that is as important as making sure that the education and the financial commitments that sit around the education of Australians, um, I think, is the most disrespectful thing that you can do to this chamber. So I think in, in summing up what we're seeing before us today is we see disrespect around the way the conventions of the chamber are being used and the reason that they're being used around really important substantive issues that matter so much, particularly to young Australians. Uh, but at the same time, we sit here looking at a government who doesn't seem to mind trashing the conventions that have stood this parliament and this Senate in such good stead since the, this, this parliament was first conceived uh, many, many, many years ago, that it is really quite a travesty that we are now standing here wasting the time of the Senate um, on cheap stunts. So I would say to those opposite, all of those opposite, right the way down to the other end of the chamber, why don't we all actually move back to where we were 
where we actually respected the conventions of this place, we respected each other, we respected the right to have a proper process to enable everybody in this place to be able to debate important matters in a respectful and timely way. And can we just stop with the stunts and get on with supporting this parliament to deliver the best possible government and alternative government that is possible? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Um, yeah, I'll just. Just checking the time. Senator Rice, please go ahead. President, there should be no greater priority for legislation to be brought to this Senate than legislation which is going to help lift people out of poverty. And that's what Senator Faruqi's bill does. That's why it is urgent. That's why we should be debating it now, particularly on Budget Day, particularly given on Budget Day that we have heard all the rumours that there are going to be so many people left behind. Students, young people, people with disabilities, people who deserve to not be living in poverty. They are going to be left behind by the budget that the Labor government brings down tonight. And this government is not going to be taking the action that that's needed to be allowing people to live a dignified life with the income that they need to be able to be not living in poverty. I am absolutely proud to be here as part of a Greens team that wants to prioritise debating a bill that is going to freeze and abolish indexation on student debt rather than a piece of housing legislation that is totally inadequate to tackle the scale of the crisis. It is totally inappropriate that we should be debating the government's pathetic housing bill today because it is just not up to the job. We have got a housing crisis in Australia. We have got a rent um, crisis. We have got skyrocketing rents. We have got the very same young people that Senator Faruqi's bill is trying to do something to address the financial circumstances that they are in. Those young people that are looking at a future of never being able to afford to buy a home, actually not even being able to afford to rent a home. We have got young people that are living on the streets, young people that are couch surfing, young people that are, that are living in cars, young people that are having to abandon their studies so that they can work in low-income jobs to be able to afford to pay the rent and deciding that, no, they cannot afford to keep studying. We are absolutely destroying the lives of the young people that Senator Faruqi's bill is going to do something, trying to do something to improve their circumstances. If the housing bill that the government is trying to bring on to, to debate today is absolutely inadequate. It's not going to guarantee any money gets spent. It's basically putting that $10 billion of money to gamble it on the stock market. And if we had had the same conditions last year as uh, going forward, there is the only guarantee that the government has now said is that there are going to be t at least 1,200 homes that would be built. That means that in Victoria, 240 houses that would be built. 1,200 homes over the forwards, 240 houses a year. 240 houses a year. In New South Wales, all that we would be guaranteed is 240 houses a year. You think of the tens of thousands of people. You look at the public housing waiting lists that are decades long, and that's what this government thinks is adequate. The Greens want the government to come back to the negotiation table and get serious. They'll be proposing some legislation that actually tackles the scale of the crisis. And meanwhile, if they are not willing to do that, we are continuing. We will keep on ramping up the pressure to get them to come back to the negotiation table so that they can deliver some legislation that actually is going to tackle the scale of the housing crisis. Meanwhile, we think that Senator Faruqi's bill is a much more appropriate bill to be debating today because Senator Faruqi has introduced a bill that would have made a meaningful difference in students' lives. And we're di very disappointed that the Labor Party don't see that they can support it. It would help alleviate the financial stress and the hardship that's being faced by those people living below the poverty line. And the students that are in the gallery today know what I'm talking about. And you know, they would have listened to Senator Wong's contribution and say, why does Senator Wong, why does the Labor Party hate young people, hate students? It is time for the government to take some responsibility 
for the student debt crisis and support students in their support of education and a brighter future. As Greens, we are committed to be supporting young people for a fairer, for a better future. I mean, student debt is an absolutely significant problem in Australia that affects the lives of millions of people. And though, particularly those living on income support, those living in poverty, way below the poverty line, who are you know, always trying to cope with the threat of being you know, um, evicted from their houses, they are the people that absolutely need to have measures taken to improve their lives. That's what the Greens are trying to do, and we will defend our right to do that, to try and bring on legislation to do that yes, to sir. anyone. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Senator Rice. Senator Chisholm. Really, really want to avoid debate on the housing bill, don't they? It's pretty clear this morning that stunt after stunt, delay after delay, they want to avoid debate on the housing bill. And they will come in here and play any trick in the book. We saw it um, over the last month, the type of language that they're using. We heard from the language from Senator Rice just then as well. Um, outrageous claims that Senator Rice is making um, that the Greens are actually signing up to. And they had months to introduce the bill and debate the bill that they're trying to bring on today. They introduced it in November. It's been sitting on the notice paper since November. They've had it there waiting for a stunt. Waiting for a stunt. It actually wasn't something that they were committed to. They could have used private members' bills when they've had opportunities to do it, yet they don't. Yet they're trying uh, to use the difficult circumstances that many students face uh, as a pawn in this debate. But that's important. That's an issue that needs to be addressed. But so does housing, and this is what the government promised in the election campaign that we actually intend on delivering in government and actually earning the respect and support of the Australian people as a result by being a government that says it will do something and then introduces the legislation and gets on with doing it. But in the last month, we've actually learned a fair bit about the Greens, and I think their stunt today is evidence of their lack of confidence in their housing spokesperson, because he says a lot. He talks a lot, and the more he talks, the more mistakes that he makes. And it is a real fact that they don't want to have the debate because they have a lack of confidence Order. in their position, a lack of confidence in their position on this policy. So what have we learnt over the last couple of months? And you know, they're obviously very nervous about the strategy that they've taken. Uh, they're very having second thoughts, hopefully, about opposing this bill because it will make such a significant difference. And they're not actually listening to the peak bodies that are actually supportive of our policy because they will know it will make a difference. They're not supportive, they're not listening to those peak bodies. And they're also, um, in the last month, what we've seen, uh, their shadow housing, their housing spokesperson opposed new developments in his own electorate. Uh, there he is proudly standing with the sign saying, no, I oppose this development. So they're saying on one hand that we need more housing, yet in their own electorates they're actually opposing new housing developments. It is classic Greens hypocrisy and we are seeing it playing out in the national parliament uh, now that they've got some of these former student politicians elected that actually haven't graduated beyond student politics. That's still the way they're carrying out. Well, this is a much more important issue to let student politicians loose that haven't graduated. Um, housing is a serious challenge in the country. In the capital cities, in regional Australia, it is something that needs urgent government attention. That's why we took the $10 billion fund, uh, talked about it before the election campaign, took it to the election and won a majority on the back of policies like that. That's why we are going around trying to implement it, because we know it will make a difference for those people who need it the most. Yet it is so unfortunate that the Greens have been led down this path and actually uh, cannot see the opportunity that presents us. For the first time in a decade, we have a national government that's actually providing national leadership on housing. Housing ministers around the country are meeting for the first time. We're working with local governments. Senator Wong talked about some of the other policies that we are putting in place around housing as well, because we know that this is something that is important. We know that so many people around the country uh, need government support and need that national leadership that we are providing. So the Greens opposing this, this is what they are standing in the way of. 
$10 billion Housing Future Fund that will deliver 30,000 new social and affordable homes. They are delaying homes for people in, in need, homes for women and children fleeing domestic violence, homes for older women and veterans who are at risk of homelessness. They are the real people that are relying on the Housing Australia Future Fund. But once again, um, the Greens are showing that they're happy to put politics first. They're happy to put politics first. They're happy to play silly games and play people against each other uh, when there is a real need for us to pass this housing bill now so that we can be a federal government that gets on with the job of delivering affordable housing for those that need it. That's what this government wants to achieve. That's what we are determined to deliver on in government. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Uh, I'm going to Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. The Greens want to talk about cancelling hex debt. Well, let's talk about the hex debt of students who started their degrees and were then forced to abandon their degrees because of COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Any student who started studying their degree at university before COVID-19 arrived in this country and subsequently was forced to abandon their studies because of a COVID, an inhuman COVID-19 injection mandate, whether the mandate was at the university or at a placement that they were required to undertake as part of their degree, should have their hex debt immediately cancelled. Should have their hex debt immediately cancelled. When they signed up to their multi-year degrees, there was no requirement for them to take an untested experimental gene therapy-based injection. Uh, Senator Roberts, if you could resume your seat for a moment. Um, the substance of your response needs to focus on the motion put forward by Senator Faruqi, which is to suspend business to um, debate the bill the Greens want to put forward. So you do need to respond to why you, you agree or disagree or make other comments around the urgency of that suspension motion. Thank you, President. I'm getting to that point right now. Okay. Halfway through their degrees, that, ruled, that rule was changed on them and they had no say over it. Their, their debt should be cancelled immediately. That's why One Nation will be opposing this motion to suspend standing orders, because we want a proper debate, we want a royal commission, we want it dealt with properly so that students who have um, been kicked out of university or stopped their studies or stopped their placement get a fair say and have their hex debt cancelled. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, Senator Ayres. Well, Senator Rice said, Senator Rice said, for all the students in the gallery. I mean, the students in the gallery left a minute after you lot were on your feet because they could see what a miserable, pathetic stunt this all really was. What a stunt it all really was. Because what, what the Greens party, we get uh, to see Senator here, Ayres. Madam President, Senator Ayres. A, a sort of stunt after stunt. Senator Ayres, please resume your seat. Senator Ayres. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, my point of order is that the member should direct the contributions through the chair and not point and gesticulate at the Greens and in the manner in which he's behaving. Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I'll, uh, Senator Ayres did not refer in particular to any senator, but I will remind him that uh, pointing at senators is inappropriate. Thank you, Senator Ayres. What a, what a useful contribution that was, Madam President. I, I don't want to point... I don't, want to point, I don't want to point to them, but I do want to point out that this is where the students of Australia get to see the real colours, the real colours of the Greens Party. What is this really about? Is it about some of the affordability and other challenges that people face in the higher education sector? Not for a minute. Not for a minute is it about any of those things. Now, the government's got a process. The government's got a process examining the real issues that sit there in higher education and for students in terms of affordability. But what is this really about, apart, apart from some glib US-style sloganeering about cancelling debt and all of the other derivative nonsense that these, this group of characters carry on about? They are asking the Senate to choose between two things this week. Are we dealing with the, the help-related issues or are we going to deal with homelessness? Right? Are we going to deal with, in their world with a scheme that they think should be abolished in their world that means that 
students make a contribution when they earn enough? Or are we going to deal with people who are sleeping under bridges? Sleeping under bridges. Now, this lot over here want to carry on with some student Trotskyite, you know, uh, trying to play chicken with the legislative uh, process you, in Senator this Ayers. place. Senator Ayers, but what they thank don't you. want. The time for this debate has expired. Thank you. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Fruki be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes. Unbelievable. Thank you, Mark.
Shut the doors. Shut the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair. The, le uh, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim to tell it for the ayes. Senator Cadell to tell it for the nose. I will. Order. The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 28. I declare the uh, question is resolved in the negative. Clark. Government business orders of the day number one, Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and two related bills, second reading debate. Senator Rustin. Oh. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, and uh, I stand today to make a contribution in relation to the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill, the, ha the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council Bill and Treasury Laws Amendment Housing Measures No. 1 Bill 2023. Um, at the outset, make it very clear to this chamber that the opposition will be opposing the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023. Uh, however, we do intend to support the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council Bill 2023. But the most relevant thing today in the contribution that I'll make on behalf of the opposition is that we will not be uh, supporting the establishment of the Housing Australia Future Fund. It's probably one of the most egregious examples of financial engineering that we've seen from this or any government for that matter. Concerningly, this is starting to become a bit of a hallmark of this government, trying to facilitate significant government spending in off-budget items through funds like this. Uh, and it's clear, like most of their policies so far, that the genesis of the Housing Australia Future Fund has been driven more by the potential headlines it could generate than achieving the significant and sensible outcomes in housing that they purport to be trying to deliver by this set of legislation. So, despite Labor's promise that they will invest $10 billion in housing, we know that every time someone from the government says that, it's simply not true. The commitment is about as tangible as their aspirational targets, and we know that Australians cannot live in aspirational targets. And we know that the Albanese Labor government is not proposing in this bill to invest $10 billion in housing. They're not intending to do that at all. What they are doing is setting up a fund of fully borrowed money, $10 billion worth of Commonwealth borrowings, with the hope that the fund will produce sufficient returns to be able to pass those returns on to housing projects. But we know that with the 10-year government bond rate at the moment approaching 4 per cent and rising, this $10 billion of borrowings will cost the Commonwealth approximately $400 million every year in interest. That's $400 million every single year, and it's very relevant uh, to the fact that this bill is before the House this week because we know right now that Australians are doing it really tough due to serious constraints due to their rising cost of living pressures that are being overseen by this government. Make no mistake, this inflation that we are seeing 
is domestic inflation. It's starting here in Canberra, and it can't be blamed elsewhere. But the pressures that we, this inflation is inflicting are being felt particularly by households who are trying to pay their mortgage as interest rates continue to rise. Australians are going to be looking very closely at tonight's budget to see how it will help them with their cost of living crisis that is putting serious pressure on their budgets. But we know that an increased borrowing contained in this legislation will only add to the inflationary impacts and pressures that are on our economy at the moment, and they inevitably lead to ever higher interest rates. What we've seen before from the Reserve Bank has been a very clear message to government. They are saying to this government that they need to start doing some of the heavy fiscal lifting to reduce inflation instead of leaving it entirely to the Reserve Bank. Otherwise, the job will continue to be left to monetary policy, and in a minute, monetary policy will just run out. We've already seen eight rises um, under this government. So what is the Albanese government's answer to the pleas from the Reserve Bank to borrow less and to spend less? It's to set up a fund with $10 billion worth of borrowings that we know are likely to have $400 million worth of interest costs every year. So there are a number of reasons why the opposition will not be supporting this bill. First and foremost is that anything that will increase inflation and therefore lead to higher mortgage rates cannot in good conscience be supported in this place. Secondly, there is absolutely no certainty that this fund will result in any funding of any housing projects, because the disbursements from the fund will be wholly reliant on the financial performance of the fund's investments in equities and other financial products. And that is a very big if. And if you don't go back too far into history to realise uh, what a big if really is. By way of an example, if this fund had been established last financial year, the Commonwealth would have lost approximately $370 million in addition to the $400 million in interest. That's a total loss of $770 million, and it would mean not even $1 would be available for social and affordable housing projects. This is not a source of stable recurrent funding for a government program. Instead, it is an absolutely blatant attempt to try and keep a housing measure from impacting Jim Chalmers' budget bottom line. The International Monetary Fund has already warned the government pretty clearly about the proliferation of these sorts of funds. But you don't need to be an economist from the IMF to be concerned about what this government is trying to do here, because it is clear that there is every likelihood we could end up at this term of government and find that we have not delivered a single house as promised, oh. at a great cost to the oh, bottom wow. line of the budget and to Australian households. The bill also lacks any crucial detail, something that has become a bit of a hallmark of this government. Just put in the legislation and worry about the detail later. The government has refused to release the investment mandate, in scrutiny, uh, restricting scrutiny of the key information on the fund's capacity to deliver on their very own commitments by the government. We know that when the government doesn't want us to see something, there's usually a pretty compelling reason why not. So this legislation is essentially a shell, um, with all key aspects of the operations of the fund likely to be contained in this investment mandate, which they still haven't made public. And that should make every observer of this particular passage of this legislation very, very nervous about this fund. The investment mandate needs to go through public consultation um, because the sector is very nervous about the way in which the fund is structured. Indeed, the sector has outlined a number of failures in this bill already. There's a failure to define the key terms. What is the definition of social housing? What is the definition of affordable housing? What is the definition of acute housing? These are all terms which will dictate what the potential future returns of this fund might be spent on, if there actually are any returns at all to be spending on it. Stakeholders have also criticised the limit on annual drawdowns, again highlighting the lack of funding certainty with no mechanism performance criteria against which to assess the effectiveness of the grants. Furthermore, the bill prescribes a five-year review timeframe, which is completely inadequate given the uncertainty around the funding model. This fund is, absolute, is an absolute contrast to the approach of the former government, and we believe we have a very strong record, which can be seen for all to see, on supporting home ownership 
and funding social and affordable housing. Firstly, we established the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, soon to be renamed Housing Australia, which was a landmark achievement. In establishing this landmark body, the coalition put community housing providers at the centre of what we did. Since its creation, NIFIC has delivered $2.9 billion in low-cost loans to community housing providers to support 15,000 social and affordable dwellings, saving $470 million in interest payments to be reinvested in more affordable housing. It also unlocked 6,900 social, affordable and market dwellings through the coalition's $1 billion infrastructure facility to make housing supply more responsive to demand. Over our last three years in government, the coalition housing policies also supported more than 300,000 Australians with the purchase of their home. In particular, under the coalition, first home, buy home owners of home buyers reached their highest level for nearly 15 years. We assisted more than 60,000 people into a home through our home guarantee scheme, helping home buyers to get into the market by bringing down the deposit hurdle from 20 per cent to 5 per cent. Most recently, there was the family home guarantee, which required only a deposit of 2 per cent for single parents, 85 per cent of which are single mothers. We also delivered 1, uh, 137,000 home builder projects. Our first home owner super scheme helped more than 25,000 people fast track their savings, fast track their deposits through concessions within their superannuation. So, in summary, we've got a government whose housing policies are in tatters, and first home buyers have dropped month on month since this government with no action in response. Now they're trying to bring the Housing Australia Future Fund legislation that will add to the inflationary pressures that are already being felt by households around Australia and bring pressure onto an economy with absolutely no certainty of any returns being generated and being able to be applied to housing. So our message is very, very clear to the government. A housing fund that will increase inflationary pressure and result in higher interest rates, that has no guarantee of return or the delivery of any housing projects, that's going to cost $400 million a year in interest rates, and that's going to move community housing providers to the sidelines, is not the way to deliver positive change that so many Australians are needing right now. We will not be supporting the establishment of this fund. Senator Fruki. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to Labor's housing package. Before getting into details of Labor's policy, I want to say that housing is totally cooked in this country. The scale of the housing crisis has never been more acute, yet all Labor can offer is an extremely weak plan that will do so little, if anything at all. New homelessness figures released by the ABS showed that the number of people without a home rose by 5.2 per cent over the last five years. 56 per cent of those without a home are women and children. Women make up a vast majority of newly homeless. We hear over and over that rising rents, higher and higher cost of living, combined with lower savings and superannuation, is pushing older women to the brink. Young people's dreams of owning a home have become a nightmare. More than 20 per cent of those without a home are First Nations people, despite them making up just 3.8 per cent of the population. It is an absolute disgrace that so many First Nations people don't own, own a home on their own land. We have a shortage of 640,000 social and affordable homes. Being a renter in Australia has never been more difficult, and record low vacancy rates and skyrocketing rents are here. There are 2.7 million people living in rental stress. Rental prices are a staggering 22 per cent higher than they were in 2020. Renters are predicted to pay 10 billion in rent increases alone in 2023 at a time when real wages are falling. Virtually no region in Australia is affordable for aged care workers, for early childhood educators and carers, for cleaners, for nurses, and many other frontline essential workers. People are sleeping and living in cars, in caravans, in tents. 
they're being forced to couch surf with rental vacancy rates at their lowest level, lowest level ever, whether you are in regional um, Australia or live in a capital city. More and more people are struggling to pay rent and having to make the choice between rent and food, between medication, or between dental care. No one should be in a situation like this. With interest rates rising, the RBA predicts that soon 1.5 million households won't be earning enough to cover their mortgage and pay for essentials. And the housing crisis, of course, is hitting those already marginalized the hardest. Less than 1% of private rental properties in Australia are affordable for those earning the minimum wage, while people on Centrelink payments who are barely able to afford rooms in shared houses, according to a recent Anglicare report. More than 70% of the people who come to the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre in Melbourne in housing distress were unable to be placed in accommodation, with the broader housing prices putting more pressure on temporary and emergency housing services. International students are being forced to pitch tents in living rooms of houses. And students are lining up to food banks. Unstable and unaffordable housing is causing long-term mental health impacts and enormous stress and it is harming people every single day. And the housing and rental crisis does have a human face. And I want to read out a few recent stories from people. Cheryl Rowe, a cleaner in Western Australia, has been forced to live in a camping trailer for the past few months after her landlord sold her rental. As Cheryl says, it's hard every night after work coming home to a tent rather than a home. You're living out of your car. You're living out of supermarket bags. I work full time. I should be able to get a home. But the hardest part of Cheryl's ordeal was checking her terminally ill husband into hospital after she realized she couldn't care for him in a home and a caravan park was her only option. Cassie and her two young sons on the south coast of New South Wales have been homeless since July. When she became unable to afford their rent, and since then, they have been bouncing between hotels and crisis accommodation and hoping various charities will foot their bill. And as Cassie says, I just want my boys to grow up happy and healthy and know that they've got somewhere to sleep every night. Bob, a 79-year-old pensioner in Sydney, was recently served a no-grounds eviction notice. He gets emotional when he thinks about the people he will have to compete against to secure a new place. How many people are going to take in a pensioner on very cheap rent? There's not going to be too many offers, I think. It is absolutely obscene that in a wealthy country like Australia, people are struggling and suffering like Cheryl, Cassie and Bob. And shamefully, Labour's housing plan will do little, if anything, for people like Cheryl, Cassie and Bob. And there are many more people facing harrowing circumstances because of house housing system that sees millions being screwed over while banks and property developers make an absolute killing of the misery of others. We have a housing system where it's impossible to get into public housing because there's so little of it. But it's also impossible to get into a rental because rents are just so damn high. We need big, bold, long-term action on housing in this country. We need a minimum of $5 billion invested in social and affordable housing every year, indexed to inflation. We need to invest directly in building hundreds of thousands of well-designed, accessible, and sustainable public homes. Enough to not just clear the wait list, but also provide affordable housing to the millions who are locked out of the housing market. We need to invest big in First Nations housing. We need to phase out perverse tax incentives that encourage and reward property holding like negative gearing and capital gains tax discount. We need to stop ignoring renters and treating them like second class citizens. And that's why the Greens are calling for an immediate freeze on rent increases for two years. Renters deserve an immediate relief. 
they are facing serious financial stress as a result of these soaring rents. We need a pathway towards national tenancy standards that deliver protection from no grounds evictions. The government's plan to deal with this crisis, though, involves very little of these things, though we have forced the government now to at least put rent freezes onto the national cabinet's agenda. The boldly, the boldly lamed but pathetically inadequate Housing Australia Future Fund legislation won't even touch the sides of the housing crisis in this country. And let's start by being clear about what this legislation does and does not do. It does not invest $10 billion in affordable and social housing, contrary to what Labour repeatedly tells you to think. It, however, does invest $10 billion on the stock market via the housing fund. It's the returns, if there are any at all, that will be invested in affordable and social housing projects. Property developers in the private sector will be relied on to deliver these projects. It is completely speculative and a reckless way for a government to deal with something as essential and meaningful as housing, which is a core human right. There could be years before the fund doesn't make a single cent, or even years where it loses money. It is hard to know where rock bottom will lie with this neoliberal market-obsessed Labour government, but I hope that we would never leave school funding or hospital funding up to a gamble on the stock market. So why on earth will we do it with housing? Mm -hmm. The big risks associated with the fund are not matched by the rewards. Even if the fund were to make a big return, spending on housing is capped at 500 million per year with no indexation. So there's no floor on spending with this plan. Literally nothing could be invested in social affordable housing in a given year under this plan. And that cap of 500 million is not even a drop in the ocean. The recent National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation reviewed estimate, review estimated that an investment of 14.7 billion per year is needed to meet the shortfall of social and affordable housing. This legislation aims to finance the construction of a mere 30,000 social and affordable homes over five years. The benefits of Labour's signature housing policy will be easily outstripped by the growth of social and affordable homes shortage. Under Labour's plan, we will have a bigger shortage of social and affordable housing in five years' time than we do now. That says it all, really. The problem will get worse under this plan. There is a clear and a better and more obvious way to solving the housing crisis, and the Greens are calling for the government to invest $5 billion directly in social and affordable housing. If the federal government invested $5 billion each year in partnership with the states, 110,000 public and affordable homes could be built in the next five years. That's four times the amount that Labour is touting. By retaining ownership of the homes, the government could earn money from rental returns over the next decade, and that could be reinvested in building more homes. The number of witnesses to the inquiry into this legislation supported the Greens' view that the government's model of gambling away $10 billion in the future fund is actually deeply flawed. There should be direct investment into social and affordable housing. Dr. John Quigan, professor of economics at the University of Queensland, said that the policy was risky and that tapping housing funding at the amount generated by fund returns is not a good way to fund public expenditure of any kind, particularly not social housing. The Anti-Poverty Centre described the fund as intentionally designed to sound more significant than it is and called for the provision of social and affordable housing to be directly funded by the government. But if Labour doesn't want to believe us or the experts, they can listen to what the community has to say. The Greens are a grassroots movement, and we have been door knocking with hundreds of volunteers across the country to ask people about Labour's sham of a housing policy. We've knocked on thousands of doors and spoken to so many people who are copying massive rent and mortgage hikes, asking them what they think about this plan. And the message that we got back is crystal clear. People are thoroughly disappointed with Labour's plan. They get it. A vast majority 
want a more ambitious plan. They want more action. They want real action to tackle the housing crisis that includes direct investment in public and affordable housing and rental, national rental rent caps. They want us to fight for something better, and we will be doing that. We will be fighting for something better. The Greens want action on housing, not a dud of a policy. We are pushing the government to improve it, and it will be, and we will be moving several amendments, but it is up to the government to come to the table. People want Labour to go back to the drawing board, come back with a housing plan that actually tackles the housing and rental crisis that we are facing. To put $5 billion, so we want $5 billion in direct investment, as I said earlier. And to put this into perspective, $5 billion per year is a drop in the ocean compared to what the government is giving as stage three tax cuts to the billionaires or what they are spending on dangerous war machines. It's 2% of the stage three tax cuts. It's about 1% of what the nuclear subs are going to cost. Safe, secure, affordable, and accessible housing is a human right. But decades of neoliberal policy has made speculative assets of what should be homes. The basic human right to shelter now takes a back seat to the market. That is an absolute shame. It is woeful and it is pathetic. The reality is we do have the money to fix the housing crisis in this country, just as we have the money to lift everyone out of poverty. It is purely a matter of political will. Labour's plan, this bill, will make the housing and rental crisis worse. But Labour is really the only obstacle standing between solving the housing crisis. We won't stop fighting on behalf of the millions of people who are in housing stress and who are being left behind. We will not stop fighting. And I hope that Labour can see sense, come to the table and come up with a plan that actually helps people, not, not put them into more distress. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I call Senator Green. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting um, President. Uh, I, I'm very keen to speak on this bill. I wished I had got a chance to speak on this earlier, but unfortunately, uh, the Greens, as we know, pulled a stunt this morning um, to try to prevent us debating this really important legislation. So here we are. We are finally getting to this bill. I'm sure that there will be more stunts during the week but I'm really proud to be talking about a Housing Australia Future Fund and the significance of this bill and the significance in addressing housing affordability crisis in our country. This is a critical issue facing, facing Australians, something that people talk to me all the time about in regional Australia particularly. And we know that for far too long we have witnessed inaction and delay under the former government when it comes to addressing the housing affordability crisis. We've had a decade of delay and now it is time to get on with fixing this problem. Under the previous government, we saw denial and neglect that exacerbated this crisis, leaving many Australians struggling to find a safe and secure place to call home. But our government has a plan to tackle this issue head on. The Housing Australia Future Fund is the single most significant investment in social and affordable housing in a decade. The $10 billion fund to invest in 30,000 new social and affordable homes over the next five years is just the beginning. The fund also pledges $200 million for repairs to remote Indigenous housing, $100 million for crisis accommodation for women and children fleeing domestic violence and older women at risk of homelessness, and $30 million for veterans housing. These are essential commitments that would benefit for some of our most vulnerable Australians. This bill and this debate is a test for the Greens' political party. It is a test because we need to know where they truly stand. Are they going to line up with the Liberal Party as they are claiming they will do to block this bill? Are they prepared to vote with the Liberal National Party that did nothing on housing affordability for a decade and vote this bill down? It's a test for the Greens because they need to decide whether they will stop investment in housing or whether they will block this bill and the investment that this bill contains. Do they care more about politics or 
do they care about actually getting things done? Because on this side of the chamber, that's what we're here for. We're here to get things done. We took this policy to the election. We got people to vote on it. People were incredibly excited in the regions that I'm from about this proposition, about a government that says we need to take, tackle this issue and we need to get things done. And this is the start of that action. Perhaps I'm cynical, but seeing, seeking to block funding for affordable and social housing for vulnerable Australians seems to serve only one purpose, and that is politics. I can't see another reason why you would stand in the way of 30,000 new social and affordable homes over the next five years, $200 million for Indigenous housing repairs, $100 million for domestic violence housing and $30 million for veterans housing. I cannot see a reason other than politics, other than politics from the Greens political party to block this bill. This is a test for the Greens on housing and whether they decide to line up with the Liberal National Party. Whether they choose to vote with the Liberal National Party and sit next to them to block this bill. The Greens don't have the moral high ground on housing and I won't sit here and be lectured about how desperately people need housing. That is exactly why we're getting on with this bill. And some, somehow, somehow, the Greens seem to believe because you've held a door knock one Saturday that somehow they have the moral high ground on housing. Well, we've been door knocking too, I can tell you, and the people in Griffith are pretty people in Griffith are pretty surprised about who's standing up for housing and who's seeking to block it. This Housing Australia Fund is urgent legislation, and despite all of the adjectives used by the Greens to describe this bill, they leave one really important description out, and that is that peak bodies around the country, housing and homelessness peak bodies, want this bill passed. That is the word, that is the word that they leave out of every description of this bill, that the peak bodies on housing and homelessness want this bill passed. This includes national shelter. It includes Homelessness Australia. These are the stakeholders that are supporting this bill the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Housing Association, the Community Housing Industry Association and the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute. That's just some of the peak bodies who wrote a statement around the time of the last sitting calling on the Senate to support this legislation. These are the voices that the Greens are choosing to ignore when they threaten to block this bill. And it's not just national peak bodies, but it's also local service providers that are calling on us to pass this legislation. Uh, before this legislation um, came to the Senate, I visited the Cairns Homelessness Hub to talk to them about this bill, and they wanted us to pass this bill. That's because they're at the coal face of this housing and homelessness crisis, and they want to see action taken. It is, it is unremarkable, I think, to um, for the Liberal National Party to oppose this bill. I think we can agree that they have opposed everything that we've brought to this chamber. They have opposed every single new idea and every policy that the government took to the election. They say no, no, no to everything. That's, that's up for them. They don't want to be a constructive opposition. They're just going to ignore everything that the um, voters told them at the election and vote against everything that we bring to this chamber. So it's not no surprise that they've posed everything that we've brought forward to improve Australians' lives. However, the fact that the Greens are deciding to sit with the Liberals and block this bill is particularly concerning given the magnitude of the housing affordability crisis in this country. The Greens really do need to decide if they're willing to work with the Liberal National Party to sink this bill or whether they want to start action and get things done. Because on this side of the chamber, we are ready to deliver housing relief for Australians. The regions that I visit in Queensland are crying out for investment in housing. They have been for years. And it's particularly poignant, it's particularly poignant that many members of the Greens are refusing to listen to these regional voices. I'm not surprised that members of the Liberal National Party are refusing to listen to people in regional Australia. They wear the badge and say that they actually stand up for regional Australians, but they fail to support them when they walk in here. 
But I'm not surprised that the Greens are joining with them to ignore the voices of regional Australians who are so desperate for housing. We should be working together to ensure all Australians can have access to safe and affordable housing, and we should be doing what we can to show national leadership. That is something our government is doing and has been doing on housing since we were elected. The Greens have called for national leadership. We're showing that national leadership. We didn't need the Greens to call on it. We're doing it. We, we said we would do it before the election, and we're doing that. Most recently at the National Cabinet, we got all the states and territories to agree to develop reforms to increase housing supply and affordability and put renter rights front and centre. We, all states and territories agreed to strengthen renting rights. That's what happens when you have a government committed to this action. That's what happens when you have a government committed to national leadership. That is what, is what is happens when you have a government that is listening to peak bodies on housing and homelessness instead of ignoring them. That's exactly what happens. But the Housing Australia Future Fund is not the only thing that our government is doing to in address the housing affordability crisis. I know that the um, parties around this, um, around this chamber would have you believe that this bill is the only thing the government is doing. We know how important it is to address this housing affordability crisis. The stability and security are essential for happiness and health of our community. That's why we have an ambitious housing reform agenda to ensure that more Australians have safe and affordable place to call home. We said that we won't waste a day in delivering on this agenda, and we haven't. The housing legislation package is a comprehensive suite of measures to get more social and affordable homes on the ground. The legislation implements our government's commitments to establish the Housing Australia Future Fund, to transform the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, to establish the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council. But this is on top of our government's commitment to the National Housing Accord, a shared agenda ambition to build one million well-located homes over the next five years, our $350 million additional Commonwealth funding to deliver 10,000 affordable homes over the next five years from 2024, which has been matched by the states and the territories, to widen the remit of national housing infrastructure facility made up of $575 million. We've already done that. And in, on top of our national housing and homelessness plan to set short, medium and long-term goals to improve housing outcomes across Australia. We've also, also delivered the Regional First Home Buyer Grant, which has already helped more than 2,700 Australians into home ownership, with a majority of those in my home state of Queensland. We are taking action on housing on top of this bill. This is not the only thing that we are doing, but it is a key piece of our reform. This is an important piece of legislation, and it's an important test, as I said, for the Greens' political party. What's important for people to understand is that you have a government committed to addressing housing and affordability crisis. We have shown national leadership when it comes to rental reforms. We are working with the states and territories as you must do, as you must do in this space, because we can't do it on our own. But we're showing national leadership and delivering on those reforms. We are delivering, delivering more investment for social and affordable housing than we have seen for a past decade. But the Greens need to understand that sitting with the Liberals, as they plan to do, and blocking this bill won't build any new houses. It will actually stop homes from being built. And moving motions to suspend standing orders won't build more houses for women fleeing domestic violence. It will, won't build more ha homes. It will only stop houses being built. And every time the member for Griffith and the member for Melbourne hold a press conference in Parliament House to defend their miserable position, well, it won't build any more houses. It might get them more hits on social media. It might give them a chance to have their name in the newspaper. But it won't build a single new house. And it won't help a single vulnerable Australian facing homelessness. And maybe that's exactly what the Greens Party want. More social media hits, more names in the newspapers, more media conferences, more chances to make their name stand out in the sun. But that doesn't do anything for people facing housing affordability crisis. 
This is all about politics for the Greens political party. It always has been from the very beginning of our discussion around housing. And no matter the amount of press conferences that the member for Griffith or the member for Melbourne attend, no matter the times that they try to defend their position, one thing is really simple, that eventually this House will vote on this bill. Eventually the Senate will come to a position of voting on this legislation. No matter the suspension of standing orders, no matter the attempts from the Greens political party to put this off. And when we vote on this Senator, legislation... Senator Green, uh, it being 1.30, I shall now proceed to two-minute statements, and you have two minutes remaining if you wish to be in continuation as the matter returns before the Senate. Uh, I call Senator Askew. Thank you. Deputy President, I rise today with a tinge of sadness to pay tribute to the Baghdad Singers, a community choir that has spread song throughout southern Tasmania for almost 30 years. The group started as an idea for Chris Felberg, who called a public meeting in the southern Tasmanian town of Baghdad in 1994 to assess community interest in forming a singing group. By the following year, Baghdad Singers had performed songs, skits and stand-up comedy at multiple venues across Tasmania. This included performances at the Baghdad Music Hall, which became the group's meeting location. As their conductor for 19 years, Chris steered the group of up to 30 performers to musicality. Nobody needed to audition to join, and many couldn't read music, but their enthusiasm and Chris's direction meant members learnt to sing in well-balanced four-part harmony. As quoted in the April edition of the Baghdad News, one member, Kay Harmon, said the Baghdad singer's strong male section was the envy of many other community choirs. When Chris moved to Melbourne, musician and choir director Ro Rosalind Langloy took up the baton. The choir welcomed new members and embraced a new name, Baghdad Community Singers. Under new leadership, the choir retained its favourite songs and added to its repertoire too. Kay commented that for six years, Rosalind strove to make us the best we could be. The COVID pandemic and aged care facility lockdowns, coupled with Rosalind's developing Parkinson's disease and the loss of their rehearsal venue, meant Baghdad community singers had to reinvent itself. They switched to practising in a local gym and long-term members, Nathan and Marilyn, shared management and con conducting duties over the past few years. But the choir's numbers have dwindled and the group recently announced it sung its final note. Members credit the choir with learning to sing and harmonise, but they also discovered new Tasmanian venues and made lasting friendships. Thank you to each and every one of the Baghdad community singers who entertained audiences at venues throughout Tasmania during the past three decades. Your melodies will be cherished for a long time to come. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. I'll call Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, some of the comments from this morning is what I'd like to sort of talk about. Um, we heard the Liberal Party telling us that Labor's housing plan won't build any housing, um, that it will just, it's just a ridiculous statement. It's only outstripped by the commentary from the Greens, who have said that the housing crisis is so bad that we shouldn't set up a $10 billion housing fund. Yeah. Go figure. It's just ridiculous. They've sat on their hands for a decade and watched the coalition foster this housing situation that we are now facing. And now, because there is a bill in front of the House with some serious action on housing, the most significant package we've seen in decades, they now want to complain. I am left remembering some decade ago watching the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Greens Party band together to vote against the CPRS. That was a climate crisis, a climate crisis that they like to waffle on about all the time. And they ensured, between the three of them, the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Greens Party, they ensured that no action was taken on climate change for a decade. Don't do that again. Don't do that to housing. This is ridiculous. Just ridiculous. We've had nothing on housing for a long time. And this is a policy, this is a fund that will make a fundamental difference to those people out there who are struggling. Everyone in this chamber, everyone in the country indeed knows that we have serious housing challenges in front of us. And we must take action to stop it. And this grandstanding and politicising and monologuing 
to stop any action on climate on, on housing is ridiculous. Thank you, Senator Grogan. I call Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. No one deserves to live in poverty, but you wouldn't know that from Labor's deliberate measures to keep people living well below the poverty line. If the reports this week are true, Labor is planning to increase job seeker by $2.85 a day, which is even less than the increase to job seeker that Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Morrison made last year. It is $500 below the Henderson poverty line. People on starvation payments are hurting. They are having to make impossible choices between paying for food, paying the rent or paying for vital medication. But rather than receiving a substantial increase to their payments, the substantial increase that the government's own hand-picked Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee recommended, they are going to receive a slap in the face. Budgets are about choices, and Labor could choose differently instead of doubling down, leaving people without the heating or the food or the medicines that they need to survive. Labor must increase poverty payments, must increase income support to above the poverty line, to above $88 a day, and end punitive mutual obligations. And if you need to know how to pay for it, well, we Greens have got some very significant proposals that can help you out. Axe the stage three tax cuts. That frees up $254 billion over the next de decade. Dump the AUKUS submarines. That's $364 billion. Increase taxes on the coal and the gas and the oil companies instead of the pathetic increase to the petroleum resource rent tax that the gas cartel have approved. And stop subsidies to fossil fuels. Over $10 billion a year. Budgets about choices and this government is making the wrong choice, and we call on them to do differently. Thank you, Senator Rice. I call Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. The Boer War was our nation's first expeditionary war. Initially, all six colonies provided troops between 1899 and 1900, and then, as a nation, we came together between 1901 and 1902 uh, to support the war effort. In total, 16,000 Australians served in the Boer War including nearly 1,000 West Australians, including nurses and bushmen. And today they are recognised and commemorated at a spectacular memorial, commemoration memorial in Kings Park in Perth. 598 Australians are recorded on the Roll of Honour uh, at the Australian War Memorial, having made the ultimate sacrifice. Now, while we say lest we forget, it is important for us to remember that it means we remember them all no matter how long ago they served and they sacrificed. And I commend the Boer War Memorial Society of Western Australia, which was established by my lovely friend, Kevin Bovell, and is today run by a small and very dedicated group of volunteers who actively work to preserve the memories and also the stories of Australians who served in this war before time has run out and their stories are lost forever. I thank Kevin and all volunteers for their passion and their commitment. But unlike others on the Roll of Honour, the 16,000 Australians who served do not yet have a day included in the Department of Veterans Affairs National Commemorative Program. The Society has for many years been campaigning for the 31st of May, the day the war ended, to be recognised as the Boer War National Commemoration Day, Commemorative Day, I should say. So I call on the, mem uh, the Minister for Veterans Affairs to remedy this oversight and to ensure that all who served our nation, no matter the decade, the century, are remembered and are never forgotten. We have nothing to thank lose you, and everything Your to gain. Thank you. Senator Green. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I want to thank Senator Reynolds for her comments and um, also recognise those that served during the Boer War conflict. Um, incredibly important thing for us to remember today in the Senate. Um, I'm here tonight, today to talk about today's budget. It is budget day, and tonight's budget does three things. It provides cost of living relief that doesn't add to inflation, and creates more opportunities for more Australians, and builds a stronger and more resilient economy into the future. Three incredibly important principles. 
Now, we know that the most important part of this budget will be delivering cost of living relief. And the centrepiece of this budget that we'll hear tonight, the details, is a $14.6 billion cost of living relief package. It's incredibly important that our government is able to deliver cost of living Thank relief you, where it's affordable and responsible. This budget has been carefully calibrated and designed to take the pressure off cost of living rather than add to it. More than 5 million households and 1 million small businesses will be eligible for oh, energy no. price relief rebates from the 1st of July. We've already announced that measure. And from the 1st of September, general patients will be able to save up to $180 per script a year for their medicine, um, able to be prescribed for 60 days, building on our cheaper medicines policy. This is on top of the $2.2 billion strengthening Medicare package in the budget to make healthcare more accessible and affordable for all Australians. This is a budget that is in the best labour tradition helping vulnerable with the cost of living. We're also making sure that we create more opportunities for more Australians. We're doing that by making a change to the single parenting payment to raise the age to 14, increasing payments by an extra $176 per fortnight from the 20th of September. We're also funding the biggest pay Thank rise you. ever for aged Senator, care workers. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. AI or artificial intelligence is becoming a big part of our lives, but it can also have some negative effects. Here are some reasons why AI can be bad. Firstly, job losses. AI can do tasks that people used to do, which might lead to people losing their jobs. As companies use artificial intelligence to save money and be more efficient, some workers may struggle to find new jobs. Two, the bias. AI learns from data, and if that data has biases, the artificial intelligence system can become biased too. This can make problems like discrimination even worse and unfair to certain groups of people. Three, privacy. Artificial intelligence can be used to spy on people and invade their privacy. With facial recognition and data analysis, governments and businesses can track what we do, which can make us feel less free and safe. Four, fake news and deep flakes. AI can create realistic, but fake videos and images known as deep fakes. These can be used to spread false information, harm reputations or cause trouble in society. Five, loss of control. If AI becomes too powerful and smart, it will become hard for humans to control. This could lead to accidents or even danger if AI decides its goals are more important than the ones that human beings believe their goals are. In summary, while artificial intelligence has many benefits, it can also cause problems like job loss, bias, privacy invasion, fake news and loss of control. We need to be aware of these issues and work together to make AI safe and helpful for everyone. This speech was 100 per cent written by artificial intelligence. Maybe the Prime Minister is onto something, but maybe by reducing our advisers, he's looking for AI to run the country. Well, let me tell you this, Prime Minister, if you're getting rid of our advisers and expecting that, it's only not before long the Prime Minister thank is on the you, chopping Senator, block. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, tonight uh, Australia is expecting its first budget surplus in 15 years, and it's uh, entirely uh, due to the resources sector of this country. Unfortunately, the Labor Party does not want to recognise that, never says thanks to the hard working men and women in that sector, but I today want to put on record my thanks uh, to the thousands of Australians that spend time away from their family, digging stuff out of the ground, making the wealth for us so that we can fund schools, hospitals and other public services in this country. I thank you very, very much. The figures show uh, that this surplus is built on the backs of those workers that the Labor Party no longer recognises. Uh, last year, the uh, Labor Party's first budget predicted a $36 billion surplus. Uh, for this financial year, uh, while well, in fact resources exports have been 110, just over $110 billion more than expected uh, last year. And if you take, if 30 per cent of that extra revenue goes back to the uh, taxpayer through corporate taxes as it does, that's $33 billion in extra taxes from the resources sector. And almost entirely uh, the deficit has been wiped out thanks to our mining industry. Uh, if you look at it in more detail, a lot of it is due to our coal and gas, our fossil fuel industries that the Labor Party wants to shut down that they announced last week. They want a transition authority 
They want everybody to transition in mining towns away from one job to another, even though there's record demand for the products they produce. There's been a $44 billion increase in coal, so it's been another $15 billion in taxes from that industry. There's been a $40 billion increase in gas exports, so around uh, $12 to $13 billion extra in taxes from them too. Uh, instead of saying thanks, this Labor Party is putting on export controls on the industry, price caps on their product, massive amounts of new red tape, more to come soon with their Environmental Protection Agency. When is the Labor Party actually going to show some love uh, to the thousands of Australians that rely on a strong mining industry for their job, for their communities, uh, and to make sure they have a future? I won't be holding my breath. Thank you, Senator. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I seek to draw the attention of the Chamber today to a, a matter of national importance, and that's the integrity of the audit and assurance sector. In recent days, it's become very clear that the PwC, Price Waterhouse Coopers, used secret government information that belongs to the Australian people to advise clients how to sidestep new tax laws that were under construction by the previous government in 2015 to 2016. And now ex-PWC tax partner by the name of Mr Peter Collins signed confidentiality agreements, but nonetheless, was supposed to, while he was supposed to be helping the Treasury Department and the Australian Taxation Office to make sure that multinationals paid their tax, took that information, took it back to PWC and monetised that for PWC's profit. These are institutions, PwC and the other assurance companies, that are vital to the proper functioning of the markets of this country. Every single one of us with money in superannuation require on decisions that are made based on the truth that these companies are supposed to tell. Instead, we've had a massive betrayal. And I, put, I show to you here in this chamber, this is the compiled 144 pages of the email trail that reveals it was not only Mr Collins, but the, the CEO who resigned yesterday evening, Mr Tom Seymour, who was involved with the deception of the Australian parliament, the Australian people, and a betrayal of the ethical and professional standards that they should be upholding. This is a major cancer on the way that information that is vital to the national interest is being uh, undertaken by those at PwC. We have had a resignation from Mr Seymour overnight as the CEO. He remains a partner. There are many more questions than answers arising from these pages, and I will thank, not let this go you, in the Senator, interest of the nation. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. Last week, the AFL finally announced that Tasmania would get licences for AFL men's and women's teams. But what should have been a day of unity and celebration for our state was tarnished. Instead of being able to celebrate our state finally getting AFL men's and women's licences, we were burdened with the announcement and saddened with the announcement that we would get a giant new football stadium on prime waterfront land in Tasmania that the state does not want and does not need. The only reason we're getting this stadium is because of the AFL's blackmail of Tasmania and the craven collapse of Prime Minister Albanese and Premier Rockliffe in front of that blackmail. Those two people, those two politicians, drove past the cars and the tents of homeless Tasmanians to make an announcement that they were going to put a roof over a billion dollar stadium that we do not need rather than spend money putting a roof over the heads of homeless Tasmanians. To do this in the best of times would have been bad enough, but these are far from the best of times. We are going to see hundreds, potentially thousands of Tasmanians shiver through a cold winter without a roof over their heads when Prime Minister Albanese and Premier Rockliffe are prepared to spend up to a billion dollars building a stadium that Tasmanians do not want or need. It's a betrayal of the highest order. But I've got a warning for the Labor and Liberal parties. The people of Tasmania do not want this stadium. They will not let their money be wasted while there are people going cold and hungry. So they should get ready for a fight thank, because it's not thank over you, yet. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Pocock-David. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 
On the 3rd of May, an official media release went out on the Prime Minister's letterhead. It announced a whopping $10,000 contribution to Friends of the Western Ground Parrot as a coronation gift to His Majesty the King. The laughable um, mediocrity of this announcement is symbolic of a deeper problem. The government is running around papering over cracks. There are an estimated 100 to 150 Western Ground Parrots left. 10,000 is a tiny amount for a huge task. And what about the swift parrot, the region honey eater, the glossy black cockatoo, the gang gang cockatoo? It's a very long list of endangered birds. It's great that the government is investing in critically endangered birds, but throwing a token $10,000 don donation at them is one step in a very long marathon. Uh, it's good that the government is seeking a return for the sale of Australian gas, but at less than 0.5 per cent of expected earnings, the return we will get is irresponsibly small. It's good that the government is increasing job seeker, but if it's an extra $2.85 a day, a mere fifth of what was recommended, it isn't enough to lift people relying on the safety net out of poverty. It's good that the government wants to build more houses, but refusing to increase the size of the fund, refusing to remove the annual cap on spending, or at very least index payments, to, uh, is inadequate. It's, it's, an, it's inadequate um, and it's, it's simply not good enough. The government is doing some good things, but seems unwilling to show political courage, the kind of courage that Australians Thank want. Thank you, Senator. Senator Smith-Dean. Thank you very much. Australia cannot allow the Burma conflict to become the forgotten conflict. A few weeks ago, I took myself privately to India, to Delhi, and I thank those people that gave up their time to meet with me so I could understand, see firsthand the geopolitical consequences of Burmese refugees being forced into India as a result of the continued military atrocities and human rights violations that are happening in Burma. This is the time for Australia to step up its contribution to better support the UNHCR in the northeast region of India, to provide better humanitarian assistance, to fast-track discussions about how we can provide alternative pathways for humanitarian aid, particularly in those regions of Burma that border countries like Thailand and India. The time to act is now. 17,000 people have been arrested including 381 children. 13,000 are in detention. 17.6 17 .6 million need, are, in, are in need of humanitarian assistance. The United Nations Security Council has called this a perpetual human rights crisis. And the United Nations Human Rights Council has said that the conflict has now opened up new front lines that had once been at peace. Australia has had a strong and proud record in providing humanitarian assistance and pathways for refugees from Burma to our country. And that should not only continue, but it must be increased. In coming weeks, I hope to report on more of my discussions, but I'm looking for the Australian government to step up now and do more. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, I draw the Senate's attention to the United Nations World Health Organization's current attempt at child grooming. This speech is part of my longer essay on this topic, published yesterday in The Spectator Online. The World Health Organization has orchestrated a framework for health and education policy makers called Standards for a Sexuality Education in Europe. Only last month, the World Health Organization tried to expand this agenda worldwide and failed to get the numbers for now. Not to be outdone, the UN has a complementary framework called the International Guidance on Sexuality Education. The World Health Organization and the UN preferred framework demands that sex education begin at birth and under the state's guidance, not the parents. In their own words, quote, this framework aims to empower children and young people to develop respectful sexual relationships. 
These skills can help children and young people form respectful and healthy relationships with romantic or sexual partners. By age four, the child will have knowledge of, sexual, of biological reproduction and sexuality sufficient to differentiate between heterosexual and homosexual behaviour and will be taught about consent. Under four, by age six, children will be exposed to education on intercourse, masturbation and pornography. By age nine, these will be actually taught with the intent of achieving an adult knowledge with the assumption these nine-year-olds would have had their first sexual encounter. Well, they will now. By age 12, the World Health Organization will place all this knowledge into the appropriate political context, thereby destroying our kids' chances of ever having a loving, monogamous relationship. Children are impressionable and in early formative years can be scarred for life. Adult sexual content has no place in the child's education in the way these monsters propose. It's time to get out of the pervert's paradise that the UN and its agencies have become. Senator Stuart John, you have the call. Thank you. No one should ever be made to feel like their very existence is a burden, like their lives are the reason for the challenges that our country faces. The lead-up to the budget has been horrendous for the disability community. We have heard story after story again and again in the media, never from our own mouths, never from our own mouths, never in our own words, positioning us as thieves, positioning us as bludgers, positioning, positioning us as unsustainable burdens. These words, these words have consequences. The language used by writers and commentators and so-called leaders of this country sitting in this place of privilege have consequences. They reinforce the negative stereotypes that so impact on people's lives in devastating ways. Now, some people in this place claim to be the ally of the disability community, but when push comes to shove, they shove disabled people and our NDIS out of the way, instead prioritising uh, $250 billion worth of tax cuts for billionaires and already rich people and $360 billion for nuclear submarines. The budget should be about supporting people in the community the best way we can. Make no mistake. Disabled people, despite being harmed indirectly and directly by the sentiments of these statements, will be continuing to push back against any attempt. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. Well, last week at the National Press Club, we saw the Health Minister get up and declare himself as Australia's new vape czar. He pledged that he was going to stop kids from vaping and getting them addicted to these products by banning it for everyone. Wow. Absolutely, Senator Green. Wow. Unfortunately, this policy is going to have the exact opposite effect. It's Order. going to make the black market worse, and it's going to lead Order. to even more young people Order. vaping. And this, of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, is very sad. And it's sad because there's actually a very simple solution to this. It's a very simple solution to this. Vaping needs to be regulated. It needs to be licensed and it needs to be taxed as a consumer product because that's what it is. It's an adult consumer product, the same way that cigarettes and alcohol are adult consumer products. And we know that the vaping prohibition model has already failed. In fact, since the implementation of this prescription model, we have only seen the vaping black market increase. And of course, this was always going to happen because when you create a black market, you create the conditions for crime syndicates to flourish. And of course, to nobody's surprise, it turns out that criminal syndicates are more than happy to supply kids with vapes. So, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, there is an easy way out of this. We need to regulate it, we need to licence it, we need to tax it, to tax it. But instead, those opposite who claim to look after the vulnerable 
are looking at a further excise on tobacco, which we know is only going to hurt those in the most disadvantaged and socio-economic lower groups. Thank you, Senator. Senator White. The concept of the four-day week has been gaining significant traction globally due to the measurable effects on productivity and quality of life. Just recently, Australian Services Union members at Oxfam voted up an enterprise agreement that adopts a four-day working week trial. The six-month pilot will allow Oxfam's 90 permanent full-time employees to opt for 30 weekly hours over four days without any loss of pay. The agreement is the first of its kind in Australia, the first to be formalised within an enterprise bargaining agreement and the first to be approved by the Fair Work Commission. It's a landmark achievement and I congratulate Imogen Sterney and the team at the Victorian private sector branch of the ASU for negotiating this agreement. The four-day week seeks more than just increases Senator, in productivity. your time has expired. Thanks. Senator Wong, are you seeking the call? Senator Wong. Uh, I uh, seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. I thank, I thank the Senate and I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Uh, Senator Gallagher will obviously be absent from question time today on account of ministerial business relating to budget. Uh, in Senator Gallagher's absence, ministers will represent portfolios at question time in accordance with the letter circulated uh, to the president and party leaders and independent senators. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding shadow ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. President, I advise the Senate that Senator Nampajimpa Price has been appointed shadow minister for Indigenous Australians. Senator Patterson is shadow minister for Home Affairs. And Senator Little as shadow minister for Child Protection and the Prevention of Family Violence. And Senator Cash as shadow attorney general. I seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator thank you. Birmingham. We now move to question time, and I'm uh, calling Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Has the government modelled the impact of its decision to increase immigration by 715,000 people over the next two years on rental markets in Australia's capital cities? Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, President, I thank Senator Smith for uh, the question, uh, and I will, uh, when I find the brief I, I was looking at before in relation to migration, I will respond directly on the nom that he identifies. But I, if I may, go to the rental point. Um, <clears throat> it is odd to get a question about uh, housing in a week where. The Coalition and the Greens are going to work together to prevent investment in housing supply. Because if, if the new coalition, because if Senator Smith were concerned, as his question suggests he is, about rental affordability, he is somebody who I think understands basic supply and demand, and he would understand <laughs> that if you increase supply, you put downward pressure on prices. So if one cares about uh, rental affordability. How do you square that away, Senator Smith? Uh, how do you square Order. that away uh, with your opposition to more investment in the very infrastructure or the, ver the very uh, capital investment that you say matters? Now, the reality is uh, uh, we have a higher net overseas migration, migration forecast uh, in 2022-23 to reflect a one-off catch-up from the pandemic and the return of international students. And I know those opposite recognise the importance of that service, export service to our economy and to the financial uh, and broader uh, position of our educational institutions. So I would have been surprised in fact, I have been surprised at Mr Dutton's position, which seems to suggest we don't want international students to return, which is, of course, an export earner for Australia, uh, but at the same time uh, uh, opposing uh, the Housing Thank you, Senator Australia Wong. Future uh, Fund. Senator Smith, first supplementary. President, a supplementary question. How does the government reconcile its plan for increased immigration with the comments made by the Reserve Bank of Australia in this month's statement on monetary policy that— 
a shortfall in housing supply relative to strong demand from a rising population is expected to result in continued upward pressure on rents, adding to the inflation mm -hmm. forecast. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Wong. Uh, well, I suppose the response to that might simply be, how do you reconcile your opposition to more investment in housing with the statement that you've just read out? I mean, they are, they, it is utterly inconsistent. But uh, I'll take, uh, because you know, Senator Smith and I have uh, served here a long time together, I will, I will take the, the less political aspect of his question, uh, which, which goes to... <laughs> Which goes to oh sorry if I done oh, no, now you're going to be in trouble aren't you I've, I've said that um, <clears throat> which goes to the inflation point and it's, it is it is uh, an important uh, balancing uh, act that the government has had to take through the budget as we look at how is it that you invest in support for cost of living given the cost of living pressures that Australians are facing without adding to inflation, well, without uh, adding to inflation. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the Expenditure Senator Review Watt. Committee Senator and the fi uh, Finance Minister and the Treasurer, uh, as well as the Prime Minister, who, uh, thank who you, Senator it, Watt. have been very focused Your on Your time that. has expired. Senator Watt, I am going to remind you it is incredibly disorderly to call out when you're walking down to the Senate, and I would further ask you to withdraw the comments that you made. Thank you. Senator uh, Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Thank President. is not the government's decision to increase immigration to unprecedented levels just another example of the government's policies working against the Treasurer's statement that inflation remains the primary challenge in our economy? Thank you, Senator Dean Smith. Senator Wong. It is quite disappointing that the, those opposite who understand the backlog in terms of net overseas migration caused by the pandemic are going down this path. Uh, it is the case uh, that we are seeing return, the return of international students. It's an important sector. Uh, I would remind the Senate that population is still forecast to be cumulatively lower than pre-pandemic forecasts by June 2023 and 215,000 persons lower in June 2024. So, in fact, whilst the net overseas migration figure is higher, the population forecast is in fact lower uh, than was forecast previously. Uh, so I would counsel uh, obviously, we understand the importance of making sure we have a sensible debate on migration. We've seen where this has gone at other times in this country. And what I would urge those opposite to recognise is that investment in housing is one of the ways we ensure uh, that we ha assist uh, in the, the battle against rising cost of living, the, the Thank global you, inflation Wong. The time for and supply chain has constraints Senator have raised. Stewart. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government's budget will fix legacy issues Labor inherited from the Liberals and Nationals and address cost of living pressures? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Uh, uh, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. Uh, the Albanese government is committed to a stronger economy and a fairer society, and the budget will reflect that. Uh, we on this side have been working hard to clean up the mess left by Liberals and Nationals. They failed to manage the budget and they drove up debt. Tonight's budget will be a budget in the best Labor tradition, a budget focused on delivering cost of living relief now, including a $14.6 billion package of targeted relief for household energy relief, bill relief, cheaper medicines, expanding access to the parenting payment and more. Now, obviously, more, much more will be revealed tonight, but I can say that this budget will deliver it, be delivered in the most responsible way so that it will not drive up inflation. Mm -hmm. We've also worked to ensure that this budget invests in the future, in the future growth of our economy with cleaner and cheaper energy at the core of that strategy, in sharp contrast to uh, what those opposite, opposite delivered. Our budget is built on a foundation of responsible economic management, a stark contrast to those opposite. Right. Tonight's budget will include uh, billions of dollars cleaning up the mess left to us by the Liberals and the Nationals. You see, unlike those opposite, Labor is not prepared to leave vital government functions unfunded, including biosecurity, disaster management, management of radioactive waste, digital health and online safety. Unlike those opposite, we're not happy to leave national collecting institutions to crumble or ignore Liberals' chronic underinvestment in our national parks or flood warning infrastructure. And of course, 
This is for the, we had to address the previous government's failure to provision a single dollar for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Not a single dollar. So I'm hoping the Queenslanders might actually cheer a government that's backing in Queensland when it comes to the Olympics Order. and Paralympic Games. And we, of course, are building on the $4.1 billion uh, in the October you, budget Walt, we had to spend to resolve legacy. Expired. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you. Can Minister Wong please explain how the government is working to provide targeted, responsible cost of living relief without adding to inflation? Senator Wong. Uh, I thank Senator Stewart for her supplementary, uh, and I would say this: uh, this senator and all senators are very focused on cost of living relief for Australians in a way that is responsible and effective. So our priority is to provide cost of living relief without adding inflationary pressure to the economy. So we will include $14.6 billion in tonight's budget in responsible, targeted cost of living relief, and it builds on. And th those opposite might remember this. They build on an increase to award wages, an increase to award wages for aged care workers, improvements to paid parental leave, and cheaper childcare. But uh, as the treasurer has flagged, it will forecast a surplus for this year, a deliberate result of the Albanese government's responsible bottom line. Now, but unlike, the, unlike those opposite, we will, do, we will deal with this responsibly. We won't be wandering around like those opposite did with the back and black ma mugs. The back and black mugs. We will deal with this budget responsibly. Responsi Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Order. Senator Stewart. Thank you. Can the minister provide further detail on, on Labor's continued responsible approach to budgeting, in contrast to the decade of waste and irresponsible spending from the Liberals and Nationals? Senator Wong. Well, uh, I would make this point that because those off opposite uh, seem to live in some sort of fantasy land where they think they were responsible. Uh, those opposite doubled the debt before the pandemic. Those opposite left Australians with a trillion dollars in debt, a trillion dollars in debt, and nothing to show for it. Order. We on this side, this government will make decisions to reduce uh, the. Oh, they Wong. don't like it, do they? Senator Wong. You don't like Senator it. Wong. It's very It's very upsetting Senator to know you're Wong. fiscally irresponsible. Please yes, your Senator. Seat. Order. I'm waiting for silence, and I'll. Call the minister again, Senator Wong. Those opposite doubled the debt before the pandemic. They left us with a trillion dollars in debt, nothing to show for it. What we will see in tonight's budget uh, is more, uh, more, more, 17.8 billion dollars in spending reprioritised, building on the 22 billion dollars in savings and reprioritisation we identified in the October budget. Guess what their savings were in their last budget? Zero, zero. Uh, one thing I would also say, uh, one, of the, one of the improvement things driving the improvement to revenue is, of course, improvement in wages, and we all Thank know you, those Wong. opposite the time are for a low for wage economy. Has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Minister, is it accurate that most working Australian families will receive no energy bill relief in this budget? but will still be hit with the costs of higher inflation and an increased tax bill caused by bracket creep. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Order on my right. Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, well, th thank you, uh, President, and I thank the Senator for her question. Uh, and I would make this point. Uh, obviously, details of the energy price relief plan uh, which required bilateral discussions with all states and territories will be, uh, re uh, will be demonstrated in some detail in tonight's budget. But it does seem strange, just like the housing question, that we get a set question from a coalition senator about energy price relief after they voted against That's it. That's right. You that? voted against it. You it. voted against the plan that you're now asking questions about. You vote. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, it's because our policies weren't going to deliver, he says. Well, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, they come in here and they say we're for energy price relief, sort of, but we're going to vote against it. And actually, we've got nothing else on the table to deliver. There's only one party here, uh, one party in go of government that is absolutely clear about the responsibility and opportunity of government to deliver.
price relief to Australian families. We know that energy prices have risen less than they would have, less than they would have if you had been in government uh, and those opposite irresponsibly voted against price relief uh, for Australian families. Uh, and we will ensure between now and the next election, every time you raise energy prices, we remind everybody who is listening that you voted against it. All of you, you voted against it. You voted against it, and really, uh, you should go out to the Australian people and you should apologise for your refusal to give some price relief to families who are struggling with higher prices. As always, you know, those opposite still too focused on the ideology, not on practical outcomes, and their only response uh, to, to energy price increases was to try and uh, hide it you. before the last thank election. Thank you, Senator Wong. Order on my left. When you're asking a question and the minister responds, I expect there to be order and that I shouldn't have to call order three or four times to get order. I'm asking you to respect the Senate. Senator Hughes, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, how many of these same families who are ineligible for Labor's energy bill relief will pay more income tax in 22-23 as a result of bracket creep and the low and middle income tax offset coming to an end? Uh, order on my right. Senator what? Uh, Senator. You ended it. So, uh, uh, order only... on my right. Order. Order on both sides. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, and I, I, I'm a little confused, and I have obviously been focused on Sudan and other issues. But um, is the Senator asking a question about a tax offset that they ended? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think so. For my, my recollection is the Lamaito was, in fact, uh, the ending of that was in fact flagged by your Correct. government. So if you're now going to fund that, I look forward to a budget reply which tells Australians how you will fund that. Well, you know, Senator Hughes, yeah, Senator Hughes, uh, you, you, are, you, are, you are asking a question about a policy. If your policy position is to fund that, I look forward to Senator, uh, Mr Dutton outlining his plan to fund that and which government services, which are parts of Medicare, he's not going to deliver uh, uh, in order to fund that. Uh, we are very focused in this budget on ensuring we provide responsible cost of living uh, assistance uh, to Australians. Now, obviously, you, you always, there is always more that you would do if you could. Thank you, Senator because... Wong. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hughes, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, the Albanese government continues to promise energy bill relief for Australians, but as this latest revolution proves, it rarely delivers and most miss out. Isn't it true that the millions of Australians ineligible for this current package also have no hope of ever seeing Labor's promised $275 cut to their bills? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, well, Senator Hughes, uh, in my state of South Australia, uh, under your refusal to act uh, on energy policies, South Australians would have been paying $530 more. $530 wow. more. Now, I, I realise you're not a South Australian senator, but I did see that. Uh, I did see that. I did see that figure, and I thought, well, there you go. That's the actual cost to South Australian families uh, of the opposition Rennick. of the opposition, uh, the no of the coalition, who extraordinarily came in here uh, and voted against lower uh, price relief for Australians at a time where we know, because of 10 years of your policies and because of what is happening with Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of Ukraine, uh, that energy prices uh, were, were going up. But you voted against it. South Australians uh, would have been $530 worse off if you had, not, if you had succeeded. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Wong in her capacity as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Minister, with the helpful ending of the quiet diplomacy strategy from both the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader last week in relation to the ongoing cruel detention of Australian journalist and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and the increasingly united cross-party call for his detention to end, 
Can you please now state clearly on the record what you are doing to ensure Julian Assange is brought home? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Wong. Uh, well, I have already, and in fact, I saw. It was interesting to me that someone, me repeating what I'd said at quite a number of press conferences, somehow was seen as a new thing. I, I have made it clear. The Prime Minister has made it clear uh, that is enough is enough. We, we see no further purpose. Uh, that we don't believe anything is to be served by Mr Assange's ongoing incarceration. And I know it might suit the Greens to not hear the fact that we have been saying that since we were elected and before, but we have. We have. Uh, now, uh, I'm also pleased that we did have the opportunity, my High Commissioner did have the opportunity to visit Mr Assange in Belmarsh Prison on the 4th of April. It is, of course, the first uh, consular visit. Uh, to Mr Assange since November 2019, and it was undertaken with his consent. Uh, it was uh, an opportunity, obviously, to check on his health and welfare, uh, which is consistent with uh, the assistance we provide to Australians who are detained. We will continue uh, at uh, all levels of, of government uh, to convey our expectations, certainly, about his treatment. Uh, and we will continue to express our view, privately and publicly, that, that this case has dragged on for long enough and should be brought to a close. Um, now, Senator Shoebridge, uh, as you would know, these are not legal proceedings to which we are a party. Uh, I know that there's been uh, some discussions with uh, parliamentary groups today. Um, the parliamentary group today. Uh, I hope those were fruitful. We are seeking uh, to do what we can to resolve it, bearing in mind we are not a party to the legal proceedings which are currently on un un foot. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. Minister, the question is not what you can't do. The question is what you are doing. Julian Assange has now been held in brutal conditions in Belmarsh Prison for over four years, with a potential extradition to the US while the potential extradition is considered. You've spoken about our close relationship with the UK and US, USA before. What are you doing as minister to ensure our good friends let Julian come home? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Wong. Uh, again, what I would say is, as minister and as the prime minister, we have put our views clearly uh, to the United <laughs> Kingdom and to the United States. Uh, but there's always a non sequitur in your question, and that is, what are we doing to ensure we cannot ensure? Um, and you might like to uh, yell about that, but just as I cannot ensure, and Senator Payne could not ensure, that people who are uh, you know, in, um, uh, dealing with the legal system of another country, well, that's a, that's a fact. Uh, now, I do think it's gone on. It, no, well, hang on. I know you want to make, play politics with this. I want to say this to you. I think it has gone Senator on too long. Yeah, I don't support what, what he did, but I think this has gone on too long. I do not believe, nor does the Australian government believe, that there is anything to be served by his ongoing incarceration. And that view informs our engagement with uh, the two countries concerned. But we are not a party to the proceedings. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, before I ask you for your second supplementary, I remind you not to interject once you've asked your question. So, second supplementary, thank you. Thursday 4 May was World Press Freedom Day, and the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus on that day tweeted, The Albanese government believes a strong and independent media is vital to democracy and holding governments to account. Journalists should never face the prospect of being charged or even jailed just for doing their jobs. Do you accept, Minister, that Julian Assange is a journalist and should not be facing persecution for telling the truth and doing his job? Senator Wong. Uh, uh, I think Australia supports the freedom of the press as an important principle in our democracy, full stop. Uh, and in relation to Mr Assange, I would again say uh, we do not believe there is anything served by his ongoing incarceration, and we have put that view. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Polly. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. The Albanese Labor Government has committed to invest in infrastructure that is nationally significant and delivers for our communities. How is the government working to deliver an infrastructure pipeline that is sustainable, comprised of nationally significant project and aligns to market capacity? Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, 
Senator Polly. Uh, I really do appreciate that question from Senator Polly, who I know understands the importance uh, of infrastructure to local communities in her state of Tasmania. Uh, before I answer, though, can I also just take the opportunity to acknowledge in the gallery Alice Springs Mayor Matt Patterson. Uh, it, I've met with Mayor Patterson in Alice Springs, as I know many others have, and we welcome you to the chamber. Uh, as we all know, the previous government left the infrastructure investment pipeline in a total mess, just like the entire budget that we inherited. And geez, don't they hate being reminded of it. The infrastructure program under the coalition government was back, full of backed up projects that were announced without the support of states or territories, poorly scoped, underfunded and couldn't be delivered because there weren't the tradespeople to build them. And why? Order. Simply Order. to win votes. The infrastructure program of the coalition government was undeliverable and spiralling out of control, having blown out from 150 projects to almost 800. The previous government got addicted to press releases and neglected the hard work of actually building infrastructure. What do we remember about the last government? All announcement, no delivery. It was a government that made investment decisions on the basis of colour-coded spreadsheets, and even now they still boast about it. One of the things that separates our government from those opposite is that when we make a promise on infrastructure, you can actually believe it. Because as many Australians have observed, we now have a government of adults in charge. What a novel suggestion that is. What a change from the last rabble that we had, the Liberal Party unable to run a budget, running the budget into the ground with the National Party members uh, making wild promises and National Party Order. ministers running around the Order. countryside promising all sorts of infrastructure projects that they didn't fund, didn't have the tradespeople to deliver. Uh, the Labor government is going to do a much better job of that, and you'll see a lot more about that tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing you, the infrastructure Watt. program for our country. Uh, before I come to you, Senator Polly, Senator Hughes, I called you to order twice, and you ignored that. I would ask you to, to Senator, Senator Henderson. My apologies, Senator Hughes. Senator Henderson, I called you to order twice and you ignored that. I would ask you to respect the Senate. And my apologies to you again, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Polly. Senator Polly, first supplementary. After a decade of waste and rorts, the Albanese government is cleaning up the mess left by the Liberals and Nationals in the infrastructure portfolio. How is the government demonstrating the commitment to nation building infrastructure and bringing certainty to the infrastructure sector? Our order. Before I call you Senator Watt, I am going to remind senators, particularly on my left, uh, that when the question is being asked, I expect you to be quiet. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Polly. The Albanese government is, in, is committed to investing in projects that are truly nationally significant and deliver real benefits to Australians. After a decade of waste and roots, the Albanese government is getting on with the job of delivering actual projects, not just promises, actual projects that will benefit communities for years to come right across, the, right across Australia. We're getting on with the job of delivering important nation-building infrastructure, like the Bruce Highway upgrades from Cairns to Townsville to Rocky, uh, and even all the way down to the outskirts of Brisbane, uh, and the Coranda Range uh, Road in North Queensland as well, along with many others in Senator Polly's, Polly's home state of Tasmania. Uh, to get our infrastructure pipeline back on a stable footing, though, we've already announced a 90-day independent review of the infrastructure investment program that will ensure that we are investing in projects that are truly nationally significant to make sure that freight keeps moving, that people can get home safely and that connections between our cities and our regions are strong. Uh, Senator P uh, Polly, second supplementary. For a decade, the Liberals and Nationals used colour-coded spreadsheets and, poli and political motives to determine infrastructure investment. What has the government inherited from the coalition in the infrastructure pipeline, and how will the Albanese government clean up the mess left behind? Order. Great question. Senator Watt. Thank you, Senator Polly. And what a mess we did inherit in the infrastructure program. An infrastructure program uh, too full of colour codes in their spreadsheets to actually be delivered, and as I say, having blown out from 150 to almost 800 projects. Let's just remember a couple of the highlights of the Liberal and National Party's infrastructure program. Remember the inland rail, which we were promised would cost $9.3 billion, 
which has now blown out to approximately $31 billion, Order. with the potential for costs to rise even further. How about the Urban Congestion Fund, full of imaginary car parks in marginal seats? Projects that were grossly underfunded and, in some cases, committed with la without land even being available. The former Treasurer, no longer with us, committed $260 million to remove a level crossing next to his own electorate without telling the state government that runs the train line. The funding was also hundreds of millions of dollars short of the actual funding required to do the job. We are adults. We are an adult government. We are going to have an infrastructure Thank program you, that can Watts, be delivered rather than mythical— Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. How much petroleum resource rent tax has been paid by LNG projects to date? Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, and thank you to Senator Pocock for the question. Uh, this is the advice I have to date, that um, uh, PRR revenue predominantly relates to oil and gas produced in Bass Strait, and no offshore LNG project has paid PRRT yet. Uh, most offshore LNG projects are not expected to place, pay substantial amounts of PRRT before 2030, whilst earning significant revenues from Australia's gas resources. So the Treasury reviews of the Gas Transfer Pricing Review highlighted the shortcomings of the PRRT for the offshore in LNG industry and the need to adapt the rules for these types of projects. Uh, the measure that is contained in the budget and the, that the Treasurer has announced is intended to address this problem and will require the offshore LNG industry to pay more tax sooner. It will bring forward PRRT payments from those projects expected uh, to pay and additional PRRT payments from those projects not expected to pay under current policy settings. So, in other words, from those who are currently under current settings likely to uh, uh, return uh, to governments and certain uh, tax receipts, uh, and though it, that will bring that, that payment forward, uh, but also um, it will ensure that some projects not current, under current settings, which would not pay under current settings, would pay some PRRT. Uh, it, the intention is to ensure a return to the Australian community from the gas resources even when there are low prices. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Pocock, first supplement. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Um, after company, pack, uh, company tax that is paid, does the government think that zero dollars in PRT is a fair return for Australians? And if it isn't, why are you just bringing forward the date they pay rather than actually ensuring that Australians are paid for our own gas that is being exported or sold back to us at export prices? Uh, Senator Wong. Well, I'll, I'll take that um, interjection because I think this is one of the problems with the debate here, that uh, there are people in this chamber who seem to believe that uh, the fact that we have a different policy position uh, is because somehow we corrupt, and I think that's really offensive. Actually, it's really offensive Senator because we on this side, Senator Wong, we on the. I'm oh, sorry, Wong. Senator Pocock. Fair enough. Please resume your seat, Senator Pocock. Um, Senator McKim will get his, his question at some stage. I'd, I'd really love an answer. To thank, you. thank you. I'll remind the minister of your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, look, the the the. The view that the Treasurer has articulated is this is about ensuring a fairer return to the Australian people from the resources they own. It is also about providing certainty to industry and making sure Australia remains a, a reliable trade and investment partner. So there are a range of uh, policy objectives, which are all, I would argue, in the national interest, that in arriving at this position after substantial consultation that the government has to balance. Uh, and we've sought to do that. So I accept that if you were only thinking about Thank you, one Senator aspect Wong, the time of those, you might come up with a different. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Thank you Minister. Um, given so many Australians are facing cost of living pressures and feeling increased climate impacts, how does the government justify increasing fossil fuel subsidies and not genuinely reforming the PRRT so that we are at least getting a return from the sale of our gas? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, Minister Wong. 
Senator Pocock, I'm happy to have a discussion with you about some of those assertions because I, I don't believe them to be correct. Um, but you know, I accept there's a bit of political rhetoric. Uh, this government has been very clear about the importance of acting on climate. Uh, we have brought forward an ambitious policy on that. You will see uh, in this budget also the, the, our commitment uh, to the transition in our economy. Uh, you made a number of assertions there about uh, PRRT, which I don't accept. Uh, you know, we do have to. Uh, we have reformed this measure because we think uh, that is justified. Uh, I've explained to you the various policy uh, objectives that have to be balanced in that. Uh, but it is not the only thing we are doing in the energy space. We do, as a country, have to transition. We do, as a country, have to uh, uh, reform. We do, as a country, want to be a renewable energy superpower, and we are committed to ensuring we do all we can to deliver Thank that. Thank you, Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Davey. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Minister. The National Emergency Management Agency's website claims it has boots on the ground across Australia through the network of regional recovery support officers that help recovery and resilience in communities affected by disasters or drought. There are currently, according to the website, 57 regions throughout Australia with locally based regional support officers, and there is um, you know, uh, videos supporting the value of the local knowledge. Um, do you, as minister, or does the agency have any plans to relocate these locally based staff from regional areas into city centres or centralised hubs? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, I know very well uh, about the uh, great work that our RSOs, as we call them uh, in the NEMA, the National Emergency Management Agency, undertake, because I've met very many of them uh, right across the country. In fact, just on Friday, I think it was, I was in Tasmania uh, at AgFest, uh, where I also met some of the terrific RSOs that have been doing a great job, and I'd met them in the floods after Tasmania, as I have in many other places. Now, uh, my view is that we do need to retain a strong regional presence of those RSOs. I know there has been some discussion internally within the National Emergency Management Agency, uh, but the agency and its, its executive are very clear uh, that my view is, as minister is that uh, the RSOs do put, perform an important role, including in regional areas. Um, they are a, an important conduit of information back to head office, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I support their ongoing use. Obviously, there are decisions to be made by the National Emergency Management Agency as to how they use their resources, uh, and that work will go on. Uh, but as I say, I've made it very clear that on a personal level as minister, I think that it is important that we retain a, a, re a regional presence amongst those RSOs. Uh, but while I'm on my feet, I might also mention um, that the entire issue of resourcing of the National Emergency Management Agency has been a difficult one in the run-up to this budget, because this is yet another uh, area of government where we have inherited funding cliffs. And in fact, the former coalition government cared so much about having RSOs and a regional presence and support for our emergency management agency that they were on track to cut funding to the National Emergency Management Agency by around 25 to 30 per cent. That's how much they cared about supporting our RSOs and our agency, uh, and I can assure people uh, that this government takes Thank these you. issues much more seriously. Uh, Senator Watt, the time has expired. Senator Davey, first supplementary. Thank you, and I'm very interested that you uh, believe in the need to retain a regional presence. Can you then explain why several uh, of my colleagues have been contacted by RSOs in their regions, including myself, um, to with, by RSOs who have been told that they will be relocated to city-based centres or centralised hubs within 12 months. Is there any truth in their concerns? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Davey. Well, as I say, uh, my personal view has been communicated very clearly 
uh, to the National Emergency Management Agency that I think it is vital that we retain a regional presence of these uh, support recovery support officers, uh, because that is where many of the, re the disasters that we've seen over the last couple of years has occurred, has been in our regions, and we want to make sure that we do have people on the ground. As I say, there is work to be done by NEMA about how best to allocate its resources. And one of the reasons they've been forced to do this is because of the funding cuts that were on track to happen as a result of the budget that we inherited from the former government. So I do find it a little hard uh, to listen to national party uh, senators who all of a sudden are very concerned about resourcing for the National Emergency Management Agency when one of their own was the minister who delivered a budget that was going to cut funding to the National Emergency Management Agency by 25 to 30 per cent. We support regional Australians. We support urban Australians going through disasters. We're not about cutting uh, funding you, like Senator you like did. The time for answering has expired. Senator Davies, second supplementary. So, very briefly, very briefly, Minister, you have said it's your personal view that RSOs should stay in the regions. Will you be having a conversation with the CEO of NEMA to reflect on him your personal view? to ensure that regional support officers stay in the regions and aren't re-centralised hundreds of kilometres away from where they are needed and valued? Senator Watt. Well, I've already said in my first answer and my second answer that I've communicated my view about this, and that includes to the Coordinator General of the National Emergency Management Agency, Mr Brendan Moon, someone we hired with an incredible track record in emergency management to replace another individual called Mr Shane Stone. Uh, and Brendan Moon has been doing an outstanding job as the head of the National Emergency Management Agency. Now, uh, uh, now unlike the former Watt, government— Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, I'm waiting for order on my left, Senator Davey. Of order, I mean that was highly disrespectful to a former commissioner, maybe not a member of this parliament, but I think we still need to show respect. Uh, order, order. I did not hear any particular comments, um, so I'm going to ask. Senator Watt to continue. Thank you, President. As I, as I, I invite you to have a look at the Hansard, where I said that Mr Moon replaced another individual by the name of Mr Shane Stone. Uh, so I'm not sure what's, in, what's offensive about that. Is it uh, individual, the name? I'm not quite sure. But anyway, this government has demonstrated from day one that we take the issues around disaster management far more seriously than ever happened under the former government. We actually showed up. We actually turned up and delivered support to people. We actually cooperated with the states rather than had fights with them. Order and on my left. we are taking Order. seriously the needs of funding for the National Emergency Management Agency, unlike a government that was on track to cut funding by 25 to 30 per cent. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. I refer to the government's recently announced retention bonus for ADF personnel that have just completed their return of service obligations or initial mandatory period of service four years. I draw the minister's attention to the numerous bonuses offered by both Liberal and Labor governments over the last 25 years. These include retention bonuses for Army specialists, bonuses and increased pay for submariners, and category retention bonuses for the RAF. Despite all this, the ADF is still struggling to attract and retain personnel. Why will this bonus system work when all others have failed? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Wong. Th thank you, President. I, I thank Senator Lambie for the question and acknowledge her, her many years of contribution uh, both in this place and beyond in relation to matters, the matters associated with defence, and in particular her deep concern always for members of the ADF, including veterans. Uh, and I, she is right to point out that the, uh, the ADF uh, has, under governments of both political persuasion, uh, not had uh, um, the, the not been able to recruit and retain at the level that we seek. She's right, uh, and I don't pretend that uh, there is an easy answer to that. Uh, uh, and the government has been seized of this issue. Uh, there, was, there has been, um, uh, in the context of, obviously there's been a lot of work on the DSR uh, as well as AUKUS and in the context of the budget, we're very focused on trying to work through how it is we might deal with some of these recruitment and retention issues. Um, uh, 
we, we note the previous government made some very uh, substantial announcements about increases to the ADF, ADF but were not on a pathway to deliver it. And we, we are looking uh, at a range of ways in which we might seek to do that. So I don't come in here, Senator Lambie, and tell you that somehow magically uh, all of those challenges associated with recruitment and retention will be resolved by one policy only. I suspect it won't be. Uh, I think it will assist. Uh, but I think more needs to be done. And I'd make the broader point that it's not just an issue for the ADF. Uh, obviously, uh, we are under you know, there's a there's a lot of sectors of the economy where we have um, a shortage of, of people willing to uh, work in those uh, you know, where we have labour shortages. We have a lot of sectors of the economy uh, where skilled staff are hard to both attract and Thank retain. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, and the Senator ADF. Lambie. Uh, Senator Wong, time for answering has expired. Senator Lambie, first supplement. Thank you, Madam President. This bonus appears to be available only to personnel who have recently completed their return of service obligations or their initial mandatory period of service for four years. This means, in a practical sense, this will only be offered to the most junior ranks across the military. This will be a slap in the face to, the, to a junior leaders like corporals and sergeants and their colleagues in the Navy and the RAF who are attractive, attractive employees to civilian organisations. These are the ones you need to retain. They generally, why doesn't the government want to keep these junior leaders in uh, our military? Thank you, Senator Lambie. The time has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Lambie, in the time while uh, I was seeking to answer your first question, I have been provided with a little more information, and I might provide you with that. Um, as part of this year's budget, the, the government is announcing funding of an ADF continuation bonus. Um, the advice is that this is critical to influencing career decisions when the member is approaching their first opportunity to make a decision to stay or leave uh, the Australian Defence Force. Um, uh, we uh, obviously have been, as I said, uh, considering uh, a number of uh, the recommendations in the DSR. Uh, there were four recommendations relating to recruitment and retention, uh, and the government is developing options uh, uh, to respond to each of those four recommendations. The, the bonus that we are discussing was the immediate response of the DSR um, in, order to, uh, demonstrate, in order to continue to invest in uh, the growth and you, retention Senator Walsh. of a highly the skilled time defence for workforce. Has expired. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you. I'm not sure who's writing the policies, but they got it completely wrong. This bonus is reported to be available to just 3,500 defence personnel out of some 60,000 over three years. That's just over 1,000 per year. Defence reported in its 2021-22 annual report that about 11 per cent of its personnel, some 6,500 left the military that year. Why is the government offering a retention bonus to so few of our men and women in the ADF when the problem is so much greater than just a few thousand? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Senator Lambie. I think in my first question I did uh, acknowledge that the problem is greater than, uh, one me than uh, the capacity of one measure to respond. And, uh, as I said, the DSR did, did contain a number of recommendations in relation to recruitment and retention. We will work through them and uh, defence will provide to government options for them. However, the immediate response was this, what's been described as a continuation bonus. I'm advised the eligibility for the bonus includes permanency, uh, nearing completion of the initial minimum period of service, having completed or will complete a minimum four years of service, agreeing to recommit to three years of full-time service and not all already in receipt of another bonus for the same commitment reason. Uh, the, uh, I think the Senator's response is, uh, why, is the, uh, recruitment, uh, why is this continuation bonus uh, narrowly cast? Uh, it is for the reasons that I identified in my previous answer. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services outline how the Albanese government is delivering on its commitments in the budget to deliver cost of living relief where it can? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, and can I thank uh, Senator O'Neill for her ongoing interest in uh, pushing down the uh, cost of living, particularly for uh, constituents in her great state of New South Wales. And the centrepiece of the budget we hand down tonight will be a 
$14.6 billion cost of living relief package that is calibrated in a way that does not add to inflation. Oh, yeah. Our economic plan has three parts – relief, repair and restraint. I will repeat that for Senator Birmingham's <coughs> benefit – relief, repair and restraint. This includes cost of living relief where it is affordable and responsible, and it also focuses on repairing uh, of our uh, supply chains. We need to show spending restraint to ensure we are getting genuine value for money from investments in our economy and our people so that we can clean up the mess left behind this lot over here. We have carefully cal calibrated and designed this budget so that it takes pressure off the cost of living rather than adds to it. This will be a budget in the best of Labor tradition. Help, help. Help. I'll repeat that. I'll repeat that. This will be a budget in the best Labor tradition. Help for, a vul for vulnerable Australians with cost of living pressures. An eye on the future and responsible economic management. Our aim throughout, whether it's cost of living package, our broader investment in energy and other efforts to grow the economy, is to make sure that this budget is part of the solution to high inflation and cost of living pressures not adding to the problem. It's important that, as a government, we focus on every policy lever available to us to tackle the pressures that are affecting more Australians' ability to make ends meet. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, Senator Farrell, for that fulsome um, response, and I'm sure it gives hope to the people of Australia. Uh, Senator, what measures has the government already taken in the social services portfolio to deliver cost of living relief? Senator Farrell. Thank you, President. Once again, thank uh, Senator. Uh, Senator. Senator. Well, I, 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 I'm trying to be doing that. I'm disappointed you don't think I am, Senator Mackenzie. As, as a government, as a government, of course, we've been delivering on our commitment to address cost of living relief. We're delivering cheaper medicines and childcare. This will make a huge difference to the cost parents face in accessing quality care for their children. Uh, we have also announced a $64 million commitment for place-based partnerships to tackle uh, entrenched uh, disadvantage. This will extend to Stronger Places, Stronger People initiative in the existing 10 communities and enhance shared decision-making and local solutions in six of these communities. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced changes to the parenting payment single bu budget measure that will lift both eligibility to parents with children up to 14 years of age and Thank lift you, the Senator payment Farrell. value the by $176.90. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. How is the government working to address ongoing concerns about cost of living beyond the immediate budget? Senator Farrell. <laughs> thank you, President, and thank uh, um, Senator uh, O'Neill for her second uh, supplementary question. This government will make substantial investments through the budget this year to provide cost of living relief and meaningful improvements to services like Medicare and cheaper childcare and the single parents uh, we know <coughs> there are pockets of disadvantage right around Australia and communities where people continue to struggle to get ahead. These measures will provide structural household budget relief once legislated. I remind the Senate that we have also established an expert economic inclusion advisory committee uh, and ask them to give us advice on boosting economic inclusion and tackling disadvantage. And I acknowledge that uh, Senator Pocock, uh, in his advocacy and work alongside the government in establishing this committee, addressing cost of living pressures is consistent with what we said we would do before the election, what Labor governments always do. When the Liberal National Party talk about cost of living pressures, we know it's been tough because Australians are paying the thank price. Thank you, Senator Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong, and I refer the Minister to the Albanese government's $240 million commitment to a new stadium to be built on Hobart's waterfront. And I ask and refer the Minister to Tasmanian Labor leader Rebecca White's question in Parliament today, the Tasmanian Parliament, about whether the federal government will be excising from GST calculations this commitment from the federal government. Will you, Minister, guarantee that this will not impact on Tasmania's share of the GST? 
Thank you, Senator Dunham. Minister Wong. I, thank you. Uh, I have learnt a lot from um, Senator um, Dunham across the chamber about Tasmanian politics. Yeah. Because well, he's explained to me, and as this question really goes to, that He's from the Tasmanian Liberal Party, but he doesn't support the Tasmanian Liberal government on the stadium. But Labor supports the Tasmanian Liberal government, except Senator Colbeck does support the Tasmanian Liberal government. So it's an interesting situation. Uh, Senator Walt, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Dunham. So uh, obviously, President, on relevance, uh, Senator Wong's talking about all sorts of political things, not what matters to Tasmanians, and that's our GST share. It's order, serious. Order on my left and right. Uh, Senator Dunham, your question did go to uh, a question asked in the state parliament by another party, so I think Senator Wong is entirely within uh, the confines of your question. And if she doesn't get, uh, if she continues to answer the question, if she doesn't, I'll draw her to the question. Thank you, uh, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, well. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, uh, what I would say is, uh, obviously, we are investing in Tasmania, but not only uh, in the stadium, but in health, housing, and infrastructure. Uh, we are, uh, for example, we announced recently an additional Medi Medicare urgent care clinic, taking the number of Medicare urgent care clinics to be established from uh, in the state Senator to four. Rustin. We've provided funding for two shepherd centres in Tassie, one in Hobart and one in Launceston, and we're investing in, in key infrastructure. Uh, I, I, am, I, I don't, unlike Senator Dunham, I don't, I'm afraid to say I don't watch the Tasmanian Parliament. Sorry. Uh, and I have a lot of regard for, for um, uh, Ms White, uh, but I, I don't know what the question was, but I certainly will take on... Take on Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. But, but, but President, uh, on a point of order, because Senator Dunningham wasn't asking Senator Wong to, uh, to have some sort of uh, powers of knowledge as to what was happening in the Tasmanian parliament. He referenced that, but he asked a very specific question as to whether the minister would guarantee that the funding of the stadium in Tasmania would not impact on Tasmania's GST share. Minister Wong is representing the Treasurer in this place. It's a question for the Commonwealth Treasurer, quite appropriately, and one that Minister Wong should be able to uh, fairly directly address. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will draw uh, that part of the question to Senator Wong's attention. Lecture from Senator Birmingham about directly addressing questions. <laughs> anyway, we all remembered. All running a budget. That's true. Uh, uh, we all remember that. Uh, GST payments, Order. as you know, Order. Senator. Uh, are allocated in, in accordance with a formula, uh, uh, and uh, that there is no change that I understand either the coalition or the Labor government has proposed to the way in which GST allocations are being made. Um, uh, but well, well, I will I will get what information I can on the specifics of a question asked by a Labor. Uh, person in the state uh, thank parliament you, Senator of Tasmania Walker. Time to for assist you, Senator has expired. Dunham. Senator Dunham, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Well, uh, health was mentioned in the primary question, so I again refer to Labor's $240 million commitment to a waterfront stadium, and I ask, can the minister guarantee that in tonight's federal budget uh, that it will also be included funding for a desperately needed permanent full-time GP service for Tasmania's Central Highlands community? Uh, thank you, Senator Dunham. Senator Wong. Uh, well, I, I, thank you. I, I have already indicated that we have recently announced additional Medicare urgent care clinic for Tasmania, which will take uh, the number uh, established in the state to four, Devonport, Launceston and two in Hobart. Uh, I would make the point that uh, it is those of us on this side uh, in government and in opposition which has uh, always Wong, supported please Medicare, resume your seat. unlike Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, just again on relevance, I asked a very specific question, not about urgent care clinics or about Medicare. I asked about GP services specifically for the Tasmanian Central Highlands community, and I haven't had a guarantee yet. Uh, I do think uh, Senator Wong is being relevant, but I will draw her to. Uh, Senator Rustin, I would remind you to act respectively and not call out and interject when I am answering a point of order. 
Um, but I will remind her to the specifics of uh, the Highlands region. Thank you. Pen well, actually, Senator I did Wallace. answer the question because I said, you know, obviously these the, these are. If, the, if I'm being asked a question about tonight's budget, the senator will have to wait till the budget is announced. But uh, I would I would also make the point, and it is order. Uh, I would I'll hold you to that. I, I would uh, I bet you that won't happen. Um, uh, I would make this point. <laughs> I'm trying to finish the sentence here. Uh, the, the senator raises Medicare. Well, we know who built Medicare. That's right. We know who's always supported Medicare. Uh, thank you, we Senator know who's Wong. failed, time failed for to fund Medicare. Has it's not those... Senator Dunham, second supplementary. President, thank you. No guarantee on GST, no guarantee on GP services for Central Highlands. Can the minister confirm that in last year's Labor budget, $248.6 million was ripped out of Tasmanian road projects, and yet in this year's budget, the government's found $240 million for the Hobart Stadium. Given Labor took money from road projects in a state where we have the worst road death toll in the country to fund a stadium, doesn't this show how out of touch with Tasmania's priorities Labor really is? Uh, thank you, Senator Dunham. Order, order, order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you. The advice I have was, is that as part of the, the uh, government's 22-23 October projects, no, no projects, sorry, 22-23 October budget, no projects in Tasmania were cancelled or had funding reduced. The IIP also provided for more than $230 million over oh, 10 Senator years what? for smaller— uh, Senator Wong, sorry, please be... resume your seat. Uh, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, point of order on the advice that uh, Senator oh, Wong— Senator McKenzie, that is not a point on of relevance. order. Uh, the minister is being relevant. Thank, relevant. Thank you. Please resume your seat, Minister Wong. I know the truth hurts sometimes, Senator McKenzie. Uh, the statement that the senator made, I don't think, is correct. Uh, and I would say this: in terms of the needs of Tasmania, I think the assertion that this senator is making is he understands them better than Senator Colbeck and his Liberal premier. Uh, and with that, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Ah, thank you. Um, uh, senators, I would ask if you're leaving the chamber to do so quietly, and I'm giving the call to Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. I refer to the matter in which the President made a statement on Thursday, 30th of March, 2023. I was not in the chamber when the statement was made by the President, and Senator Hughes withdrew, withdrew her remarks. In order to maintain the dignity of the chamber, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. And just before we go to taking note, I would like to thank both uh, Senators Hughes and Thorpe for the gracious way in which they have withdrawn their, those comments. And I would remind all senators to recheck the comments that I made on that day and to act in a respectful way. Thank you. Uh, are you doing taking note? Oh, okay. Senator Rustin. Um, pursuant to Standing Order 74, number 5, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister Farrell, as to why answers to Senate estimates questions on notice numbers 00035, 00037, 00039, 00051, 00053, 00064, 00065, 00066. 00005 Triple zero five six one, triple zero five six two, triple zero five six six, triple zero six oh nine, triple zero six one oh, triple zero six one one, triple zero six four five, and triple zero six four seven. Why they have not been provided. Minister. Senator Rustin for her question. The uh, most recent Senate estimates for the uh, Health and aged care portfolio were held on the 
16th of February. Coming out of those hearings, there were 981 questions on notice directed to uh, this portfolio. Answers have been tabled for 645 of these questions, uh, and that uh, represents around two-thirds of the questions uh, that have been answered. More are expected to uh, be tabled very shortly. There are um, uh, 336 uh, questions on notice uh, that um, uh, are outstanding, and these will be tabled in due course. Senator Rustin. Oh, no, I've gave the call to Senator Rustin. Hmm. Hmm? I, oh, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation provided by the Minister. Just before I give you the call, Senator Farrell, did you want to, by leave, add anything other information? Okay. No. Kennedy no, no, to not denying Senator Rustin. Yeah. Uh, Senator Farrell was indicating that he may have further information to deliver to the chamber. Um, I, I did actually okay. stand first before Senator Rustin. I had a statement. I had a statement that I was going to read. Uh, I was simply uh, indicating that I wish to read that statement. However, I will defer to Senator Rustin. So, Senator Rustin, you have the call. You've moved the motion. Take note. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, obviously, we will all remain with great interest in the statement that Senator Farrell was going to make about the fact that we have these overdue questions um, from the supplementary budget estimates 22-23. Um, and you know, these are questions that were very serious questions asked of this government in relation to two of the most important portfolios before government, that of health and aged care. Um, and you know, it's pretty extraordinary that you know a government who went to the election. Um, saying that it wanted to be elected on a, on, a, on a platform of transparency, and yet here we are with these really important questions remaining unanswered. This is, these questions are not a couple of days late, Senator Farrell. They're not a couple of days late. They're not a couple of weeks late. They're not a couple of months late. They are really, really late. In fact, um, you know, as we go into the next round of estimates, you know, we could quite easily see in the very near future, if you don't actually provide these answers, that we'll have three lots of estimates with um, questions all outstanding at the same time. So, you know, to call yourself a transparent government would have to be the greatest contradiction in terms I have ever heard. You are opaque. Um, but this is, this is the kind of track record that we're starting to see from this government in relation to their ability to actually provide the transparency that they promised Australians that they would. Um, and we've seen it through so many mechanisms by which they've addressed this chamber. And I draw to the attention an extremely, extremely distressing track record that is, start, is and a pattern of play that's starting to emerge. And it's in relation to the inability to provide any details whatsoever um, about legislation and the mechanisms that sit behind legislation when they introduce them into parliament. We see headline after headline after headline. We see legislative um, instrument after legislation after legislation, all of which with the details completely absent. And they're expecting us in here to do our job. So I would say actually to those that sit not on the government benches, although sometimes I wonder whether the Greens actually are sitting on the government benches, do your job. Do your job and make sure you hold this government to account about the transparency and the detail around what they're doing. Stop letting legislation through this place when the details of that legislation are all going to be contained in subordinate legislation where they do not give us any detail of. So, you know, in, in, today we are go, uh, um, uh, debating uh, the, the, um, the housing Australia Future Fund legislation, but we don't have the investment mandate details. So I would say to those in this chamber, please think very seriously before you let this government push things through completely opaquely, give you no detail because they just don't want you to know. And I think you know, human nature would always tell you when somebody is actually hiding things from you, it's usually because they've got something to hide. Um, so here we are, um, you know, six months later, and I still don't have answers to questions that we asked in October. Um, and the thing that is probably most distressing is the impact of the lack of this information is actually having more broadly in the wider community. Uh, and I draw, yourself, uh, draw the chamber's attention particularly to the crisis that we're seeing in aged care at the moment, where we know 
um, that some pretty ill-considered, opaque, detailless legislation was shoved through this place. And shame on those who supported the government at the other end of the chamber after we gave you a very clear and cogent reason why you shouldn't be letting this legislation be shoved through. Um, we are now seeing aged care facilities closed down as a result of the fact that this legislation was pushed through here with no possible ability for it ever to be able to be delivered. I mean, the, the Royal Commission into Aged Care said that 24-7 nurses uh, should be uh, put in place in our aged care facilities around Australia by 2024. You've also got to remember that that recommendation was made before COVID and before we had the crisis in healthcare workers that we're seeing at the moment. So despite the fact that the Royal Commission said 2024, despite the fact of the changing landscape in relation to our care workforce, this government, with the support of those down the other end, forced through a piece of legislation that has now seen many nursing homes closed across Australia, which means older Australians, particularly those that live in rural and regional Australia, have been forced out of a place that they call home and often have to move many, many, many miles away from where they were living, away from their families, away from their community, away from their loved ones, just because you guys didn't do your job and make these guys be more transparent about the promises that they have made. Um, as we stand here today, you know, we heard um, a conversation during question time in relation to urgent care clinics. These were promised that there would be 50 urgent care clinics in place by the 30th of June this year. Um, we still don't know where most of these urgent care clinics are going to be, um, despite the, the few in Tasmania. But despite knowing where a few of them are going to be, we still don't know. Is there going to be one additional consultation? Is one more person going to be able to get into a doctor? Is one more person going to be able to get better access, cheaper access or easier access in relation to primary care as a result of these clinics? Well, the answer simply has to be no, because this government has done nothing at all about the crisis that's before us right now, which is the workforce crisis. We do not have enough workers in our healthcare system at the moment because all they're doing is running around making headline promises that don't address the fundamental underlying problem that is before us. So we're now two weeks away from the 12-month anniversary of the election of this Albanese Labor government. And I think it is really quite extraordinary that despite going to the election promising that they were going to strengthen Medicare, going to the election with a catch cry, it's never been harder or more expensive to see a doctor, and we sit here on the eve of 12 months, we sit here today um, with not, uh, not a lot of hope that in the budget tonight there are going to be any measures that actually put in place the guarantee that they made to the Australian public about the health care system, about the aged care system. They are just simply not delivering. And we also know, I mean, the minister himself, the minister himself, Mark Butler, actually labelled the GP workforce crisis as terrifying. Well, it can't be that terrifying because we seem to have a lack of urgency, a lack of transparency about where they are going to find the unmet demand to backfill into this sector so that this terrifying situation in the minister's words, is addressed. And I also want to put on the record how disgusting it is that this government seems to believe that the sacrificing of rural, regional and remote Australia is an acceptable thing to do to mend their budget. Every single action we've seen taken so far has a perverse additional adverse impact on rural, regional Australia. You know, the irresponsible and reckless changes to the distribution priority areas, the shoving of our skilled regional visas to the bottom of the processing pile, and uh, we now continue to see in the measures that are in this budget, uh, many of them will have a much, much more significant impact in rural, regional and remote Australia than they will in the capital cities. But this government just does not seem to care. Um, so, you come in here, you ask us to pass legislation, you refuse to answer questions, you refuse to give us detail about that legislation. So I would say uh, to the crossbench, to the Greens, do your job and make sure that you demand the information that I think every Australian expects us to know before we make the important decisions that are likely to impact on people's lives and livelihoods and wellbeing. So to my point in relation to aged care, one of the questions on notice that has still not been answered 
is how many aged care homes have closed in the last six months, where were they located, and has this been broken down into modified Monash areas? And can the department provide a list of the providers um, that are likely to close? For some reason, we can't provide that information. So the question must be, does the government not have this information? Is the government not tracking the potential impact of a decision that they have made, uh, one that has such extraordinary impacting, um, impacts on older Australians? Do they not know or are they just not wanting to tell us how many aged care homes have closed? Uh, in the case of mental health, uh, one of the questions asks, has the department been contacted by psychologists or mental health professionals since the decision to revert from 20 Medicare subsidised mental health sessions on 30 December 2022? Has the department been contacted by individuals since that decision? Uh, in seeking to have the decision to revert to 20 Medicare sessions? Has the minister's office been contacted by psychologists or mental health professionals uh, since the decision was made um, in, in uh, health sessions in 2022? 20, uh, um, and did the department provide advice to the government on the risks associated uh, with the Better Access Initiative reverting to 10 sessions? What was that advice? Is the department aware of reports that 70 per cent of general practitioners say mental health is a top three priority reason why patients attend their practice? And can the department confirm whether they briefed health ministers on the increase in suicide rates uh, and, uh, uh, and had the minister consulted with Suicide um, Prevention Australia and Mental Health Australia, the two peak bodies, before they made their decision to slash these really important mental health supports? Um, in half. Uh, they haven't answered those questions. And when you consider um, that right now we know um, from uh, peak body research that the most impactful thing that is impacting on Australians' lives uh, and their mental health right now is cost of living. We know um, Lifeline has reported an 80 per cent rise in the number of calls in relation to cost of living pressures. Headspace's recent survey a uh, national survey has identified the cost of living as one of the top three issues facing young Australians, and a recent uh, reach-out survey found that more than 50 per cent of young people in Australia are stressed out by the cost of living. Now, there would be, uh, you would have to be blind not to realise that cost of living is the number one issue facing our country at the moment, with the rampant homegrown Albanese government inflation eating into people's um, quality uh, of life. And so, at a time when that is, uh, that is happening, when there are some serious questions to be asked in relation to decisions by this government to put in place um, a program um, in, uh, or to cut slash in half a program that supported mental health supports, uh, at a time when we know that cost of living is having a massive impact on people's mental health, this government refuses to answer even the most basic of questions about what was the basis that sat behind their decision to slash these particular programs when they happened. Um, another question that is before us at the moment uh, that we still have not had answered is, you know, what is the current unmet need for GPs? How many vacant places and where are those vacant places are in relation to the Maldifade Monash categories? Can the department provide a modified Monash uh, model map highlighting areas where GP shortages are most significant? And what new measures has the government put in place to increase the supply and distribution of GPs across the country? How many international medical graduates have moved from MM5 to MM7 areas um, to MM5 and below since the decision was made to change the distribution priority areas? Now, as I said, the minister has been out there and saying this is the most you know, like terrifying crisis that's before the nation. Um, he made a promise to the Australian public that he was going to fix this in coming into government, and yet a really, really fundamental set of questions that go to the very nature of the impact of these measures on rural, regional and remote Australia remain unanswered as we stand here today, months and months after they were asked. So I think there is clearly a track record that is starting to, and a, and a pattern of behaviour that is starting to emerge here, that suggests that this government 
has got no intention whatsoever of caring about the real delivery of those headline promises they made to Australians when they came in uh, when they were up for election. They're quite happy to make the headlines uh, and go out there, and often headlines sound good. I mean, who wouldn't think strengthening Medicare was a good idea? Who wouldn't think putting the care back into aged care was a good idea? But they're just headlines unless you put in place the real initiatives that are going to actually make a difference. And they're not much really worth the paper they're written on if you are not prepared to provide the details around how you're going to go about that so Australians can actually see how these things are happening. And we're already starting to see the wheels fall off, as we've seen with the aged care promises. The wheels are falling off because older Australians are being pushed out of their aged care homes, places that they've lived often for many years, simply because this government was so pig-headed around insisting the 24-7 nurse requirement was in place almost without exception or exemption, um, and we are now starting to see the consequences of this uh, announcement that obviously was something that we all would have aspired to see, that the older Australians get the care that they deserve and they warrant in their old age. But shoving them out of their homes simply because you've put in place a requirement for an action that was never deliverable, I think, is one of the most despicable things that a government could do. You are more interested in the headline delivery of a promise that you made at the election than actually watching the circumstances as they unfolded on the ground and realise that your actions were actually going to have terrible detrimental impacts on older Australians. And instead of helping older Australians, you've made their lives worse. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Um, I take note of the motion moved by Senator Rustin, uh, and I do so in um, uh, general terms, because what is becoming clearer and clearer when you look at the list of questions that remain unanswered by the government is that um, that list is getting longer and longer day by day and across portfolios. Now, I know when you have a change of government and ministers are trying to get their feet under the desk and get across their portfolios and their briefs, department uh, personnel might be changing, that it's hard to keep up with all of the um, demands of uh, the chamber uh, demanding information. Um, however, um, we are now seeing uh, the second budget being handed down by this government today, uh, and there is just no excuse for ministers and departments to hold back basic information that this Senate has voted for and that individual members, individual senators, uh, have asked of uh, ministers and departments uh, and, indeed, agencies, because that is what we are here to do. It doesn't really matter what side of politics you come from. The job of the Senate is to scrutinise legislation and hold government and government officials to account. That is our job. It isn't a winner-takes-all parliament. And I continually am surprised at the uh, lack of um, acceptance from some within the government that they didn't actually uh, they don't actually have control of this chamber. They don't control the Senate, and they never will. The Australian people have voted for diversity in this place for a reason, because it forces all sides of politics to work together to get better outcomes, to ensure that uh, mistakes are picked up before they're made, to ensure that accountability of individual uh, ministers and departments is uh, had and that there is basic transparency so that the public, the community uh, and uh, those who um, are actually uh, neck deep in policy development uh, actually have a good idea of what's really going on. And I just look at this list of questions and I think mm, sometimes it feels like it's just stubbornness just basic stubbornness that government ministers, some government, not all, some are quite good, but some have a, uh, a less favourable record than others when it comes to coughing up information. 
It's as if they've got the Messiah uh, complex. I'm in charge, uh, my way or the highway. Oh, it doesn't really matter if the Senate's asking for things. Well, no, it does matter. It does matter. And I know there is a um, long list of um, uh, orders of production of documents. There has been many orders passed through this place, and I know the government is becoming more and more frustrated with that. However, unless you start to actually participate in the transparency of government and work with the Senate to get across these issues, then you know what? There's going to be more and more of these questions and requests from the parliament, because otherwise we're being asked to vote on legislation without having all of the information. I've got some uh, questions and uh, orders of production or documents that I've put into the government that are still outstanding. And no excuse except that they don't want to put the work in. Decisions that were made by the previous government that they won't even reveal. Well, I'm sorry. Not my problem. We need the information. We have required the information. The government must cough it up. And I don't. What strikes me is that it's not just a um, an individual minister's problem here. This seems to be a reoccurring uh, attitude and a growing attitude within uh, this government that they don't have to comply uh, with requests of information of this chamber. Um, and I don't think that's a very good way of building collaboration. I don't think it's a very good way of enlisting trust. Uh, and I don't think um, it's acceptable to think that uh, the Senate can be ignored. Now, we're about to have another round of estimates after this budget, and there's going to be a whole lot of new areas to be inquiring into and detail to be getting into because we're going to have the new budget. But there are so many questions that remain outstanding uh, from the previous estimates and the estimates before. I mean, one particular issue that I'm concerned about is that the government has made promises in relation to streaming services. You know, they went to the election saying that they would put quotas on streaming services, which they should, something that I've fought very hard for for a long time in this place. Now, through a Senate pro committee process, we've asked for the documents that the government department has issued to stakeholders and industry players, but they're refusing to give that information to the parliament. Now, I'm sorry if the big TV broadcasters and the big tech giants can have access to this information, so should the Australian parliament. Why is the Minister for Communications refusing to give this information? It's actually out there. Stakeholders have been told, oh, here's a private confidential copy. Please don't tell anybody about it. Yet when the parliament and the Senate ask for this information so that we can understand what the government is planning, we can be prepared, we can participate in the transparency and accountability process of government, we are denied. So Foxtel, Netflix, Amazon, the big streaming giants get access to this information, but the parliament doesn't. Who do you govern for? The big tech giants or the Australian people? And this is just one example. This is just one example of the arrogance that is seeping into this government's attitude to how this chamber should be responded to and dealt with. And I say to government ministers in this place and to uh, those watching that once you start sliding into this type of attitude, it's hard to put the brakes on. And we saw that with the last government, the arrogance that ended up sweeping through. 
the front bench of the previous government. The lack of respect for the chamber, the lack of respect for other voices and the diverse views in this place, the lack of ultimate respect to the taxpayer and the people who vote at election time based on the promises uh, and the um, uh, policies that are put forward. And once you start thinking you're better than the entire parliament, it is the road to hell. So don't fall foul of the arrogant attitude that Mr Morrison, the former Prime Minister, fell foul of. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to think that anyone would start appointing themselves to secret ministries. Um, but it all starts somewhere. It all starts somewhere. And it starts with refusing to think that you're accountable to the parliament. And it ends with the prime minister, the former prime minister, who didn't even think he was accountable to his own cabinet. He started secretly appointing himself. So let's, let's actually think about um, how we want government and this parliament to actually deal with and respect the Australian people, the taxpayers and the voters. And it has to start with the basic commitment to transparency of government. Once that starts to be negotiated away, oh, just a little bit over here, or oh, just cover up over here, or just denial of this over there, it is the road to hell. And the Australian people expect better and deserve better. So when their representatives come into this place asking for information from the government and their agencies, it needs to be coughed up. It's not up to you as individual ministers to think you can just hide behind delay, cabinet incompetence, I mean the, the, the cloak of secrecy that gets dragged over everything. If you want this parliament to work, to deliver the things that you have promised, you must work with it. So this extraordinary amount of outstanding questions and orders for production of documents, um, it should alarm you that less than 12 months on, you are already in breach of the basic courtesy of being transparent and upfront uh, with not just the chamber and the parliament, but the Australian people that you purport to represent. And I would hope that despite the budget being handed down tonight and this being the government's day, and you know, there's, I'm sure there's lots of, lots of goodies in there that you're um, hoping to sprue can be proud of, and I hope that we are genuinely going to see some relief uh, for people to the enormous pressures of cost of living that everyday people are feeling right now, and particularly the most vulnerable and marginalised in our communities. But you can't just promise headlines and then not deliver the policy grit and grunt that comes with it. And in order to ensure that that is there, you're going to have to be transparent with this chamber. If we spend the next two uh, estimate weeks uh, hearing from government ministers and department secretaries that they can't tell us the details of things, well, I'm sorry. Um, don't expect this place to be rubber stamping your legislation. Why is it that government officers uh, and department officials are so often more interested in not answering, que answering questions at Senate estimates than giving the information? And the whole process of Senate estimates is to enlist confidence that what the government of the day, regardless of the politics, regardless of what 
side of the chamber you sit on. It's about enlisting confidence that the policies that are being put forward and the programs that are being that money is being spent on and that the decisions that are being made are sound. And yet, year after year after year, what we are confronted with, particularly from the Senate crossbench uh, perspective, is government officers, department secretaries, who spend their entire time trying not to answer questions. Often I find it takes more energy not to answer a question than just to be up front. I, mean, I know in this place we often, you know, the, the politics creeps in and the sport of the of chamber debate creeps in. But when it comes to Senate estimates, it is not up to departmental officials to play the sport of politics. They are public servants and they should be allowed to answer basic questions. They should be directed from their ministers to be as helpful as possible, to be as transparent as possible, to go out of their way to help the Senate understand what they are doing, what they have been directed to do and what they are spending money on. That is their job. Their job is not to be an extension of the political arm of government. They are public servants, not servants of the government. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. Look, I want to um, thank Senator Rustin for putting this motion about unanswered questions before the Senate today. Um, because the number of unanswered questions from estimates and other questions on notice is astounding, and they have critical implications for transparency in government and particularly transparency about programs that are failing, that are having huge impacts on Australians. And today, Budget Day, we're talking about budget being, choice, being about choices, being about deciding who this government's supporting and who it isn't. And it's very clear from the silence on some issues that there are particular groups of people that are not being supported in this budget, not being supported by this government. I also have many unanswered questions in the portfolios that I'm responsible for the Greens, particularly those to the Minister for Social Security, the Department of Social Security, and um, to do with our income support system and to do with the absolutely punitive um, conditions that people living on income support are having to face when it comes to so-called mutual obligations, which are ridiculous hoops that they've got to jump through, ridiculous trials that people are put through just to be able to continue to receive payments that are below the poverty line. I've got one unanswered question, which was about payment suspensions. And these are people who are on income support, who are on job seeker, who are having their payments suspended. So I asked a question at last estimates about the number of payment suspensions by demographic group and program, the number of individuals subject to payment suspensions, the number of payment suspensions broken down by type of participation failure by program from, for each month from December 2020 to the present, the number of payment suspensions leading to a payment delay or cancellation, demerity, demerit and penalty counts by stage of the targeted compliance framework, and the number of payment on hold messages and conversion, to pay and conversion to payment suspensions. This is critical information because we've got people who are trying to survive, as I said, on below poverty line payments, who are absolutely struggling to put food on the table, to pay their medical bills, to pay their rent, to get their kids off to school and actually be able to put shoes on their feet. And there are people in these conditions who are having their payments suspended. Their payments suspended because they are not fulfilling their mutual obligations. These are the people who can least afford to suddenly have no income coming in. They're people that have, haven't got 
big bank accounts to fall back on. A lot of people that haven't got family support, they haven't got friends that they can suddenly borrow $1,000 from. They are people for whom, if the money's not coming in, they don't eat. It means for the, these people, if their payments are suspended, they go hungry. It means that they can't afford to pay their rent and are at risk of being evicted. It means that they can't go off to the chemist and pay for their medication that might be keeping critical medical conditions under control. It has desperate impacts on their mental health, let alone the impacts on their mental health of knowing that there is no money coming in. And I have spoken to many people who tell me, when they've been put in this situation, the damage it does to their mental health, the suicide ideation. These payment suspensions, they literally kill people. It is absolutely what happens. And yet the basic data of how many payment suspensions, to whom, why, that information is not forthcoming. I mean, I asked these questions on the 20th of March, seven weeks ago, and silence since then. I mean, what does this say about this government's regard for the people surviving on income support payments who are at the mercy of this punitive mutual obligation system. I mean, income support payments are meant to provide a much needed support, and payment suspensions have devastating impact on the people who rely on them. So, and in addition, payment suspensions can create a cycle of debt and poverty. If a recipient falls behind, they can't pay their bills, they can't pay their rent. They can then be forced to turn to credit cards or payday loans to make ends meet, which can lead to a cycle of debt that is incredibly hard to escape. Certainly does not put people in a good spot to be able to take on um, finding work. It makes it incredibly hard for people to retain financial stability. We've had considerable evidence pointed out, um, brought to us in the committee that I've been chairing, the Senate Community Affairs References Committee inquiry into the extent and nature of poverty in Australia. And I'd like to read some of the evidence which um, we featured in the interim report, which I am going to be tabling this afternoon, um, where Dr Elise Klein, um, in her evidence that she gave to the committee, um, which of course is already published, she drew attention to the impact of two features that impacted on people people's inability to live in, in poverty and the, the impact of poverty. One was the base rates of payments and the other was these mutual obligations. And she noted that two particular features are important to note. The low base rate of payment, which contributes to material deprivation, and the use of mutual obligations and conditionalities that stigmatise and disempower and can lead to the withholding of income. Together, they produce hostile conditions that are said to propel people into employment. However, this logic of deterrence completely overlooks that people cannot work in that they have a disability or illness, that there are not enough jobs, particularly in remote regions of the country, or that people receiving payments are already working, undertaking the critical work of unpaid care, which is essential for the economy of society. And Dr Klein noted that according to ACOS, of the people receiving unemployment payments, 40% have a disability, 47% are 45 years or older, 20% are from culturally, linguistically and diverse backgrounds, 10% are First Nations peoples, and 13% are raising a child alone. We see from these numbers the very real ableist, racist and gendered impacts of the government's policy approach to those its subjects to policy. And critically, instead of understanding the important care obligations people have, or the very re real situations that stop people from working, people are subjected to payments well below the poverty line. What's also deplorable is that children are punished through these policies. It is hard to think that this policy-induced poverty could be anything but state violence against our nation's children. And so then when we ask questions about mutual obligations, about these payment suspensions, we don't receive any answers. I also want to read from a document prepared by the Anti-Poverty Centre titled Compulsory Activities Do Not Address Employment Barriers. The Anti-Poverty Centre has collected the below stories from people in the welfare system in the days preceding our appearance at the Workforce Australia Select Committee briefing. 
They have been collected from a group of people who are traumatised by unemployment and the welfare system, who generously volunteered to participate in the protest to be held on the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty by sharing their stories as an act of resistance to the government-manufactured poverty machine that traps so many of us. This is not a cherry-picked sample of the stories we receive designed to skew the perception of what is happening. Every person to, who submitted to us is included below. Employment services purport to address unemployment and constantly fail to do so. You cannot separate unemployment from the person who is unemployed and their whole circumstances. The first story, which I want to share from this document, highlights the dire impacts of the threats of payment suspensions, this information that we were seeking from the government that we have got no information about. It is about Jared. Jared is on Job Seeker and currently has mutual obligations requirements. And he says, I've been a hard worker my entire adult life. I'm now 38. And a few years ago, I had an extremely bad series of incidents at my work, which ruined my physical and mental health and drove me to attempt suicide. And since then, I've been in decline. I've had to struggle with rising costs in living, rent, bills, medications and specialists, all on the insufficient funds provided by the government. Due to the renting crisis, all I have left after my payment is less than $60 for a fortnight and I'm somehow expected to live on this. Without any additional help from friends and family, I would have long since been homeless or dead. I've fought against daily thoughts of suicide, and my depression and anxiety has become dangerous because of this constant struggle and stress. I'm living day to day, and I often don't know how I'm going to get through the next week and pay for what I need to pay. I'm now disabled but not disabled enough to get on the disability support pension, and the entire process is a mammoth task with impossible hurdles. I'm constantly fighting against your system and getting medical exemptions where I can because I cannot work, but all of the systems in place tell me I can, that I have to, or I'll lose my payment, yet I can barely get out of bed each day. I have to get family and friends to help me do even the most basic of tasks. But sure, according to my provider, I can do many hours a week of work. Please, please, for everyone that is struggling, please raise the rate, end mutual obligations, end the privatisation of these systems. Make the disability support pension more accessible. I don't want to die. This is the impact that these punitive our punitive income support system is having on people. With these sorts of impacts, you would think that the least the government could do would be to be transparent about the data, to be transparent about the number of people that are being impacted by this punitive system. But we know why they don't want to be, because it would be overwhelming evidence that the system is not working, that mutual obligations are not working, that mutual obligations need to be abolished, that they are keeping people out of employment, that they are keeping people in poverty, that they are keeping people totally oppressed and totally feeling that they are just a tiny cog in an enormous machine. That's why this information, answering these questions, is critical. That's why it is critical that this government is transparent, because then it would be obvious that we need a different way. I want to share another story. This one was shared anonymously, and it highlights the challenges of meeting, meeting your so-called mutual obligations if you can't afford a phone or have limited technical abilities. I've been living in poverty on Centrelink payments. I'll study the New Start job seeker since leaving high school almost nine years back. I've never been able to afford housing that meets my needs as a disabled person with trauma from multiple domestic violence situations from various cohabitors. I can barely afford anywhere to live at all, actually, and the fact that I'm once again likely having to find a place to live with current prices within my greater area starting at 70 per cent of full job seeker payment is soul-crushing. I spend hundreds of dollars a month on medication and medical equipment I need to live on a day-to-day -day basis. I can't afford to see specialists for things like my ADHD or autism. I can barely afford basic foods. Almost any meat I buy is nearly off, any veg frozen, any snack half price or made from scratch. Almost all of my money goes directly to rent, bills, food, medical costs. 
The poultry leftovers aren't enough to cover keeping my car on the road. I have to ask for help pretty much every year. Almost every job I've ever applied for has specifically stated that applicants need a car, so people on JobSeeker are literally priced out of being able to work. New clothes are cast off from friends or from the clearance section at an already cheap store. I've never been able to buy my own phone, which by the way is needed just to access Centrelink payments, and an up-to-date phone with reasonable technical specs is a necessity for the vast majority of jobs I've worked or applied for. The current system of mutual obligations is unfair and punitive, and it often leads to people's payments being suspended through no fault of their own. And that's the critical information. That's why we were asking questions about the numbers of people, the suspensions by demographic group and program, the numbers of individuals subject to payment suspensions, the numbers broken down by type of participation, the numbers that lead to a payment delay or cancellation. This is important information to be in the public eye. This is important information so it is very clear that our system is broken, that we need to be doing more, that we need to be supporting people who are currently trapped in poverty. And by not providing this information, by not acting to abolish these punitive mutual obligations, the government is choosing to leave people in these circumstances. It is a political choice that's being made to be leaving people in abject poverty and feeling crushed under the punitive mutual obligations. We can do more. This government clearly in the budget tonight is not going to be taking action to be supporting people, but we as Greens are going to continue to fight for people until they have justice. Does any other senator wish to make a contribution on the motion moved by Senator Rustin? I intend to put the question. I put the question that the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. We now come to item eight. Take note of. Oh, sorry, Senator Rustin. Yes, um, I also had a question pursuant to Standing Order 45, um, asking the minister representing the Minister of Housing and Homelessness for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to questions on notice number 1520 and 1521, which I asked on the 20th of March. Um, relating to the impact of rental increases on rates of homelessness and extending funding for homelessness services. Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, I'm not certain that uh, advice, uh, the Minister's office were forewarned. Um, what I was hoping is if you could uh, enunciate which questions they were and we'll try and come back to you um, as soon as possible. Senator Rice. Mm, they were questions 1520 and 1521 and the Minister's office was forewarned yep, a good couple of hours ago. So, look, I move that the Senate take note of the, minister, the government's failure, the minister's failure, to provide an answer or an explanation to these questions. Yeah, the call. Um, I mean, I've asked for a question with these two questions in particular because they're very pertinent to the discussion that you know, the government put on the notice paper of discussing the housing, their housing affordability <laughs> future fund, their completely inadequate response to the housing crisis. Again, Actually, having information, having data relating to housing, relating to homelessness is critical. And it would be showing, and it does show, how inadequate the government's response to the housing crisis is. The questions that I asked were what modelling has the, gov has the department undertaken of the impact of rental increases on the rates of homelessness? And has the government taken a decision in relation to extending funding for homelessness services in relation to the social and community services equal numeration order? Even though I asked this, that second one, I'll start with the second one, because that question was asked on the 20th of March, 
Um, and I understand from media reports that, in fact, the government did make a decision, but they haven't bothered to answer my question on notice. It would have been very simple to answer my question on notice after media reports on the 23rd of March that they decided the government had decided to extend some more funding just for the next year in response to the fact that homelessness services are absolutely smashed with a huge increase of the number of people being homeless. The figures on census night that showed that we had 120,000 homeless Australians. So the government has taken a stopgap effort of providing some extra funding. Would have been nice to just have had my question on notice responded to, but no. It really shows just how little consideration this government has to the very legitimate questions of the senators in this place. It seems that they, just, they think that they're above having to answer basic questions. But these questions are critical. But the first question is, you know, what modelling has the government and has the department undertaken of the impact of rental increases on rates of homelessness? It's pretty critical to understand what the intersection between homelessness and rent increases. The housing crisis is affecting millions of people across the country, and this government is not taking the steps to fix it. Yet it claims to be taking issues of housing and homeless, homelessness serious. I mean, this question goes to the issue of rental affordability, something that you think that a government that was concerned about should be on top of. They should have good data in their fingertips. In fact, they should have done some modelling on it. You would think if this government was serious about tackling the housing crisis that that question should have been very quick, very easy to answer, to have come back to me and said, yep, here's the modelling we've done. We understand what impact the skyrocketing rents are having on homelessness and this is what we're doing about it. But no. And the fact that they haven't answered my question seven weeks on, it leads one to presume that you know, maybe they haven't actually done any modelling. Despite having a crisis in rents, skyrocketing rents, perhaps they actually haven't done any modelling. Perhaps they're not even really looking at this issue. This issue. They're happy to see rents skyrocket on one side, housing homelessness skyrocket on the other, but are not willing to put two and two together and to show that we need to be doing something about the skyrocketing rents to be tackling homelessness. I mean, they could model, for example, what having a rent freeze might do to rates of homelessness. The Greens have been, you know, we know that we are not going to be able to tackle the housing crisis and tackle skyrocketing rents unless we actually do something about those skyrocketing rents. A rent freeze. You know, our request has been for the government to put that on the, on the national cabinet agenda, which, yes, we'll give them credit for, after pressure from the Greens as part of our negotiations over their housing bill, it was on the national cabinet agenda. Now we want to actually see some action. We want to see some action from the state and territory governments led by the federal government to say we need a rent freeze. You'd think that they might have done some modelling on that. I want to just go to how significant this is and the impact of rents on homelessness. Anglicare Australia, they do an annual rental affordability snapshot. They've just recently released their 2023 report and they describe the results as alarming. This is despite in previous years things were looking pretty bleak. But in 2023, things are alarming. I want to quote from this report pretty extensively because it's critical to the debate that we're having about housing and why the government needs to get serious about it rather than pretending to do about something about it, rather than pretending that by investing, by gambling $10 billion on the stock market and only committing to 240 houses a year each year per state, pretending that that's going to do something about it. So the Anglicare 2023 rental affordability snapshot noted this year there were only 45,895 listings across the country, the lowest number in the history of the snapshot. Australia's vacancy rate remains at its lowest rate on record, at 0.8 of a percent. 
The market for affordable properties is fiercely competitive, with many households on low incomes unable to get a look into a rental. We heard reports about people queuing down the street for inspections, competing with dozens or even hundreds of other potential renters. Rents have never been less affordable. Average rents have risen by 11 per cent in the last year. And they continue saying our analysis shows that a mere four rentals four, were affordable for a single person receiving job seeker across Australia. None were affordable for someone on youth allowance, couples out of work, single parents relying on Centrelink and Australians receiving the disability support pension must all contend with a rental market where 0.2 per cent of rentals were affordable. A person on the age pension can only afford to rent 0.4 per cent of properties, and the percentage of affordable rentals for a person on the minimum wage has dropped to below 1 per cent for the first time. Such dire results have a real impact on people's lives. They show that large numbers of Australians will not be able to land a lease without getting into severe rental stress. This means that people can be forced into unfair choices like skipping meals, foregoing essentials or turning to payday loans to get by. As our rental crisis becomes a permanent reality, many people can expect to live in these conditions for, the, for most of their lives. Our results show that we're in the middle, midst of a crisis that can no longer be ignored by governments. There has never been a more critical time for governments across the country to step up and ensure that every Australian has a place to call home. And you'd think that a basic part of that stepping up would be to actually do the analysis so that you could then take action to do something about it. Actually do some modelling and actually let the Senate know what the results of that modelling are. But no. All we have is the government's current housing bill, that there's not a guaranteed dollar that's going to be spent on housing. And if the fund loses money like it did last year, there's no money that would be spent on that public housing. All they've done is had to commit to a minimum of 1,200 properties over the forward estimates per state. That's 240 a year. 240 houses in my home state of Victoria. When you've got a public housing waiting list that is decades long. And even if the fund comes into effect, you won't see a single house built before the next election. And at the end of the fund, the waiting list is going to be longer than it is now. I mean, we need a rent freeze now. We're seeing the biggest rent increases in 14 years, putting millions of Australians into severe rental stress. Families sleeping in their cars, workers unable to afford a home near where they work, people being effect evicted from their homes because they can't afford 20 per cent rent increases, and the government's just sitting on their hands when they've got the capacity to intervene and stop the worst of this crisis. And yet you ask them a question about what they're doing it and silence. In the past 12 months, rents in capital cities have grown seven times faster than wages. Just as the government coordinated a national response to the COVID-19 health crisis, the federal government should intervene to coordinate an emergency nationwide response to the housing crisis, and that includes a rent freeze. And at the very, very beginning of that process, actually do the work to see what impact that the skyrocketing rent increases are having on, on homelessness. I mean, under the Greens plan, National Cabinet would agree on national tenancy standards that would include a two-year emergency rent freeze. And this would be followed by ongoing rent caps and an end to no grounds evictions, minimum standards for rental properties and giving tenants the right to make minor improvements to their homes. And with more and more people renting long term, we desperately need legislative protections against unfair arbitrary evictions and skyrocketing rents. I mean, the other element of this is that rising house prices and rents means that people can't afford, they're paying so much of their income on rents that they can't afford the other basic necessities of life, such as food, healthcare and education. And especially true for, people, for low income earners and people on income support who are being forced to spend an absolutely huge proportion of their income on housing, which of course is then exacerbating homelessness. More and more people being forced into homelessness, a devastating impact on the people affected and a significant burden on the healthcare system and other support services. 
And the evidence that we have heard through the Senate inquiry into poverty was heartbreaking of in regional towns where every car park along the highway has got every night at least half a dozen cars with people living in their cars, of people bringing their kids up living in cars. That's what the reality of the housing crisis means. And yet this government can't even see its way clear to provide basic information to the Senate about what impact the rental uh, rents are having on, on, on homelessness. Um, I, I want to share some more stories here from people who have given evidence at the poverty inquiry about people living at the intersection of the housing and the cost of living crisis. There was a man, Brian, who said, my flatmate Morris and I have been living in public housing since 1997 and 2008. We've had two years of flooding from a neighbour above us, with 10 floodings in two years, with human faeces in what was coming down. Len said, the reason I've come here today is to say part of the reason I went on the streets was that I couldn't cope on the money. I couldn't cope on the money paying, pri paying private rental, going through what I was going through, the depression and whatever. But what brought me off the streets was permanent affordable housing. And that extra couple of hundred dollars that I was getting on the disability pension gave me a chance. And people who are living in poverty, they also face the issue of discrimination and stigmatisation when it comes to housing. They experience marginalisation and social exclusion, which makes it really difficult, even if there are more affordable houses, makes it really difficult for them secure, to secure adequate housing. For example, landlords can refuse to rent to them or may charge them high rents due to their income level, background or other factors. I mean, the difficulties faced in, by people living in, in poverty in finding adequate housing in Australia are really significant and really complex. And it's crucial that the government do the work that realises that we're in a housing crisis, commit to doing the work that's necessary I mean, we need, we have to have enough sufficient, affordable and secure housing options. We need to ensure access to essential services and facilities and combating discrimination and stigma. And only then will we be able to ensure that everyone has an access to a safe, secure and a dignified place to call home. And the Greens believe that everyone should be able to afford a home that meets their needs, whether they are renting or buying. I mean, we need to, do, to tackle these issues head on. I mean, homelessness is a complex issue and there's no one size f solution. But we know that there are a range of things that we can do, that governments can do, that there are choices being made now to not do these things, to invest in, we need to have much greater investment in affordable housing, much greater funding for emergency accommodation support services, providing access to legal advice and representation for renters facing eviction and establishing a national strategy to prevent and to end homelessness. I mean, we need to make sure that everyone has got access to safe and healthy homes. Everyone's got the right to live in a home that's free from harmful toxins, moulds and other environmental hazards. And we need to build a fairer, more sustainable and more inclusive society for all. These are the choices that could be being made by this government, that aren't being made by this government, that the Australian Greens will continue to campaign for. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. And I just wanted to provide some clarity to the Chamber and to Senator Rice, uh, re questions on notice 1520 and 1521. Uh, my understanding is they were transferred from social services to housing and homelessness, um, which is a standard administrative procedure. Uh, Minister Collins' office uh, has no knowledge of being notified, but will table answers tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to have a private conversation to see if we've missed something there, Senator Rice. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. There being no other senators to contribute on that motion, I'll put the motion um, that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move to take note. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Acting Deputy 
President, uh, and I move to take note of the answer given by Senator Wong, representing the Treasurer, to the question from Senator Smith relating to immigration and rental costs. <coughs> Acting Deputy President, this question goes specifically to the issues that the government has been saying that it intends to focus on in relation to the budget, which is ensuring it drives down inflation. But it then also goes to what the government has continuously been doing, is saying one thing and doing another. And it's a very common theme in um, pre my presentations and taking note in the chamber, I have, I'm sad to say. Uh, and we've just spent the last hour and 10 minutes debating about the fact that they talked about being an open and transparent government, uh, and they're more, more, more opaque than a brick. You, uh, it, the contradictions, the speaking out of both sides of their, their mouths, uh, is really quite outrageous. They come into the chamber and they make all the excuses under the sun. They deflect the problem to here. They blame the previous government. Uh, but in this context, on this particular issue, the government is actually in full control because they control the immigration rates. Now, Senator Wong, in her answer, quite reasonably mentioned the fact that the economy and the immigration system is recovering from COVID. Quite a reasonable point for Senator Wong to make. Quite a reasonable point for Senator Wong to make. But it's this government that is controlling the immigration rate. She can't blame the previous government. She can't blame anyone else. Has COVID made a contribution to the issues around immigration? Absolutely it did. Is there a process for recovery off the back of that? Of course there is. But there is also another part to what's occurring in the economy, and that's the shortage of housing that exists. Now, clearly, COVID's contributed to the way that people live, to the way that they um, share accommodation or not share accommodation, a whole range of those things. But the government is the, th is, is the entity. The government is the entity that's controlling immigration into this country. And we'll do so over the next couple of years. So for a record number of people to be coming into this country, 400 immigrants this year, 315,000 next year, a record 715,000 people over the next two years, a number and a figure they control. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. It's something that the government controls. And are there tensions in the economy around labour and things of that nature? Of course there are. But one of the themes of the previous taking note was about housing, housing affordability and the capacity for people to get a home. And it is a big deal. It is a big deal. But the government controls the immigration rate. And that was the point of Senator Smith's question in relation to where we are right now. Now, the government will want to deflect and talk about the housing bill. Hasn't built a house yet. Mr Albanese said in 2001 that it would build, um, what was it? Houses would start to come online in the first five years. You gave, gave a guarantee of the number of houses that will come online in the first five years. We're almost a year into government. They haven't built a house yet. Not one single foundation laid at this point in time. So not a good start in that sense. And if it was so, so urgent, why have we waited a year for the legislation? But the thing then comes back to the, the point of the budget and what the budget's supposed to be saying for the future and the issues facing Australians, which is inflation. And the Reserve Bank this month said Rent inflation is expected to continue to pick up over the next year or so and to add materially to inflation over the forecast period. Now, what's the Reserve Bank going to do if inflation keeps on going up? We just had a surprise 0.25 per cent, perhaps a shot across the government's bows. Perhaps a shot across the government's bows. Now the government is going to contribute, continue to contribute to rising inflation through immigration levels that are going to cause 
housing inflation, which would f feed directly into the numbers. So why, was the why is the Reserve Bank saying that? That's the point of Senator Smith's question. And the government controls the answers. They can't try to blame other people in relation to this because they are the government and they are in charge. Order. Senator Colbert, your time has expired. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. It's quite shameful, really. It's a pretty old playbook to be blaming immigrants and migrants for our housing crisis when you were in government for almost a decade. It's almost like you're reading One Nation's notes. It's almost like you're reading One Nation's Order. notes. But sure, let's Order. talk about— Order, Senator Stewart. Senator Colbeck is on his feet. Uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, that is a reflection on me and what I've said. It is a reflection on me and what I've said, um, and, and it is against standing orders yes. to suggest yes. that what I've just said is racist, is a reflection Order. on Order, me Senator Colbeck. and should Order. be withdrawn. Thank Order, Senator Colbeck. I, I don't think that was a reflection on you, but and I do recognise that we have quite a wide-ranging debate during take note. Um, but I will suggest to Senator Stewart that she be cognisant of the question and the response that we are taking note of, and ensure that her comments are relevant to that. The impact of immigration on housing. I feel like I've been directly relevant. So we have inherited an absolute mess of a situation in our nation. Those opposite had almost a decade to do something about it, and all of a sudden they care about putting roofs over people's heads. Shameful and embarrassing to be over there asking these questions of us. You're asking these questions of us. So not only are we doing things to respond the housing crisis and the rental crisis that we've got in this country, we're doing things and getting things done. We're making childcare cheaper. We're making medicines cheaper. We're delivering 180,000 fee-free TAFE places. We're funding a pay rise for aged care workers. We're delivering 20,000 new university places. We're providing up to $10,000 for each person who takes up a new energy apprenticeship. We've passed legislation for paid parental leave. We've established 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, specifically small, small business workers can access from the 1st of August this year. We're advancing a voice to parliament. We've got to work to repair our international relations. Foreign Minister Penny Wong has visited 32 countries since her appointment, five of them more than once. We are getting on with the job of governing this country as well as making a real and practical difference to the lives of every Australian. Almost every one of these measures that we've brought to this place has been voted against by those opposite. It's almost like they actually don't want a better future for all Australians. They want to take us back to the time when they were in power and did nothing. Right now, we have a bill before this chamber, the Housing Australia Future Fund bill, which will see a $10 billion investment. The fund will see, will support the government's commitment to deliver 30,000 new social and affordable homes in the next five years. Going directly to the supply issue in response to the demand. That's what we're doing. You did nothing. You did nothing. Not only shamefully are they going to vote against it, the Greens who cry about rental affordability and the housing crisis that we've got in this country, they're going to team up with the Libs and vote this down. Because the Greens and the opposition think that they know better than housing experts from across academia, industry and community, because they've given their views on this housing package. They've described it as transformative reform that will enable housing that will enable the housing needs of more Australians to be met. When asked if the Senate should move more quickly to support the package, the Community Housing Industry Association declared it was absolutely urgent. They also said, we have to put something in place right now. The Urban Development Institute said every day that passes is costing them more and more. The Property Council said the quicker all of these mechanisms are up and running, the better. The National Shelter described it as the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward for the past 
10 years. But they're all teaming up to vote it down because they don't think that this is a better future for Australians. An absolute shame and indictment on these. So when, at the end of today or tomorrow, whenever we go to a, a, a vote on this bill, I hope those opposite and the Greens can front up to the Australian people and tell them why they don't care about easing the cost of living pr pressures that are on the Australian people, why they don't care about helping ease the housing and rental crisis that we've got, and why they don't care about the $200 million that is going to go into the repair maintenance of remote housing for Indigenous Australians. I hope that you front up to the Australian people when you both team up, the Greens and the opposition, to vote this down. Shame on you. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Uh, Senator Antic. Um, thank you. And I also take note of the uh, uh, questions from Senator Smith regarding immigration and the rental crisis. And uh, despite what we've heard this afternoon, um, Australians are, are welcoming people, and they're people who, uh, despite what we hear from Labor and the Greens and their mates in the socialist media industrial complex, uh, are, are, uh, are nothing of the sort. They're, we're not racist people. We're welcoming people. And uh, immigration served this country well. Uh, I'm proof of that, of course. Uh, having been here as the son of uh, an immigrant family, we all we all know that. But let's be clear: uh, Australians are not stupid. They're not going to be sold a pup on this one. They understand that there's a time and a place for policy levers, uh, including increases, modest, we love the word modest in this place, modest increases uh, in, in immigration. Uh, but uh, th at this stage, for the Labor government to even be suggesting that something in the order of 715,000 uh, new immigrants over the next two years is even remotely reasonable uh, is, is, is a nonsense. And there are a myriad of reasons why that is. Uh, and they include, uh, but they're not limited to, the extraordinary pressure that that's going to place on our infrastructure and uh, on our housing system. Um, it just can't sustain this sort of target. And we really have. We heard that there are going to be, uh, you know, I think the number was 30,000 new homes built. Well, my maths is pretty poor, but 30,000 into 715,000 doesn't seem to add up. Now, where are these people going to go? We're just going to build tents. Uh, and have those uh, in the middle of cities. I mean, this is just doesn't, does not, does not stack up. And I know that the government likes to sell these decisions in a very simplistic sort of way. Don't worry about it. We've got it all under control. It's modest. Don't ask questions. We've got this under control. But the truth is here that this migration pitch is going to cause problems, which I don't think this government are even uh, aware of, and I think are ignoring uh, at their own. Peril, because the Australian people, as I said, are not are not silly, and they don't want this. They don't want it, particularly in places like Sydney and Melbourne, where the infrastructure is already heaving under the under the weight of large population uh, numbers. Um, they don't want this intake, and they don't want it at least until there are improvements and in investment made in infrastructure, uh, improvements to schooling, improvements to the road system, uh, as I said, to education, to hospitals and to houses. Uh, what Australians actually want are uh, cutting of red tape, lowering of taxes, bringing business back, uh, cutting power prices. Now, that's one we've heard uh, all the way through the last election, 275, was it? $275 in power bills that were going to drop. And what have we seen since then? Straight upwards, straight upwards, straight up. And we'd be looking, I guess, uh, at a different, you know, at a different proposition, if we were looking at the old, the old Labor Party. Remember the old Labor Party that used to stand for the, for the battlers, used to stand for, uh, you know, working people, used to take those sorts of things into account. Uh, and now we've got a Labor Party that's not only uh, bursting energy prices all over the country, sh shattering that myth of a $275 promise. Ninety, how many? Ninety-eight times, ninety-seven, ninety-six. My mistake. 96 times we were told that, bursting those energy prices. Um, we're seeing 
a government that's giving us huge higher inflationary pressures, which this is only going to contribute to, by the way, higher rents, uh, and all at the same time as now we're seeing an enormous increase in migration. What this shows is that this party, the government, the Australian Labor Party, is no longer the party of the battlers and the workers. It's the party of the inner city elites. Uh, and we can see that every single day, every time we, we look at these pictures, it's, and it's all getting very comfortable. Um, they uh, here are now turbocharging those cost of living pressures that we just talked about. That's what this will do. Make no mistake, this isn't gonna, this isn't gonna be some magic wand they can, they can wave. And if you look at uh, South Australia, if you look at the, um, the SQM research, which uh, details the changes in rental costs. Now, the South Australian housing market is relatively stable. Um, we've seen some, some increases recently, but uh, as at 4 May, uh, the, the increase in house rental prices is 11.4 per cent alone. Uh, the increase in units is 11.4 per cent, and that's, that's almost the good news. Because let's turn to New South Wales and Victoria, where we can see uh, order, something in the Senator order of a 20 per cent. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, you know, coming in today, uh, we've heard some really interesting contributions by Senators um, and particularly some interesting interjections on, on the topic of, uh, of housing and rental affordability. Uh, and you sort of think that um, somehow this government's been in power for the last decade, but yet those opposite who have been here on the Treasury benches for uh, a full decade wasted an opportunity to really address not just the rental crisis that we're currently facing, but also the housing market. Uh, and now trying to blame Labor for somehow their failures uh, over the last uh, over the last uh, nine years, uh, and really uh, last month the National um, Housing Finance and Investment Corporation State of the Nation's Housing Report uh, that was released showed and confirmed the need for all governments, all governments, industry, and the housing stakeholders to work together in order to improve the housing outcomes for Australians, particularly those uh, most vulnerable Australians. And it confirms that the proposed housing uh, future fund that the Labor government uh, is putting here in, in the parliament will in actual fact double the number of new social housing dwellings, adding to the stock each year for at least the five years from the year 2024, compared to the period between 2006 and 2021. And the minister has confirmed that the fund is an absolutely important policy that this government is determined to ensure pass this parliament, to work with those in this parliament to address the housing challenges that we are currently facing. Uh, the report is another reminder that too many Australians, too many Australians, particularly those who are vulnerable, are struggling to secure safe and affordable housing. No matter which part of the country, it is a crisis that we're all trying to address. The findings highlight the need to pass legislation that is currently uh, before this parliament and you know, before this Senate to establish the $10 billion fund that we have discussed time and time and time again. And just to remind senators, this fund will deliver 30,000 new social and affordable housing in the first five years. 30,000. That's something to sneeze at. It will create a secure and ongoing pipeline of funding for social and affordable housing over the long term. And the last time we saw a significant investment was the previous Labor government, the Rudd government, that did see a massive investment in housing. And again, it has taken a Labor government to put real money, real dollars on the table to address the housing crisis, particularly those in social housing. Not those opposite who claim to pretend to look after those who are most vulnerable in our society, as we've heard from some of the contributions today, but it's taken a Labor government, Albanese Labor government, to finally say we, enough is enough. We need to address the housing crisis. And we are trying to unlock that $575 million through the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to invest in social and affordable housing. So far, we've brought together state and territory governments and the Australian Local Government Association, investors and the construction sector together through the National Housing Accord. That sets a shared and ambitious an ambition to build one million new homes over five years 
from 2024 to help increase supply. And we recently committed $67 million to boost funding to states and territories over the next year to also help tackle homelessness and $91 million over the next three years to combat youth homeless through the ReConnect program. And in addition, we are, re uh, we are developing a 10-year national housing and homelessness plan. So it's important to put some of these facts on the table in terms of what this government is trying to do you know, in the first 12 months of being elected to government. Uh, but it was really heartening to see reports that the government has welcomed support of the Jackie Lambie uh, network. Um, and I do want to congratulate uh, Senators Lambie and Tyrrell for their support for this very important policy that the government uh, is trying to navigate through the Senate. Uh, the changes that were announced will obviously see many people benefit uh, from the fund. Uh, and it's important steps to make available a minimum of 1,200 dwellings uh, in each state or territory over the first five years from the establishment of this fund. It will also ensure that no state or territory uh, misses out on dwellings under the Albanese government. And that is something that should be repeated again. 1,200 dwellings. Order, Senator Shikoni, your time has expired. Senator Cadell. Being, uh, Deputy President, <coughs> again, we rise and we talk about this question about housing, rents, inflation and how it affects people and the effects of immigration on that and cost of living. And I note quite worried in one of these responses from uh, the government side that it is shameful for us to ask these questions. That's a quote from today. It is shameful for the opposition to ask questions about housing, supply and immigration. That is the contempt which they deal the Australian people and the opposition. That it is shameful to ask these questions. But here we are. We are hearing that this housing fund, this fabulous $10 billion future fund, will present 30,000 homes over five years. My maths, not real great at maths, think I've got to be. That's about 6,000 a year. That's where I'm going. If we look at the, the maths of that, is they lost, they would have lost last year 365 million on investing housing, and it's only the investment that would build the housing. So how you build 6,000 homes for minus 365 million is a miracle to me. This all answer, this all wonderful fund, doesn't do that. But with this government, best in show is not a policy maker. Best in show is not a minister. Best in show is a spin doctor. Because when we get here and we're talking about the growth of all these policies, what do you get when you have housing going through the roof, the cost of rental going through the roof, the cost of living going through the roof? The answer under this government is just add 715,000 more people. Now, I don't know where we come from, where we're going to build these 30,000 homes. Are they made out of Lego? Probably couldn't even afford that. But this policy comes from cloud cuckoo land. We have housing and rents going through the roof. So we'll just add 715,000 more people to the rental and housing accommodation. It doesn't make sense, but we're told this is what happens. And this is what we get time and time again with this government, is the absolute truth of what they're doing will fix everything. But will it? So many times we sit in here and we say, oh, this side voted against their energy relief package. But it got through. If energy prices aren't going down, it's not because of how we voted or they voted or whoever voted. It's because you haven't put the policies in to bring them down. You got your package through. It hasn't worked. Prices are still going up. And we're looking out there in the world. That's what people of Australia want to hear. We're here to make Australia better, not to fight with each other constantly. And so when I'm talking to Stephen at Newcastle Go-Kart Club on the weekend, running up there in a run, and poor Stephen and his son, Logan, great driver, real good talent. He's got a hell of an engine, does 107 in the straight. But when Stephen has to say that his son's racing career might have to go on hold because of housing costs going up, that's ignoring the entire potential future of life going away because housing's going up. Adding 715,000 people to the housing market does not bring that down. Building the infrastructure to service more housing at that number, when we're putting a freeze, we're going and reviewing all of the infrastructure pipeline, doesn't help that matter. And that's where the rubber's not meeting the road. 
There are some very, very good things being said by this government about what they want to do. The legislation does not meet the aspiration. When we were talking about cost of living, the cost of living pressures aren't being put on by the Kremlin. They're coming from the Kirribilli. They're not coming from Luhansk. They're coming from the Lodge. And to blame others is wrong. If there's only some night, some mechanism government could have to work out where they're going to spend money for the next 12 months and four years and get together with some policies and come together one night, maybe a Tuesday in May, and say, this is what we'll do to make things better, maybe call it a budget night. If that was sometime soon, they could have answers. But they don't. They have spin. Even this week, of all institutions, the ABC said numbers about debt and inflation is spin. The people of Australia don't want to know what happened five years ago. They want to know this week, this month, this year, can they pay their rents? Can they pay their electricity bills? Can they pay their grocery bills? And there might be cost of living benefits in this budget, but we're putting up their taxes as well. It is tax and spend, tax and spend, all putting inflationary pressures on this. There are no answers. There is just spin, and people deserve better. Uh, so the question is that the motion uh, moved by Senator Colbeck be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, acting Deputy, Pre Deputy President, I rise to take note of uh, responses to Senator Shoebridge's questions to Senator Wong. Five years ago, or nearly five years ago, the only two members of parliament who would meet with Julian Assange's father, John Shipton, were myself and the member for Clark, Andrew Wilkie, in the other place. And John came to see us to see what we could do in here to help his son, Julian Assange, who was at that time in the Ecuadorian embassy and desperately seeking uh, to get out and his freedom. Not long after that, he was incarcerated in a maximum security prison, Belmarsh Prison. And it's been a very long road to try and get any senior politician in this parliament to make any statement in support of Julian Assange. So I welcome Senator Wong again today, uh, reiterating what the Prime Minister said just last week, that they see the ongoing incarceration of Julian Assange as surfing no purpose, and that enough is enough. Diplomatically saying Julian Assange should be freed. It's taken a long road to get to this point. And I welcome the fact that whether it's uh, Stephen Smith, our Consul General in the UK, visiting Mr Assange, or Mr Rudd in the US raising this with his counterpart, uh, Senator Wong telling us today that they're raising the freeing of Julian Assange at every level of government with the US administration. I welcome that too, and I know uh, millions of Australians will as well. But the next question, Acting Deputy President, that we want answered is what more can you do? What more can this government do? And at what point will the gross abuse of power, the injustice, the political persecution of Julian Assange, a Walkley Award winning journalist, an Australian citizen, at what point will this affect our relationship with our close friends and allies, the United States? That's what we would like an answer to. And perhaps a, an easy place for Senator Wong to start, to show us that she has her heart in this and that uh, she believes in what she's saying, is perhaps put out a simple tweet saying what she said in the Senate today. Because I note she has rightly, and I say rightly, pointed out on Twitter in recent months the political persecution of two other journalists, Wall Street journalist, American, Evan Gershkovich, being held by the Russians on espionage charges, the same charges that Julian Assange is being persecuted on by the US administration. She's also raised the plight of political prisoner Cheng Li, the Australian news anchor for China Global Television, 
who has also been incarcerated in China. And I thank the Foreign Minister for doing that. But could we have a tweet, at least just one tweet, for the freeing of Julian Assange? A small step to show that this government is serious. She is the Foreign Minister. She's happy to tweet about other political prisoners, but not about Julian Assange. And the reason I raise the timing of this is because the US President will be here in just a few weeks' time, on the 24th of October for the Quad meetings, which Australia is sponsoring in the Sydney Opera House. And I urge the US administration, and I know a lot of Australians, in fact people all around the world agree with me, I urge them to bring this political persecution to a resolution by the time that President Biden comes to Australia. And if we don't get that good news from the Prime Minister when he's standing next to President Biden or delivered in some other way, I call on Australians who care about press freedoms, who care about ending the ongoing political persecution of Julian Assange, to come out and protest when President Biden is here in Australia. Make your voices heard. Make them heard to your members of parliament. And lastly, I would actually like to thank uh, Senator Shoebridge, my colleague, uh, and all the MPs, all 48 of them, who recently signed a joint statement to see the freeing of Julian Assange. And we did a press conference on that here in Australia today. I thank them because we've come a long way from two people five years ago seeking the freedom thank of you, Julian Senator, Assange. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Uh, so the question is that the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? No? Okay. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No. So there's no leave of absences. Okay. So I'm going to call Senator Chisholm. Uh, I move that general business order of the day number 37, Productivity Commission Amendment Electricity Reporting Bill 2023, be considered on Wednesday 10th of May 2023 at the time for private senators' bills. So the question is that the motion is just moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, leave of absences. Senator Chisholm. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Billick and Dodson from 9 to 11 May 2023 for per personal reasons and Senator Farrell for 11 May 2023 on account of ministerial business. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator O'Sullivan. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator O'Sullivan. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Hume for today for parliamentary business. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator O'Sullivan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I think that takes care of... Um, Senators leave. So, and I believe we have some committee extensions. I call the clerk. President, committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 of today's order of business. Thank you. Move to the condolence motion. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 28th of March 2023 of the Honourable John Charles Kieran A.O., a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of MacArthur from 1972 to 75 and Werriwa from 1978 to 1993. 
I call the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries, Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. I move that the Senate record its sorrow at the death on the 29th of March 2023 of the Honourable John Charles Kerrin AO, former Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, Treasurer and Minister for Trade and Overseas Development, and former member for MacArthur and Werriwa, places it on record its gratitude of his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. President, I rise on behalf of the government to express our condolences following the passing of a great servant of the Australian Lab Labor Party and of the nation, the Honourable John Charles Kerrin Ao, former minister and member of the House of Representatives at the age of 85. As I begin, I wish to convey the government's condolences to his family and many friends. I had the opportunity today to meet again with John's beloved wife, June Verrier, and some of John's former staff, and we recounted many happy memories of their time living together, loving together and working together. I also thank the Leader of the Government in the Senate for the opportunity to deliver the speech on behalf of the Government on this condolence motion. As the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, I thought it was appropriate to pay tribute to one of my most significant predecessors in this portfolio, someone that I and many others regard as the best agriculture minister Australia has ever had. John Karen, John Karen combined experience on the land with serious economic credentials and a practical, pragmatic approach to politics. It was a combination that saw him serve as Minister for Primary Industries for almost the entirety of the Hawke government in cabinets amongst the best this country has ever seen. He thought the two roles were not that far apart, saying, politics is like farming. No one is forced to do it, but someone has to. In an outstanding period of economic renewal and reform for Australia, with Labor in government from 1983 to 1996, John Kerrin played an important role across a number of key portfolios for the first decade of those governments, but particularly in modernising and strengthening the nation's primary industries. His contribution was not limited to his time in office, and he displayed a deep commitment and interest not just in agriculture but to education and learning throughout his life. He was a truly great Australian. John Kerrin was born in the southern highlands of New South Wales in Barrow in 1937. Like my own father and many rural working class kids of that era, John left school aged 15 to help on the family farm and to earn a living to support his family. His first occupations, as listed in his official parliamentary biography, were axeman, a job he had uh, from the age of 15 and later bricksetter. From 1961 until 1971, he described himself as a farmer and businessman. And it was during this time that John achieved the first of his tertiary qualifications, a Bachelor of Arts from the University of New England, from which he graduated in 1967. He would later obtain a Bachelor of Economics from the Australian National University in 1977 and be further awarded honorary doctorates from the University of New England, the University of Western Sydney and the University of Tasmania. Having been energised in opposition to the Vietnam War and, and personal passion for economics and the environment, he was active in local labour branches throughout the 1960s and into the 1970s, serving as an office bearer in Mittagong, Southern Highlands, Wallandilly and MacArthur branches and electorate councils. This led to him taking on Labor pre-selection and succeeding in becoming a candidate for public office. John Kerrin was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1972, representing the division of MacArthur, which at that time incorporated those areas of the Southern Highlands with which he was closely connected. This was, of course, a momentous election for Labor coinciding with the party's return to office under Prime Minister Gough Whitlam for the first time since 1949. In John's first speech to Parliament, he reflected that whilst politics is about the articulation of many, often parochial demands and the resolution of conflicting interests, he identified the need to prioritise the national interest and create institutions that could survive and adapt to change. This was significant, far-sighted thinking that would characterise his approach throughout the next two decades. He also reflected on changing attitudes in society, 
particularly amongst younger voters, reflected in a confident individualism based on mutual concern for others and wider issues in determining quality of life, as well as awareness of science and technology. It was a reflection that would not be misplaced today. Under the leadership of Gough Whitlam, government was quite a ride, and it must have been an exhilarating experience for a freshly minted backbencher. However, the highs and lows of the Whitlam government would come to have an impact on John Kerrin personally, as he lost his seat when the government was defeated in December 1975, maintaining MacArthur's then status as a bellwether seat. Fortunately, a second opportunity arose in a most fortuitous way. When Gough Whitlam resigned his place as a member of parliament after leading the party to a further defeat at the 1977 election, John Kerrin was successful in the ensuing by-election. He returned to the House of Representatives in 1978 as the member for Werriwa. During his time out of parliament, he completed his second university degree whilst working as an economist in the Bureau of Agricultural Economics. After the 1980 election, he was appointed by Bill Hayden as the opposition spokesperson on primary industry. He would hold this position for the remainder of the parliamentary term. John Kerrin brought great personal experience to this role as an orchardist and chicken farmer. He also brought great scepticism of the political management of farming interests. In particular, he noted how it was the case when Labor had come to government in 1972 that the specialist party that characterises itself as looking after regional interests spent a quarter of a century in power but immediately cried for immediate action in almost every rural field. It reinforced his judgment that, as with so many policy areas, Australia was being let down by short-term, short-sighted thinking, and he embarked on building a policy agenda that took the opposite approach. When the Hawke government was elected in 1983, John Kerrin took a seat at the Cabinet table as Minister for Primary Industry. This portfolio would later to be expanded to primary industries and energy, in which he would continue to serve until 1991. Like so many ministers of that government, John Kerrin embarked on a big reform program. He confronted big challenges, but did so, as the current Prime Minister has reflected, with experience, care, pragmatism, consultation and an unbreakable sense of humour, even if his then Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, had a, quote, staggering incapacity to understand his jokes. Through empathy and hard work, John Kerrin gained much respect, and some of the major decisions that he took or contributed to included the removal of tariffs from imported agricultural products, boosting farm productivity and the establishment of research and development corporations. These reforms have stood the test of time and created the export-oriented, research-driven agriculture sector that has benefited ever since. These reforms were not without controversy or pain, as the protectionist systems that had been in place for most of the 20th century, such as the reserve price for wool and the centralised wheat marketing board, were overhauled. It was necessary for new thinking and approaches in agricultural policy to match the changes in international economic conditions that were leaving Australia increasingly uncompetitive and isolated. What was required of him over those eight years suited his passion for policy too. He partnered with his colleagues, particularly former Senator John Button, to provide opportunities for renewal, replenishment and outward-looking approaches for Australian business and industry. He also recognised that policy changes in agriculture and in the bush generally required different policy answers than those being confronted in the cities, even where they stemmed from common core issues. Accordingly, he sought to address national problems as they manifested themselves in regional areas in appropriate ways, drawing on the skills of people living in the regions affected. In doing so, he drew upon the valuable expertise within his departments and its associated agencies in economics and science, too often undervalued. He also made sure that social services were available in provincial areas, in the knowledge that the Bush needed a voice in the Cabinet room to deliver the social dividend of economic reform to those who needed additional support wherever they were located. John Kerrin only left the primary industries portfolio in what turned out to be the last months of the Hawke government, when the Prime Minister called upon him to serve as Treasurer. It was not a role he relished, and following the ascension of Paul Keating to the nation's highest political office in December 1991, John briefly took on ministerial responsibility for transport and communications. He was then appointed Minister for Trade and Overseas Development, a role he held until the 1993 election. 
In this, he enjoyed the opportunity to represent Australia on the overseas stage and apply his preference for an intellectual approach to policy formulation in a new way alongside Foreign Minister Gareth Evans. There was also great synergy with his previous role in primary industries, especially given his part when in that portfolio in, monu when in, that portfolio in monumental Labor government initiatives such as the establishment of the Cairns Group. John Kerrin did not return to the ministry following Labor's win in the 1993 election and retired as a member of parliament at the end of that year. However, his service to the country did not end when he left politics. In many ways, it just diversified as he committed himself to so many boards and institutions that it is impossible to name them all. His passion and knowledge of agriculture naturally dominated many of his appointments, particularly through the leadership positions he took up in the 1990s and 2000s in the sector. Also shining through was his deep commitment to education, serving as chair of the Australian National University's Crawford Fund Board, as deputy chancellor of the University of Western Sydney and as a member of the Whitlam Institute. He also made his mark through contributions to publications on the Whitlam and Hawke governments. He remained active in the Australian Labor Party as a local party member here in the Australian Capital Territory. His community involvement extended to other roles in organisations, including the Bush Capital Club and the Council of Birds Australia. This was fitting for a man who enjoyed reading and thinking about birds and bushwalking. One of those who recognised the breadth of John Kerrin's impact was Professor Andrew Campbell, who is the Chief Executive of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research in Senator Wong's portfolio. Mr. Professor Campbell noted how, post-politics, John Kerrin chaired countless boards and shared generously his valuable time, sharp insights, dry humour and peerless networks. His contribution to the nation was formally recognised in the Order of Australia twice first through his appointment as a member in 2001 for service to the Australian Parliament, particularly in the area of government policy and legislative reform relating to primary industry and trade, and again in 2018 as an officer for distinguished service to primary industry through roles in agricultural research administration to the minerals and natural resources sector and to science industry linkages and policy. As John Kerrin's successor as a Labor Minister in the Agriculture Portfolio, I'd also just to briefly like to add my own personal reflections about his life and legacy and his private engagement with me. He was always generous with his advice, and I know this applied not just to me but to other colleagues as well, some of whom we'll hear from today. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to benefit from his wisdom during my time as Agriculture, Agriculture Minister. John was a big influencer of my thinking as I took on the role that he once held. As I remarked at the time of his passing, I will miss his early morning and late night emails full of advice. As was mentioned by another Labor legend of the time, Barry Jones, at John's state funeral, since becoming Agriculture Minister, I've been surprised by how often farm leaders have told me that Labor ministers often make the best agriculture ministers. Free of vested interests, solely focused on doing what's right for farmers, farm workers and for the whole agriculture supply chain. And I know that when they say that, they are thinking of John Kerrin. His reform legacy lives on in Australian agriculture, and he rightly deserves the title of Australia's best agriculture minister. I didn't agree with John on everything, though, and I was alarmed to read the following passage in his valedictory speech to the House of Representatives, and I quote, I have always drawn the line at dealing with the Senate. It is still a great mystery to me. I met some new ALP senators the other day, and I did not know who they were. I once went on a trip with former clerk of the Senate, Jim Odgers, to London, and I didn't think he was too bad, but I must say that I have great concerns about the Senate Procedure Office. It is institutional anarchy with an Irish twist. I'm sure things have changed. This goes to show that whilst John Kerrin was not wise in everything he said, he was at least a man of principle, and he did appreciate our committee system here in the Senate. John Kerrin passed away in March 2023. When the Prime Minister reflected on his life and legacy, he described John Kerrin's time as Primary Industries Minister as the greatest and most profound mark that he left. He's proof that it's possible to go from chicken plucker to cabinet minister. And the most remarkable thing about John Kerrin is that he never lost his passion for agriculture, learning and making a contribution. The government again expresses our condolences following the passing of the Honourable John Kerrin, and we again convey our sympathies to his family, including his wife, June, his daughter Didi, Heidi and those who knew him well. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks very much, uh, President. President, I rise to, uh, to echo the remarks of uh, Minister Watt in relation to the life of John <laughs> Charles Kerrin Ao and to speak on this condolence motion. From the tributes, including the one we've just heard, paid following the death of John Kerrin in March of this year at the age of 85, it is clear that he is most firmly identified with and respected for his time at the helm of the primary <coughs> industries portfolio, a portfolio that John Kerrin held and clearly loved throughout the first eight years of the Hawke government. When looking back at political events, it's obvious that John Kerrin saw many in his career and that his career was punctuated by those events that can impact upon many of us in political life. And of course, we can only speculate what might have been if some of those events had been different. Indeed, by all accounts, it would seem reasonable, given John Kerrin's command of the primary industry's portfolio and the respect he earned for his stewardship of that portfolio across the political and industry spectrum, to think and suggest that if not for the Keating Hawke leadership battles, John Kerrin may well have remained primary industries minister throughout the whole period of that Labor government. Such was his command of the portfolio and the respect he earned through it. John Kerrin had, he said of himself, a tough farming background. Tough it was and tough but well and truly capable it made him. Raised on a struggling farm near Mittagong in the New South Wales Southern Highlands, John Kerrin left school at 15 to join his father in cutting wood, axe man, as Senator Watt has said, to help the family make ends meet. Something he did for seven years, then later setting bricks in a kiln and helping on his parents' chicken farm and orchard. These were all experiences amongst the effects of which he saw and felt a tomato glut, chicken disease and apple rot, the type of challenges, indeed, that farmers feel and felt. Whilst doing this, though, John Kerrin set himself ambition and goals, studying hard, studying by correspondence. And so, from cutting his teeth on the family farm, John was to go on and qualify as an economist and cut his teeth critically at the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics, as it's now known, to this day one of our nation's foremost agencies of economic analysis. His entry into politics came through the seat of MacArthur in the December 1972 election, which saw Gough Whitlam take the reins of government. Events, though, this time the dismissal and the crises surrounding the Whitlam government, saw him lose his seat at the 1975 election that swept the Whitlam government from office. For many, such a loss could have been the end of a political career, and had it been the case, it would have been to Australia's loss and to our farming sector's loss if John Kerrin had never returned to the parliament. However, it was another event, Whitlam's retirement from the parliament just a few years later in 1978 from the seat of Werriwa that gave John Kerrin a vehicle to return to Canberra. And so when Bob Hawke won office in 1983, John Kerrin was to become Australia's Minister for Primary Industries, building on his three years as a shadow minister. There have always been, and particularly at that time, were some tensions between a Labor government and farmers who had become more organised through the formation of the National Farmers' Federation. John Kerrin himself was acutely aware of this tension. He acknowledged that, quote, Labor, for the most part, had no profile and following in the bush. As minister, he had to confront 40,000 farmers on the steps of the Parliament House and in a separate protest, 25 tonnes of wheat being dumped on the steps of Parliament House. As the natural tension escalated over the effect of taxes and charges on farming communities and perceived lack of government action. For many primary industries ministers, such concerns from within the farming sector would have overwhelmed their capacity to achieve reform, to build respect or to get things done. But with a reputation for working hard and being forensic in his quest for policy based on hard facts, on evidence, John Kerrin was able to succeed and indeed expand his portfolio, having energy added to the load. As Primary Industries Minister, John Kerrin is renowned for focusing on policies aimed in particular at lifting farm productivity. He brought a genuine focus 
true leadership to issues around agricultural research and development, most notably with the passing of the Primary Industries and in Energy Research and Development Act of 1989. The efforts he brought, the funding it delivered, the reforms it ultimately helped to achieve have left a lasting legacy of which John Kerrin and today his family should be very proud. Australia's farmers are more productive, our nation is more prosperous and our food supply more secure thanks to the leadership of John Kerrin, particularly in the areas of agricultural productivity. But as is so often the case in political life, his career and its hitherto strong focus and trajectory based on primary industries was to be upset by Labor's leadership tensions at the time. Surprising many, John Kerrin became Treasurer when Paul Keating's first failed challenge against Bob Hawke saw Keating then move to the backbench. In retrospect, it was a poison chalice. It was just two months out from a federal budget, a budget delivered whilst Australia was still in the recession we had to have. Bob Hawke admitted how big a task he had handed John Kerrin in the shadow of Paul Keating as Treasurer when he said that no one had been, quote, thrown into that position under such pressure. John Kerrin, of course, just got about the job. He was no grandstander. Indeed, when the government was announcing a 1% cut, cut in interest rates, his approach was one of simply issuing a statement. No press conference, no bells, no whistles. Perhaps that approach was ill-suited to the Treasury role compared with the detailed approach he had become used to in the primary industries portfolio. John Kerrin was moved from that role to Treasury and Communications, and then, following Keating's successful second challenge, he went on to serve as Minister for Trade and Overseas Development. All of these senior and important portfolios reflecting the high regard in which John Kerrin was held by his leaders, by his party and government, but indeed by the stakeholders who had to work with him. And in the case of his service as Trade Minister, it was an opportunity to apply synergies to build on his achievements in agriculture, particularly through championing of the Keynes Group work, as Senator Watt acknowledged. Paul Keating, on the back of his 1993 win and drive for a fresh approach, ultimately saw John Kerrin end his time as a minister. And at that year, John called time on his political career. In his obituary in the SMH, Malcolm Brown wrote that John Kerrin was once touted as a future Labor leader. But while he lacked the showmanship and flamboyance of some of his contemporaries, nobody dismissed him as anything other than a solid, reliable servant of the nation. And although in 1993 he left the parliament and politics, it was far from calling time on his public service. John Kerrin was to go on and provide service to many organisations, including the Australian Meat and Livestock Corporation, the CSIRO, the Poultry Cooperative Research Centre, the Australian Weed Research Centre, the Cooperative Research Centre for Tropical Savannah Management. He was a board member and chair of the Crawford Fund and, indeed, outside of immediate primary industries or agriculture policy, he also served UNICEF Australia recognising also the reach uh, that food security has right around the world. Appropriately, in 2018, John Kerrin was appointed as an, order of the, as an officer of the Order of Australia for his distinguished service to primary industry through roles in agricultural research administration, to the minerals and natural resources sector and to science, industry, linkages and policy. Whilst President and I had the pleasure of meeting John Kerrin only a handful of times, it was always clear that his decency, his thoughtfulness, his commitment to evidence-based policy and to Australia's best interests shone through time and time again. Today, as a Senate, we acknowledge and thank him for his service. We thank his family for sharing him with the nation and we pay our respects to his wife, June, and daughter, Heidi. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. And I rise on behalf of the Nationals and also as a former Agriculture Minister for Australia, uh, the first female to do so, to associate us and myself with the uh, speeches 
both of the government and indeed the fine words of Senator Birmingham uh, on this condolence motion on the death of the Hon. John Charles Kerrin AO. John was a forester, a bricksetter, poultry farmer, an academic, an accomplished politician and, importantly, a fierce advocate for Australian agriculture. In short, John Kerrin was an old-style Labor man. His passing has no doubt left a profound void in the lives of all those who knew him, and we are all here to offer our condolences and to support his family and friends. Like many of that generation, he was obliged to leave school at 15 to help his father around the chicken farm and spent most days cutting wood for a living. This rural upbringing ingrained in him the value of hard work and the lived experience of the very real struggles of rural and regional Australians. After the giants who had previously served as Agriculture Minister, such as Black Jack McEwen and Peter Nixon uh, from the Victorian National Party, Kerrin was one of Australia's best regarded agriculture ministers. He was fortunate to serve for a long period in the job, which enabled him to enact lasting reform measures, particularly with commodity groups. And that is a rare privilege uh, for ministers in our system today. And indeed, Peter Nixon uh, has actually asked me uh, to pass on some, to the Senate some of his reflections on the passing of Kerrin. Uh, he says, when I retired, John Kerrin succeeded me as Minister for Primary Industry. John was quite pragmatic and spoke to me about the issues he faced. He was level-headed, intelligent and was devoted to his work. And I think those characteristics that Peter Nixon tells us about are also reflected in John's entire work. As the member for Werriwa, he was successor to Gough Whitlam and the predecessor of Mark Latham, two significant leaders of the Labor Party. But most importantly, John served as the Minister for Primary Industries and Energies from 1983 to 1991 and made significant and lasting policy decisions that helped reshape our country's agriculture industry, industry and forever change our national economy. In his memoirs, The Way I Saw It and The Way It Was, Kerrin had some wonderful insights into the job of being agriculture minister. And I quote, in agricultural policy making, a decision by private industry not to invest or resist change can be very powerful. He also said he was opposed to the whatever it takes approach to politics in New South Wales Labor right, going to, on to say, I always thought the best thoroughly thought through policies were the best politics. I do not believe in playing politics to gain advantage or confusing the public by saying one thing and doing another. And he also said, nor do I believe in the prattling of inane slogans. I think, as the Anglican ministers say, there's something in that for all of us. During his time as Minister for Primary Industry, John was instrumental in driving significant reforms, particular in relation to uh, the sugar and wheat industries. And Senator Birmingham uh, told us about how Australian wheat growers felt about some of those reforms at the time. He also played a key role in deregulation of that industry, and that had a major impact on the sector and paved the way for increased competition and efficiency. He was also a strong advocate of the interests of Australian farmers in international trade negotiations, as Senator Birmingham outlined, uh, particularly in relation to the Uruguay round of uh, multilateral trade negotiations. And he worked tirelessly to ensure that the interests of Australian farmers were protected and that they had access to new and emerging markets. And I also want to add here, as it is Budget Day, to mention this quote from him as Minister for Primary Industries, and I quote the late, great John Kerrin on Budget Day. Quite frankly, always the best thing that any government can do for the whole farm sector is in the macroeconomic policy area, getting interest rates down and inflation rates down. I heartily agree and I hope uh, that Whilst I know the Finance Minister and the Treasurer are in the budget lockup right now, that the whip will do the right thing and maybe push, a, push that quote under the door 
uh, so that they can reflect that and pass that on. Very good advice uh, from John Kerrin. He also oversaw significant investments in research and development in the agricultural sector. One of his standout achievements includes being the architect of our modern agricultural research and development system by establishing the research and development corporations in commodity groups far and wide, a system where farmers contribute to research that's going to help them become more efficient and productive, uh, and that we as taxpayers also uh, participate in that system and contribute to making the primary production system more efficient for farmers. This partnership between taxpayers and the farming sector has driven innovation and progress across agricultural commodities in Australia to the point where overall agricultural sector is now worth $90 billion in 2022. Karen also recognised that innovation was key to driving growth and productivity in the sector and worked to ensure that funding was available to support research into new technologies and practices. And that included areas such as plant breeding, soil conservation and animal health. To his wife June and daughter Heidi and the rest of John's family, we offer our deepest sympathies. And we thank you for his years of service to our nation and to his unwavering dedication to Australian agriculture. Vale, John Kerrin. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator Ayres. Thank you, um, uh, President. I, um, it, is, it is completely appropriate that the Senate pauses for a period to reflect on the life and service of uh, John Kerrin. Um, as, and I do want to thank uh, the speakers thus far, the Minister for Agriculture, the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Nationals in the Senate for their, for their uh, thoughtful contributions. Uh, and it does reflect, I think, that John was widely regarded uh, as not only a remarkable, perhaps we might argue about whether he was the best, but a remarkable contributor uh, in agriculture and across a range of policy areas. And he was loved uh, across the parliament, particularly of course in the Australian Labor Party, for the seriousness of his convictions and the way that he approached the task uh, of politics. Um, as, uh, as Senator Watts said in his contribution, uh, a number of us have benefited from uh, engaging with John uh, over the years, and I'm one of those people. Uh, he was very generous uh, for a bloke who was um, who was very busy in his retirement. Uh, he was very generous with his time uh, and his thoughtful approach to the challenges that faced uh, modern Labor uh, in this parliament and the parliaments before it. And I'm very grateful. You know, as somebody who um, came from a background where my family uh, valued uh, farming and agricultural science and education, uh, you know, John Kerrin epitomised uh, those values and those. Uh, those drives in a way that is very uncommon uh, in modern politics. Uh, I don't intend to uh, traverse all of the details of John's uh, history here and in later life that's been done very well so far, but I want to make a couple of reflections. His intellect and his capacity to bring a sort of sharp, well-read policy brain to the problems of the era that he was engaged in had their foundations in his own drive for self-improvement. Uh, he didn't do undergraduate study at university on a university campus. He did it at night time, studying in night school to finish, uh, to finish his uh, high school, uh, uh, studying by correspondence to complete uh, uh, his university education. And it was all done after the farm work was done. He worked through the night. Uh, his brother gave a very compelling account of the hard work and the commitment that, that was required for John uh, to get the education that he got. And that drive for self-improvement continued uh, all of the way through his life. He's left a legacy of reform uh, in agriculture. He's, he certainly was a person who could draw the relationship between agriculture policy trade policy and industry policy, and he knew uh, that, uh, that that reform agenda 
uh, those issues like no um, other Australian politician. Uh, he was deeply sceptical uh, of the Australian Senate, uh, and it would uh, come as no surprise to him, of course, that, his, uh, that our condolence motion for him was delayed by a further hour and 40 minutes, I think, because of some debates and some, uh, some playing up in the Senate. He would have found that irony pretty <coughs> rewarding. His book, uh, 450,000 words uh, on, uh, on agricultural policy and, and being an agriculture minister. It's available in the parliamentary library. It's absolutely worth grabbing. It is um, a showstopper, possibly a doorstopper, but it is a real page turner uh, and it is really worth anybody interested in agricultural politics, research and development, science, <coughs> industry policy. Uh, thinking about uh, uh, your role as a member of parliament or senator, it's absolutely worth uh, grabbing that book. His contribution after his retirement uh, has been immense. Uh, I wanted to express on behalf of uh, all of my colleagues, particularly from New South Wales, how well loved uh, John was, how deeply respected he was. His state funeral was a remarkable occasion uh, in the old parliament house. Uh, and pass on uh, my respects and condolences to his remarkable family, Valley. Uh, thank you, Senator Ayres. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify their assent to the motion. Thank you, Senators. The motion is carried. <coughs> we'll now move to item 12. I understand there's no formal business, but there is a matter of public importance. We'll just wait and swap the chair over with your indulgence. Senator Roberts has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Uh, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call on Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, one Nation has today advanced a matter of public importance, calling for a royal commission into Australia's COVID response. The rush of real science in the last few months makes it clear COVID-19 has been a tragic and criminal exercise in stakeholder government. The stakeholders milk COVID for their own personal and corporate benefit at the expense of everyday Australians, destroying confidence in their health system. For corporations, the objective was profit in the sale of tests, PPE and fake vaccines that got fake deadly vaccines that government and private mandates maximised. Profit accrued from fast-track TGA approvals that saved pharmaceutical companies billions of dollars and caused a new cost in human suffering, health, human suffering, death and injury. Nothing could illustrate this point more than the heartbreaking testimony last week of Deborah Hamilton at the Senate inquiry into Senator Hanson's bill to ban COVID injection mandates. Deborah lost her daughter immediately after her COVID injections, which her employer mandated to keep her job. Her employer and their parent company had Vanguard Investment Fund as a leading shareholder in Financia. Vanguard is the leading corporate shareholder in Pfizer. Vanguard mandated back vaccines they make a profit from. When predatory billionaires and their trillion dollar investment funds murder a beautiful 22-year-old vibrant Australian in an unquenchable thirst for profit, it shows corporate ownership and influence has gone too far. For media, the payoff was advertising accepted in return for government's aggressive propaganda level promotion of the COVID narrative. Mes messaging broadcast to citizens who were captive in their own homes. Academics took their research grants and delivered the outcome they were asked to deliver. So much science in the COVID period was delivered with a high degree of confidence. And yet in recent months, much of the science underpinning our COVID response has been proven to be dodgy, deceitful and dangerous, inhumanly so. Bureaucrats saw the opportunity to spread their power in a way previously never allowed. Bureaucrats who were there to oversee drug companies failed in their duty so badly that malfeasance must be a term of reference for a royal commission. 
We know the TGA did not check the Pfizer clinical trial data. The TGA took Pfizer's word for the trial results and Pfizer lied repeatedly. When leading international vir virologists analysed the trial data in a peer-reviewed and published paper, they found the Pfizer vaccine caused 14 per cent more harm than it saved and should never have been approved. Finally, our politicians. Australians elected to have nothing but the best interests in their, of their constituents at heart engaged in policy decisions that did more damage to Australians than any foreign enemy has ever achieved. To emphasise why our COVID response cannot be allowed to go without scrutiny, let me review the COVID developments that have come to light in just the last month. One, Ivermectin won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2015 and was shown over and over again to be a remarkably effective, safe treatment for early stage COVID and would have saved thousands of lives. Ivermectin was never horse-paced. It was an obstacle to drug company profits and our authorities sided with drug companies over the best interests of the people. Two, COVID injections cause eye damage. Stanford University published a study in the journal Nature last month using medical data from 4.5 million people showing retinal vein occlusion, including blindness, significantly increased during the first two weeks after injection and persisted, in the case of Pfizer and Moderna, for two years. Our vaccine approval process was bypassed, smashed. Three, Hamburg and Munich universities' investigation of long COVID using mice and human post-mortem tissue found an accumulation of the spike protein in the skull, marrow and parts of the brain. Months after the infection or injection, leading to a conclusion that spike protein damages the brain and contributes to long COVID, whether the source is a COVID infection or a vaccine. The TGA has now approved for permanent use Moderna injection, which uses spike protein. What the hell are they doing? Four, COVID injections harm menstrual cycles. A study published last month in the British Medical Journal studied three million women in Sweden and concluded the Pfizer vaccine contributed to a 41 per cent increase in menstrual com complications. This information was first collated in 2020 and was simply ignored when the fake vaccines were approved. Finally, the World Health Organization took time out from promoting child grooming to declare COVID no longer a global health emergency. Now is the time to take stock, to end all private and government mandates, suspend all hasty approvals, and re-examine every fake vaccine and every drug approved using emergency approval. Now is the time to call the Royal Commission Minister Gallagher promised last year. Now is the time to start the painful yet necessary process of taking power from those who misused it and taking liberty from those who manipulated the response for their personal profit. Jail the bastards. Thank we you, want Senator. Justice. Your time has expired. Senator Smith. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to speak on the matter of importance raised today by Senator Roberts. Um, all of us in this chamber know that the COVID-19 pandemic caused enormous dislocation, stress, illness and mortality in not just Australia but around the world. It absolutely stretched our health system and our resources to the limit. It asked so much of our talented and committed workforce in the health and aged care sectors. Aged care workers caring for their residents in really, really difficult scenarios. Doctors on COVID wards holding iPads to their patients to say their goodbyes to families and loved ones. And the work of nurses day after day, again, very, very difficult circumstances during a very scary time. And the challenges of this pandemic, of course, have been beyond our health sector. Our teachers, our transport workers and our retail workers showing up day after day in the most difficult of circumstances, risking their personal health and safety and that of their families to keep our country, to keep our health system and to keep our economy moving including, of course, early educators, who I spoke about in this place many times uh, during the height of the pandemic, who were sent into work each day without PPE, without the necessary supports they needed to provide very hands-on care to some of our most vulnerable citizens as their parents undertook essential work. The pandemic challenged governments around the world to craft effective public health responses through unprecedented challenges to our scientists, to our health system, to, to all who work to develop the vaccine. 
It presented extremely difficult circumstances for businesses and touched every part of our economy and every part of our society. And we said before the last election that given this enormous dislocation, stress, illness and mortality involved in this pandemic, of course there will need to be a thorough inquiry. The Prime Minister has indicated that the government will undertake at an appropriate future time an inquiry into Australia's COVID-19 response that will examine the impact of the pandemic and the respective actions of government. That is wholly appropriate. We know, all of us here, that there are serious issues in the response to the pandemic. I raised a number of them myself in this place, including around the preparedness of the aged care workforce, the availability of masks, of PPE. And it is worth noting that across our country, many jurisdictions are already undertaking parliamentary reviews. I note in South Australia just today, another review has been launched into the COVID response and the emergency management response. So there is agreement, and I think there is understanding. I, I think everyone in this chamber agrees that we need to look at the government's response, look at what happened at that time, review that. But the timing also has to be well considered, noting that the pandemic isn't over. COVID is still amongst us. In my community, uh, it is certainly running rough at the moment. We are still in this pandemic. COVID is still with us. And it presents a heightened risk during the winter months, which we are just about to enter. And our focus at this particular point in time, as we enter winter, has to be about continuing to keep Australians safe in a pandemic in which we are still living. We're also doing serious work during this high-risk time to make sure our aged care sector and our aged care workers are supported and that we're minimising outbreaks in these facilities, including through strong infection prevention and control measures, regular reinforcing of advice to address complacency and the provision of a range of support services to this sector. Because we know and have seen over years that the aged care sector is of course particularly vulnerable and particularly vulnerable during the winter months. We're also investing $50 million into the research of long COVID. This is an issue which has been raised with me by a number of constituents. I know it led to the recent uh, parliamentary inquiry chaired by Dr Mike Freelander, which made a number of recommendations in its final report on long COVID, informed by over 500 submissions and testimonies from a range of sources. The response to that report is important because there are issues in long COVID too. So, whilst the government agrees that, yes, uh, a review is absolutely and wholly appropriate, the timing of that review is not at this particular point in time, but I think there is absolute you. agreement of its importance. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. And I'd rise to speak uh, in support of uh, Senator Roberts' motion that uh, we do have a Royal Commission into COVID. It is long overdue. Uh, I will qualify that by saying that if there is a, a Royal Commission into COVID, that all aspects of uh, the COVID uh, management of COVID uh, pandemic uh, is looked at properly. And I say that because when I went to the Queensland Supreme Court and listened to the police case uh, being put forward by the, the, the Queensland police that were uh, stood down because of the mandates, the, the judge there said that he wasn't interested in the biochemistry of the vaccine. And if you're not interested in the biochemistry of the vaccine, the biochemistry of the human body, then I fail to see how you can uh, basically do a proper review of what took place. And in particular, I think the first thing we need to have a very good look at in any uh, Royal Commission is the fact that what was the genomic sequence used in the PCR test, uh, knowing that the virus had 29 proteins of about 1,000 nucleotides each, which part of those nucleotides were actually used in the PCR test to actually determine if you had a positive COVID case. We still don't know what was used in the PCR test uh, in terms of that part of the sequence. Uh, so there's a primer and then there's a probe. What part of that probe was actually used and amplified? 40 times, I might add. You know, the cycle threshold used here in Australia was 40 times. Uh, Anthony Fauci himself said anything over 30 is basically considered dead nucleotides. The TGA themselves said that the PCR test couldn't distinguish between a live and dead virus. So how many uh, people tested positive to COVID 
that didn't actually have COVID. So we've got to actually do some serious quality assurance here because we spent hundreds of billions of dollars in locking the country down. We caused immense harm before we even get to the vaccine rollout. We caused immense harm in the, the overreach, government overreach in locking people out of their homes, locking them out of their states, locking them out of the country. Then when they got in, they were then locked down for weeks at a time, you know, up to two weeks. I'm still getting emails from Queenslanders who have been asked to pay for their uh, hotel accommodation for two weeks, and they can't afford it. I mean, they've got a $10,000 bill uh, because they were locked down against their will for two weeks. We've got to look at why the state government spent hundreds of millions of dollars on these quarantine facilities that were never used. Uh, and I know in Queensland, the, the quarantine facility out at Toowoomba there at Wellcamp has been handed over to the Wagners. You know, these guys don't need any free gifts from the government, I can assure you. Same in Western Australia. You know, $600 billion was spent on rat tests. Okay? All these things did was test for antibodies. I mean, you can have antibodies at any time, day or night, to all sorts of coronaviruses. So you know, we have to have a serious look at this. I mean, yet again, we have to look at why in the first two weeks after Joe Biden was elected uh, that three different pharmaceutical companies actually had a vaccine for a coronavirus when, despite the 40 years prior to that, they've never been able to find a vaccine for a coronavirus. And suddenly, after Joe Biden is elected, we've suddenly got pharmaceutical companies who have a vaccine for a coronavirus that was supposedly going to stop transmission and infection. And did it stop transmission and infection? No. By the September 2022, we had 10,000 cases of recorded cases of COVID. I know myself and I caught COVID. I didn't bother telling the government. I just stayed home for seven days. But the idea that every time you catch a virus, you go and get a test and ring up the government, uh, you know, that's never taken place before. And are we going to go forward with rules like that? I don't think so. I don't think so. It is not sustainable uh, to live in a society where we are terrifying people about a virus. And I'm not saying there wasn't a virus. I'm sure there was a virus. I'm sure there's a pathogen out there. And by all means, we should protect the vulnerable. But do you go around locking down healthy people, uh, especially those working age population, denying them the right to work uh, and not allowing them to make proper choices, given that the risk of the virus to them was very low? And you know, I, I personally dispute whether or not the vaccine did stop trans, uh, serious infection. I'd actually argue it possibly enhanced it, uh, given that studies show that there was an increase in IG4. Uh, which was your down-regulating antibody, and there was also an increase in uh, interleukin-10 uh, cytokine. Uh, these are all down-regulating uh, 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 proteins in your body designed to stop your immune system from reacting to all this over overexposure to viruses. So I welcome an inquiry, uh, a Royal Commission into COVID, but I would hope that it's uh, done with the best intentions uh, uh, and not with the idea of Senator, being a political hit job. Senator, time has expired. Senator Steele-John. Very much, uh, Chair. Disabled people should have always been put first in the planning and response to the pandemic. We should have never seen the kind of delays, the kind of lack of basic understanding uh, about disabled people's needs in emergency health responses that were in fact the reality when COVID broke out. And we must never see them again. There has been plenty of consultation about pandemic response now. Uh, and so from this point forward, there is no excuse that can be found in the halls of government for the failure to centre disabled people in emergency health responses. We know that the Morrison government's response to the pandemic for disabled people was grossly inadequate. The response to the pandemic largely failed to meet the government's obligations under the UNCRPD. The Morrison government failed to roll out the vaccine to disabled people as a priority community and failed to immunise quickly their family members and their workforce uh, that is central to supporting them. The government were too slow to provide PPE supplies and too slow to provide wraps to the workforce um, and to disabled people, increasing our risk of infection and of transmission. Disabled people and carers were denied the COVID supplement payment that all other vulnerable people received. 
And that was a measure, in fact, that was supported by both of the major parties in this place. Not to mention that we didn't receive clear, accessible and consistent information. Disabled people were not consulted or included in planning and rollout processes across the board. It took months for an advisory body to be established after the government even started to respond at all. Those in residential uh, accommodation settings were often left isolated, distressed and vulnerable. The Morrison government failed to collect adequate data on disabled people contracting the virus or the deaths associated with the virus. And that is a failure which continues to this day under this government, with the absurd reality uh, that if a person who is disabled contracts COVID-19, uh, but they are not an NDIS participant, which I remind the Senate is the vast majority of disabled people are not an NDIS participant. If you're a disabled person and you can contract or die from COVID and you are not an NDIS participant, that is not reported anywhere as a disabled person having contracted or having died from COVID. Now, we know all this because there have been many reviews and consultations about responses to the pandemic to this point, including hearings of the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of disabled people. There are also current ongoing reviews being undertaken about both uh, the federal and the state and territory government's responses to COVID-19, including their responses in relation specifically to disabled people. In my home state of Western Australia, there is a re review underway right now. So the Greens will be closely monitoring the outcomes and recommendations of these reviews. As we are closely monitoring the outcomes and recommendations of the reviews uh, that are looking into detail um, into the impact of things such as long COVID, we will be looking particularly to the Disability Royal Commission for its uh, expected recommendations uh, in its report in September. For these reasons, uh, that's why at this time uh, we will not uh, support this motion. Senator Canavan. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, I, I rise to support uh, Senator Roberts' motion, and uh, I hope the government can too, because uh, right now they, the Labor Party are on the verge of breaking another promise they made to the Australian people in regards to having an inquiry into COVID. Uh, I welcome the comments that were made earlier uh, from a senator opposite uh, saying they did still support uh, an inquiry, but uh, we are now almost a year, two weeks away from a year since the election, since Mr Albanese made this promise to the Australian people, and, and people are still desperately waiting for this inquiry. Uh, now, uh, uh, I want to put on record exactly when Mr Albanese made this promise, so it's not just me saying that. Um, uh, on uh, January the 25th last year, uh, a few months before the election, uh, uh, Mr Albanese spoke at the National Press Club and uh, a report of that speech in the Australian Financial Review said that when Mr Albanese was asked whether he would have an inquiry into a Royal Commission, I think the question was, into uh, coronavirus, Mr Albanese said, and I quote, it is beyond doubt that you will need an assessment. Uh, he went on to say, uh, that uh, whether that would be a Royal Commission or some form of inquiry, inquiry that will need to happen. Now, that promise now was uh, made a year and two months ago, uh, and we haven't heard any detail since. Not, not a single reference around a, a, what would an inquiry look like. Would it be a Royal Commission? Will it, what will those terms of reference or powers be? Will it be able to in, in, uh, inspect the decisions of state governments and state bureaucrats? Nothing. Absolute radio silence. Uh, from the government until 
uh, Senator Roberts, and I give him credit for moving his motion until, through this motion, we've heard a statement from a government senator saying they do still support inquiry. Well, where is it now? Where is it? At the time, Mr Albanese did give the excuse that we couldn't have it right now because we're in the heat of the pandemic. This was early last year. Well, clearly we're not in the heat of the pandemic anymore. Uh, all of the restrictions have gone. Uh, no one is, uh, or effectively, no one is, is wearing masks anymore. Uh, it is time to have a proper inquiry into what went on. In a few hours' time, we're going to have the government budget delivered, and that budget will show Australia with crushing levels of debt, uh, largely accumulated or significantly accumulated, uh, because of the response to the coronavirus pandemic. Over $300 billion of government spending. Uh, to support the decisions that were made to lock down, to close borders, uh, to roll out uh, the, a vaccine in record time, all of this spending added up. And the fact that we have now 7 or 8 per cent inflation in Australia is because, a large, largely because of that government expansion, that government spending. And so this has been the largest single level of government expenditure outside of war, and we are still waiting for a proper inquiry into what the hell happened. The other senators have raised the issues of people who have lost loved ones during the pandemic deserve this inquiry. People who have been injured by vaccines deserve this inquiry. People who have suffered through lockdowns deserve this inquiry. But every Australian family is suffering to pay their bills right now deserves this inquiry. Because they are the reason we have this inflation is because of these, I think, somewhat in the end misguided policy responses uh, to this pandemic. You can only hazard a guess that those who are resisting this, those that are playing delaying tactics here to have this, have this inquiry, are a little concerned about what it might find out. A little concerned what it might find out. And they're hoping that perhaps people forget uh, or that uh, people have moved on from their roles and positions by the time this inquiry is announced. And that's not good enough. Uh, we need to have this, this ASAP because the longer it waits, uh, the less institutional and corporate knowledge will exist, remain in, in, uh, in government bureaucracies to actually reveal what the hell happened. Uh, we should have had this inquiry announced as soon as the pandemic effectively ended late last year. We have waited long enough. I give credit to Senator Roberts for bringing this. I fully support it. And apparently the government supports it too. We'll stop the talk and just get on with it and announce an inquiry ASAP. It should really be a royal commission. We can have royal commissions into robo-debts, into pink bats. Uh, into all of these other types of things, surely we can have a royal commission to the largest government response uh, in this country outside of war time. People deserve that uh, now. Uh, we've had some Senate inquiries last week. We had a Senate inquiry into a removing vaccine. We've still got vaccine mandates still in some areas. And we still have those. They should be hauled in first. All those should be hauled in first. And I note to the Senate that Pfizer and Moderna have refused to appear at those Senate inquiries. Refused to appear. Now we're pursuing that. We're pursuing that, but that's another reason why we should have a Royal Commission, because all of these companies, all of the government bureaucrats, should be held to account and made Senator, to explain your to Australian time people has what expired. the hell happened. Yeah. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Now, the UAP, obviously, we support the establishment of a Royal Commission into our COVID 19 response. We don't just support one, we demand one. It's time. Now, to simply move on from the pandemic, as in as in nothing ever happened, don't worry about it, that's an outrage, an absolute outrage. Maybe an even greater outrage than the multiple, multiple outrages perpetrated during the pandemic itself. Now, to not forensically examine how the government and the public institutions handled the COVID crisis would represent an epic failure of curiosity a dereliction of public duty, and it would heap insult, insult on top of injury to the millions of Australians whose lives were devastated, not only by the virus, by the virus, but more importantly, by the government's response to the virus. Mm -hmm. Now, University of New South Wales professor of economics, Gigi Foster analysed the economic health and societal impact of government-imposed COVID lockdowns and estimated that the cost was 68 times greater than any benefit provided. If she's even half right, we need to investigate that. If it's even partly true, just partly true, decency alone, let alone duty, 
demands a full and frank inquiry. Now, real-world evidence comparing Sweden, Sweden, where lockdowns were not implemented with nations like ours, where government panic was the order of the day, showed that Sweden actually did better on every relevant data point. Does anyone here remember what happened in my home state of Victoria? Police enforced curfews, rings of steel around Melbourne, a pregnant woman, a mother, arrested in her home for a Facebook post. Now, to ignore this, to sweep it under the carpet, to insist nothing to see here, that's just dis disgraceful. That's what that is, it's disgraceful. Now, I could go on and on with more examples and more evidence that the state and the federal governments, first driven by fear, first of all by fear, and then drunk on power, hurt and, and harmed and harmed citizens with their manic COVID response investigation. We need to have one. And that's to say nothing, obviously, of vaccine mandates which threaten free men and women with punitive measures effectively turning them into second-class citizens, destroying so many livelihoods, breaking up families. If they decline what? A drug that has since proven to be what? I don't know, uh, less than effective, let's put it nicely, less than effective, in some cases dangerous. Worse, worse, now we're seeing the uh, overwhelming evidence of these injuries that were caused by these mandates. Are we not the least bit curious? Do we not care even a little bit? Are we really going to tell Aussies that we're not interested? We're disinterested in finding out any truths. We must investigate. We must learn lessons. We must make sure that these mistakes are never repeated. Now, a Royal Commission into Australia's COVID-19 response is not something that we should just consider. It is something that we should begin at the earliest opportunity, the earliest opportunity. It is the least that we can do for the people that we represent. Now, I was uh, elected largely on the issue of lockdowns and vaccine mandates due to the, uh, the heavy-handed nature, the unscientific nature of what the government did, both in my home state of Victoria and obviously around the country as well. And I made a promise to the people that voted for me that I would always push for an investigation. I would uncover the truth. And I'm here today to call on all of you to have an interest in the truth, to say, hey, we're not going to sit back and uh, just push this under the rug. We're going to find out what happened because we want to do better for our constituents. We don't want to be back in this position in the future again one day, especially now that the World Health Organization Organisation has come out and says that they want control over our health policy. Let's not let this happen again. Thank you. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Dean Smith, which is also shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips, and I call on Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. When the Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, stands to his feet at 7.30 this evening, and when, as is the custom, Labor members of the House of Representatives get to their feet at the conclusion of the speech, there's only one thing that Australian voters, Australian families need to think about. Has Mr Chalmers' second Labor budget delivered a plan to reduce inflation in our country? Because it is the inflation challenge which is the very, very, very most important and the very, very most urgent. And I want to quote from three people about the perils of inflation. The first person is someone who's well known to all of us, and that's the Governor of the Reserve Bank. The second person is someone who is also very well known to many of us, and he was the former President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. And then I want to focus on the former Treasurer of our country, Peter Costello. At Senate Estimates recently, I had an opportunity to ask the Governor about 
inflation in our country and whether or not Australians had actually forgotten about the corrosiveness of high inflation rates. The Governor said, in response to my question, I don't know whether there's a poor understanding, Senator Smith. I think people have forgotten. For many years, inflation varied between maybe 1.5 per cent and 3.5 per cent. We all got very exercised if inflation was half a percentage point away from 2 or 2.5 2 per cent. So that was the world we were living in. People have really forgotten about how corrosive inflation was. And why is inflation corrosive? because it erodes your savings, it entrenches income inequality, making it worse, and it really hurts the poor. I think we've forgotten about that because, as the governor said, it's 30 years since we lived in that world. And one of the perils, one of the very, very few downsides of our long run of economic prosperity in this country is that people have forgotten about the corrosiveness of inflation. I can see Senator Faruqi very excited to learn about what President Reagan might have said about inflation. President Reagan said, inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber and as deadly as a hitman, said the former President of the United States. And I see Senator Faruqi nodding her head in affirmation. President Reagan went on to say, we are victims of language. The very word inflation leads us to think of just high prices. Then, of course, we resent the person who puts on the price tags, forgetting that he or she is also a victim of inflation. Inflation is not just high prices. It's a reduction in the value of our money when the money supply is increased but the goods and services available for buying are not. Remarks from former President Reagan, and now, of course, to Mr Costello, who would have to take uh, the mantle as one of our, if not our, most su successful treasurers. Mr Costello said, as you know, we have been budgeting for a surplus. We have been aiming to produce a surplus because that is important to lay down funding for the future, for the expenses that we will have to meet and is also consistent with good economic policy. He went on to say, we have now eliminated the $96 billion of net debt that Labor left the Australian government when it left office. Our budget is in surplus for the ninth time in 10 years. In 2006-2007, a forecast surplus of $10.8 billion. We have established a future fund which has begun to save for the future. With these savings, the next generation will be able to meet the challenges of their time. And Mr Costello's contribution then was very, very important because the bigger the budget surpluses, the wiser the economic management, and then we can have a higher degree of confidence that that downward pressure is being put on inflation and that governments are doing everything that they can possibly do. No doubt we'll hear lots of contributions this afternoon about the perils and the corrosiveness of inflation, but to understand it better, I encourage people to go to this month's statement on monetary policy to see for yourself what the RBA continues to say about the persistency of inflation in the Australian Thank economy you. Your time and ways has to beat it. Senator Payman. Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, President, um, and thank you, Senator Dean Smith, for raising this matter. It's a great opportunity for me to explain the Albanese Labor what the Albanese Labor government is doing to ease cost of living pressure on families who we know are doing it tough at the moment. Since we were elected nearly a year ago, we, um, we've been delivering cost of living relief and it has been our top priority and we've been working hard each and every day. I'm incredibly proud to be part of a government that is delivering cheaper childcare for families, expanding paid parental leave, strengthening Medicare, reducing the cost of medicines and getting wages moving. This is a government that understands the pressures everyday Australians are facing and is taking action, unlike those opposite who wasted almost a decade in office and still managed to rack up a trillion dollars in debt. 
The Liberals and Nationals have failed to learn the lessons of the election and have opposed our cost of living measures at every step. Now, the centrepiece of the Albanese Labor government's second budget will be $14.6 billion over four years of cost of living relief that will ease pressures on Australians. Our cost of living plan will directly lower price pressures and the CPI in 2023 and 24. This is in addition to $11.3 billion to support a 15 per cent increase to award wages for aged care workers and improved paid parental leave and cheaper childcare beginning on 1 July 2023. The Albanese Labor government is delivering responsible and targeted relief that will not add to broader in inflationary pressure in the economy. Inflation has been driven largely by Russia's illegal invasion um, in Ukraine and the, the former government's economic mismanagement. And we know how important it is to get it under control. Our plan for inflation can be broken down in three parts, relief, restraint and repair. We're delivering targeted relief for Australian households, cleaning up the mess left by the Liberals and Nationals through efficient and responsible spending and repairing supply constraints through cleaner and cheaper energy, the National Construction Fund and more affordable housing. Now, speaking of housing, the Albanese government is dedicated to delivering on our promise for more affordable and social housing, and we hope to achieve real change in this space through the, Australia, the Housing Australia Future Fund. The $10 billion fund has passed the House of Representatives, and we now need the Senate to get behind this important bill. The fund will deliver 30,000 new social and affordable homes in its first five years. Anyone, and I mean anyone, who is serious about more affordable housing should support this bill. And yet, here in the Senate, we have an alliance between the Liberals, the Nationals and the Greens, who are saying no. The Greens' opposition to our Housing Australia Future Fund is not just working against affordable housing. It's a cynical political tactic. They use the housing crisis for their own political gain peddling reckless and unrealistic policies to those who are struggling. And when, we, um, when an opportunity comes to deliver change, they say no. Housing experts across academia, industry and community support the fund. Power Housing described it as a transformative reform. The Community Housing Industry Association declared it was absolutely urgent that the Senate supports the package. The Urban Development Institute said every day that passes is costing them, the Australian people, more and more. The Property Council said the quicker all of these mechanisms are up and running, the better. And the National Shelter described it as the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward in the, for the past 10 years. Given the state of housing in this country and this broad support, it's beyond disappointing that the Greens are standing with the Coalition to stop this bill. The Greens can't be taken seriously on this. They use the crisis to garner support and even shamelessly fundraise for their own political party. If the Greens were serious about their concerns in the rental market, they would be taking action right here in the Senate. Instead, they say whatever will help them win more votes and refuse to take action, making the housing crisis worse. We know too well that the consequences of what happens when the Greens side with the Liberals and Nationals Thanks. against progressive Thank reform. You, Senator. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. What a pathetic motion this is from the LNP. They were in government for nine years, and what happened? Inequality increased, house prices spiralled out of control, the National Energy Network basically collapsed, and wage stagnation and insecure work became entrenched. And here they are with a motion that boils down to barracking for more cuts to government services and higher interest rates. The unfortunate thing about this motion is that it seems to be precisely the approach that the Labor Party has taken to tonight's budget. Instead of helping renters or people in poverty, the Labor Party is choosing to give more than $254 billion in stage three tax cuts to billionaires and the already wealthy. The budget's big winners 
are very wealthy men. That quarter of a trillion dollars could be used to lift people out of poverty. Labor could solve the housing crisis, not just gamble on the stock market. They could wipe student debt. They have the power to help people, and they are choosing not to. In this cost of living crisis, they have prioritised a wafer thin surplus, they've prioritised the already wealthy, they've prioritised fossil fuel subsidies, they've prioritised nuclear submarines, and they're prioritising handouts to property investors. And yet, in the real world, every day, people are skipping meals. They're being forced to choose between paying between electricity bills and keeping a roof over their heads. They're choosing between heating or eating, medicine or rent. That's what's actually happening out there. And I thought a fundamental job of government was to make sure that people had their basic needs met and that they could live a life with dignity. This is a budget that delivers for property investors and the already super wealthy. Under Labor, the problems that ordinary people are facing will get worse. It's more than disappointing, it's a betrayal. I thought we had an election and changed the government. Seems we didn't get to change the policies. Labor's spruiking its supposed $14.8 billion cost of living package, but this budget spends far more than that on tax breaks for wealthy property investors with multiple properties than it does on any of the cost of living uh, promises. We've heard a lot about nobody left behind by this government, but there must be an awful lot of nobodies out there because this budget leaves plenty of Australians behind. It leaves low-income people behind. It will leave students behind. It will leave renters behind. It will leave disabled people behind. It will look after the top end of town, though. Those quarter of a trillion dollars in stage three tax cuts baked into this budget. Budgets are about choices, and this government tonight is choosing to back the winners, and it's leaving the rest of Australia behind. For shame. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I'm very pleased to rise in support of my good friend Senator Dean Smith's uh, motion in relation to inflation. And what we should remember, what we should remember is that inflation is in practice the greatest tax of all. Inflation is the greatest tax of all. And I want to quote to you from a book which I frequently quote from in this place called Basic Economics. Basic Economics. And very appropriate, I quote from this book following uh, the Leader of the Greens' contribution in this place. And this is what it says in relation to inflation. Inflation is in effect a hidden tax. The money that people have saved is robbed of part of its purchasing power, which is quietly transferred to the government that issues new money. Inflation is not only a hidden tax, it is also a broad-based tax. A government may announce that it will not raise taxes or will raise taxes only on the rich, however that is defined, but by creating inflation it in effect transfers some of the wealth of everyone who has money, which is to say it siphons off wealth across the whole range of incomes and wealth from the richest to the poorest. So not only, not only is inflation a hidden tax, it is a regressive tax and it affects the poorest in our community. It affects those in our community who have the least options in terms of how they manage their economic affairs, and typically we're talking about low and medium income earners. Now, I want to take issue with some of the contribution Senator Payman made in terms of this debate when she uh, defended the government's proposed housing fund. Now, let me say this about both the housing fund and the so-called National Reconstruction Fund. The fact of the matter is that the government has successfully passed the National Reconstruction Fund and is proposing the Housing Fund, which would total $25 billion of extra borrowings—$25 billion of extra borrowings. The government is actually proposing, in terms of the Housing Fund, to borrow $10 billion today and invest that to hopefully generate returns in the future which can be invested in housing. That's the proposition. So instead of simply paying for housing as we go year by year, they're proposing to borrow $10 billion, borrow $10 billion, issue $10 billion worth of bonds or however else they propose to raise this money, go into the market, borrow additional money and then seek to invest it. And if you want to know the weakness in terms of that sort of strategy, all you need to do is look 
at the annual report 2021 to 2022 of the Future Fund. And it's the Future Fund which is going to be commissioned with the role of investing that $10 billion. And if you look at the results of the Future Fund for the period ending 30 June 2022, you see the dangers. You see the dangers involved in that sort of strategy. Because in the year ending 30 June 2022, in relation to the Future Fund, because we're in a high inflation environment, a very difficult economic environment for investors. They say, and I quote from the forward from the chairman, Peter Costello, in a year in which global equities and global bonds fell by more than 10 per cent each and where the Australian stock market fell 6.5 per cent, the return of negative 1.2 per cent, negative 1.2 per cent. So not even taking into account inflation running in Australia at 7 per cent, the future fund, the future fund, not even taking into account inflation, Future Fund generated a negative return, minus 1.2 per cent. And it was the same with respect to the other funds which are administered by the Future Fund, including the Medical Research Future Fund, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land and Sea Future Fund, the Future Drought Fund and Emergency Response Fund, and the Disability Care Australia Fund. All of them went backwards. Every single one of them went backwards, even before you add the inflationary impact. Even before you add the inflationary impact. So the government is essentially, essentially going to be spending a bucket load of money under this budget, and it's got to go out and it's got to borrow that money. It's got to borrow that money. And there's a bond issue, actually, at the moment, which will be closing on the 10th of May this week, bids closing this week, tomorrow, to raise 800 million with an interest rate of 3.25 per cent. 3.25 per cent. You can go onto the Australian Office of Financial Management and see this. But what horrifies me is that on 21 November 2024, the government is going to have to refinance some $41.3 billion, $41.3 billion, which currently has an interest rate of 0.25 per cent. Senator Green. Thank you very much, um, uh, Deputy President. I'm very pleased to follow the good Senator from Queensland. Um, it's always lovely to get an uh, economic lecture, to get these books brought out, to get quotes from Economics 101 or, or Economics for Dummies. Let me bring out... What's this? What is it? Oh, this is... I've got a book here. What's this? Oh, it's 10 years of Liberal National Governments. What, have, what does it say? Oh, the Liberal National, gov Liberal National Government doubled the debt double the debt before the pandemic. And it says, oh, the Liberal National Government doubled the debt before the pandemic and left taxpayers with a trillion dollars of debt when they were kicked out of office. That's what it says. Oh, let me quote a little bit more from this, this, this book that um, uh, Senator Scar, Economics, oh, sorry, Economics for Dummies 101. Note, the Liberal National Party opposes the NRF and the Housing Fund. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if the Liberal Nationals opposed more manufacturing in regional Australia, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Liberal Nationals don't support affordable housing and funding social and affordable housing. Because the real economics lesson that Australians learnt at the last election is that the Liberal National Party are not the economic responsible managers that they tell people that they are. They know, Australians know, that this inflation crisis that we are dealing with and the real pressures that they are under are a, a direct result of the previous government's 10 years of uh, messy budgets, rorts, waste, and not fessing up to the Australian people about the challenges that we face. Now, that's exactly why when it comes to our budgets and the way we are treating the economy, the way that we are speaking to Australians and being upfront and honest with them. It's why the Albanese government has a plan for addressing inflation challenges in the economy. It's about relief, it's about repair, and it's about restraint. One of those words that wasn't in Senator Scar's book, wasn't in any of the former Liberal National um, uh, budgets. Wasn't in, wasn't in any of the colour-coded spreadsheets, the word restraint. But responsible budgets can, can provide and will provide cost of living relief. 
And we, we've seen this already announced by our government. We've seen it in the previous, government, previous um, budget in October, the measures to deal with cost of living relief. And I just want to run through a few of those now because this is the stuff that the Greens, on the other hand, say we're not doing enough to do when it comes to cost of living relief. Um, the $14.8 billion of cost of living relief in this budget, we are delivering, we need to deliver that, but we need to do it in a way that does not add to inflation. It's incredibly important that we do that. That's why we're doing things like making sure that we have energy bill relief for thousands of Australians. Something that those opposite voted against the last time they had the opportunity. Will they vote against it again? We'll have to see. But you can't stand in here and complain about inflation and the way that it impacts on Australian families and then also walk into the Senate and vote against energy price bill relief. You can't do those two things. You, they can't do the two things because it says that you're not actually fair dinkum about making sure that people have money in their pockets to pay their bills. We're making sure that we're making changes to the single parent payment lifting the age from 8 to 14, an incredibly important measure for thousands of families, but particularly, can I say, for thousands of women in Australia, because we know most, most people, most families on that single parenting payment are women, and over 50,000 women will be the recipients of that change. We're making sure that aged care workers get a pay rise, a pay rise that the, they had to fight and scramble for under the last government, what well, our government is funding this pay rise for some of our hardest workers and making sure that they get, they get the money that they deserve. And we're providing skills and training funding for childcare workers to make sure that they're able to meet the demand that we will see in the future. We're delivering cheaper childcare, we're delivering cheaper medicines, we're making sure that cost of living relief is at the centre of our budget and the centre of our response to this inflation crisis, something that those opposite, no matter how many economics degrees they have, no matter how many economics books they want to bring into the Senate, no matter how many times they want to quote from learned professors, ever seem to understand that this is about families and that's what Labor budgets do. Senator Babette. Thank you. In the words of Ronald Reagan, when a business or an individual spends more than it makes, it goes bankrupt. When government does it, it sends you the bill. And when the government does it for 40 years, the bill comes in two ways, high taxes and inflation. Now, make no mistake about it, inflation is a tax not by accident. Reagan was right. Inflation is bad, obviously. It is just like a slow leak in your fuel tank. You can still drive, but you don't get as far. Inflation increases the cost of living, that feeling of dread when you open your power bill. $275, where's my $275? You're making decisions every day about what you're forced to go without. Maintaining a roof over your head costs more. Rents are up, mortgage repayments are up, your wallet is empty. Every week you go to the supermarket, you have less money. You have less in your basket for the same amount of money. Your children know something's up because all of a sudden you're saying no a lot more. So who drilled the hole in your fuel tank? Was it A, the Reserve Bank? Was it B, the government? Or was it C, both? Well, I'll answer that question for you. It was both. It was both. Now, the answer to our inflation woes is for the government to stop wasting money. Low debt is a policy for our youth. Today's public debt is our children's problem tomorrow, and I believe in protecting children. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I, I rose in this place uh, before last year's first Labor budget, and I, asked, I posed the question, channelling that great political drama West Wing, whether the Labor Party had a secret plan to fight inflation. And the conclusion at that time, and after we saw that first budget handed down, was that they didn't have a plan to fight inflation. It remains very secret, Senator Macdonald. In fact, it remains so secret that, until this day, we see no plan to fight inflation. And as Senator Smith said in speaking to this motion, inflation is a scourge. And anyone who has lived through periods of high inflation and whilst I was young, I do remember the high inflation of the 1970s and the effect it had on my family and their farming business. 
Those who have lived through inflation know just how corrosive, how destructive, how damaging it is. Why is it so corrosive? Because it erodes everyone's buying power. It erodes the value of the money in your pocket, the value of the money in your bank account, the value of the money in your pay packet. It leads to massive declines in real wages, and that's what we're seeing. This government, particularly when it was in opposition, admittedly, but this government used to talk a lot about real wage increases. We don't hear them talk about real wage increases anymore because they have overseen, in their first period in government, the largest declines in real wages we've seen in decades. In decades. The last coalition government actually delivered real wage increases. You might not know that if you just listen to this government, because this government tells big porky pies. They've actually delivered massive declines in real wages, and that is through their inaction on inflation. They have left all the heavy lifting to the Reserve Bank, all the heavy lifting to the Reserve Bank. They have done nothing in terms of the economic levers they control to put downward pressure on inflation. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a great believer in the bootlegger and Baptist theory of economics, and I say, why? Why, why would they have done They know how corrosive and damaging inflation is. Because well, inflation does have an upside to governments. Inflation does have an upside to governments. Inflation means that the real value of government debt is, over time, eroded. And this comes at the direct expense of taxpayers. So whilst this government may talk about targeting inflation through, sorry, uh, dealing with inflation through targeted cost of living relief, I ask everyone out there who's listening to this, I ask everyone out there who's listening to this whether they feel they have received anything from this government to help them with the cost of living. And I suspect the vast, vast, vast majority of those listening to me today would say they've done absolutely nothing. Things have just got harder, harder and harder, as they've seen their mortgage interest rates skyrocket, as they've seen the cost of food, of groceries, of, of fresh fruit and vegetables, of meat, of dairy products skyrocket, as they've seen the cost of housing go up, the cost of recreation increase. And all of these, all of these factors are even more highly magnified in rural and regional Australia. Uh, I was lucky enough in the last few weeks to, to spend uh, a few days in uh, Geraldton, yeah, to the north of Perth, and a few days in Albany, uh, about four and a half hours south of Perth. And in both those places, you see the corrosive and damaging effect of skyrocketing inflation. You see the pressure on people in supermarkets where suddenly they're paying to, having to pay so much more for their bread, so much more for their meat, so much more for their dairy. The added costs of transportation to regional areas piles on top of the already high cost of living in the bush. You didn't see the price of petrol much under $2 a litre uh, in, in, uh, in and around Geraldton, particularly in the regional areas an hour or two outside of Geraldton. This is the cost of inflation. This is the cost of this corrosive hidden tax on the, the mums and dads, the, the small businesses of this country, the farming families of this country who face these cost of living pressures every day. And tonight, the pressure is on this government. That completes the matter of public importance. Uh, I've been asked just to take the Senate to the tabling and consideration of committee reports for the tabling of one urgent report. Uh, Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Reynolds, the Deputy Chair of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present a report by way of a statement on the draft estimates for the Australian National Audit Office and the Parliamentary Budget Office for 2023-24 and seek leave to be incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. We have a little time left before uh, the suspension, so we will go to item 14, the consideration of documents. 
Uh, Senator Stewart John wouldn't mind talking on a document, but I can come back to the whips first. Uh, quick, if that's quick. okay. Um, yeah. I like to, on pages five and six, could I please take note of documents number 10, 12, 13 on page um, five and on page six, uh, documents number 29 and 32 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Not 32, because Senator Stewart John wants to speak on that and I'll ask him to continue his remarks at the end of his contribution. Uh, we've got a lot of time, so I'll give you the call, Senator Still John. Let's say on thirty, on thirty-two, on, on thirty-two, President, and with a couple of my colleagues wanting to speak, I will just take note, if that's okay, of documents number uh, okay. thirty-two on page three, reports and government responses, yeah. um, and uh, take note of committee report number thirty-seven um, on page three, again reports and government responses, and also document number 36 on page 7 and seek leave to continue my remarks on all three. Okay, so, so I ask you if you don't have any. Senator Rice. Well, are we, um, Deputy President, so are we um, on to reports and government responses? Is Arise. We're still at we're still at documents, right. and given the time, we're going to also table some documents. So I think we just have to hold hold that till perhaps tomorrow or later on today. Tonight. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Deputy President. You did an excellent job as always. Um, on behalf of the Chair of the Rural and Regional mm -hmm. Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee, Senator Stirl, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the provisions of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2023. Uh, I also present um, a report to the sta Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme on general issues around the implementation and performance on the NDIS. And on behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's third report of 2023. Minister. I present the government's response to the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on corporations and financial services on its inquiry into online gambling and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Is that right? Senator Rice, we've got a five minutes. Okay. <laughs> it just, I'm again seeking your indulgence. So yeah. if I do, I then. Am I in continuation when we come back to it tomorrow? What happens? Uh, <laughs> if you seek leave to continue your remarks after five minutes, it will be on Thursday. I understand you can continue. So again, just for clarification, so for the rest of the, do we come back to the rest of these committee reports? Not after, not not today. Not today. So no. the fact that we have cut short, that's it. Yes. All right. Okay. Sorry, I, I misunderstood you. Yes, we we cut short, and then and that's it. And, and that's, that's it for today. Okay. Okay. Look, I will then speak very briefly in the um, five minutes I've got left to the interim report of the Senate Community Affairs References Committee's inquiry into the extent and nature of poverty in Australia, which was tabled out of sitting last week. And I want to thank the senators who have participated in the inquiry so far, particularly my deputy chair, Senator Mario Smith, and Senators Pratt, Askew and Tyrrell. I proposed this inquiry to the committee soon after the election of the Albanese government in the middle of last year because of the increasing evidence that poverty in Australia was a huge and growing problem that successive governments have failed to address. And the inquiry was established almost 50 years to the day after the historic Henderson Commission of Inquiry into Poverty. We Greens believed it was important to compile this evidence and to give voice to people who were living in poverty as to what their experiences were, to bring their voices to the parliament and then to use this evidence as a platform to take action. Poverty is a political choice and it affects people of all ages, genders, races and backgrounds. The government has the power to lift people out of poverty, but it's a choice that they must make. The evidence presented to the committee so far makes it clear that the simplest, 
most effective and most urgent step towards alleviating poverty is to increase income support payments for all recipients, regardless of their age, and this should be immediately followed by the development of a national poverty line. So I was simultaneously pleased and disappointed by the one recommendation of our report. Pleased because it was a unanimous recommendation that the Australian government take urgent action so that Australians are not living in poverty and prioritise policy measures in the upcoming May budget that specifically target rising inequality and entrenched disadvantage, including through the income support system. But I was disappointed that the government couldn't go further than this and disappointed because it seems that, consistent with this, in tonight's budget, the government is not going to be taking the urgent action that is needed that would indeed mean that Australians aren't living, living in poverty. And when I asked Labor senators whether they would be able to support a recommendation to increase JobSeeker without even being specific about how much, they couldn't. And this was despite having agreed in 2020 to a Senate committee report recommendation to immediately undertake a review of the income support system to ensure that all eligible income support recipients do not live in poverty. So it was up to the Greens to recommend in our additional comments that the Australian government immediately lift the base rate of all income support payments to $88 a day, regardless of age, and that the Australian government establish a national definition of poverty. And it is disappointing that rather than the lifting to $88 a day, which would be $40 a, fortnight, $40 a week in increase, all we are going to be getting, it seems, in tonight's budget, but you know, we'll wait to see what the Treasurer says um, in an hour's time, is a paltry increase of $2.85. $2 85 a day. The committee heard powerful personal evidence from witnesses with direct experience of poverty in hearings across the country. And I'm not going to have time to go through them all. I mean, Abigail said that energy prices went up, inflation went up, and the DSP did not. Peter said that being on income support and having no money is dispiriting, crushing, and soul destroying. Um, Somebody, jo said that she was going to lose a tooth because she couldn't afford to see a dentist. David said that with his DSP alone, he's left with just $177 for the fortnight after paying rent. He's currently around five weeks in arrears and just waiting for his eviction notice. And witness A said that she's had seven years of pretending to her kids that she's not hungry or that she's already eaten because she legally cannot disclose the domestic violence they faced. How can you hear these witness testimonies and not be compelled to act? So that's what we, in presenting this interim report tonight, it was we deliberately wanted this report to be evidence in front of the government prior to tonight's budget, to be evidence to show the reasons as why the government needs to act to lift people out of poverty, why the government needs to lift all income support payments, regardless of age, regardless of which payment, to above the poverty line. So I look forward to tonight's budget, but sadly think I'm going to be disappointed with that as well. Senator, I just ask that you seek leave to continue your remarks in the event some other member wishes and to. And I seek it. leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, do the suspension, given it's a suspension, can I just ask a whip? For the remaining matters on government responses to committee reports and committee reports presented out of sittings, a couple left. Could I ask they be spoken to and um, seek leave to continue remarks in the event that a member's missed out, given the nature of the week? Thank you, Deputy President. Look, um, to facilitate that, um, I can move on, on block. Th move on block. That I uh, take note and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. The sitting of the Senate is suspended until 8:30 p.m.
I call the minister. Oh, I call Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. I tabled the budget statement for 2023-24 and other documents as listed on the dynamic red. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the documents. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the Senate take note of the budget statement and documents and move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Brown. I table particulars of proposed and certain proposed expenditure and additional expenditure for 2022-23 and 23-24 and seek leave to move a motion to refer the documents to legislation committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Brown. I move the motion as circulated to refer the documents to legislation committees. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I table the portfolio budget statements for 2023-24 for the Department of the Senate, the Parliamentary Budget Office and the Department of Parliamentary Services. Minister. I table portfolio budget statements for portfolios and executive departments as listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll move to the Senate stands. Oh, sorry, I'm now calling Senator Ayres. No, I'm not. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, President. Legacy Australia is celebrating its centenary this year. It is doing so by holding a torch relay, beginning on the old battlefields yep. of France and finishing in Melbourne. The relay celebrates 100 years of care for the families of those who have fallen in the service of their country. Legacy was born out of the devastation of the First World War and continues to serve Australian families to this day. If we lived in a better world, the mission of Legacy would have been accomplished by now. But war and its terrible impact on communities and families does not seem to want to retreat into the mists of history. As I travel around South Australia, I always take time to spend a moment of reflection at the war memorials that stand sorrowfully at the centre of our regional towns. They are sentinels, reminding us of the unimaginable pain of mothers and fathers suffered when losing their beloved sons and daughters. As I have spent a little time serving at the foot of the Hindu Kush, I know the soldier of today asks the same question of themselves as the soldier did 100 years ago. Who will look after my family if I fall at the hands of our enemy? It is from these sentiments that legacy was born. It is these sentiments that continue to sustain its purpose today. Today, Legacy supports more than 40,000 partners and children of veterans who gave their lives in service to our nation, as well as those who have returned bearing physical and mental scars. I am proud to be a legacy of the Legacy Club of South Australia and Broken Hill, and we will be a torchbearer in the relay this Friday after the flame arrives in Adelaide. I acknowledge the great work of the club in organising this event, in particular President Rob Ely, Chief Executive Karen Smith and Chairman the Honourable Graham Ingerson. Mr Ingerson is a great friend and the former South Australian Deputy Premier. Graham was a ward of legacy as a youth following the death of his father and knows firsthand the importance of legacy's work. I thank him for his unwavering commitment to advancing the organisation. The legacy flame began, began its journey on the 23rd of April in Pozier. France, travelling on to the Menin Gate in Belgium and then to London, where it was welcomed by His Majesty King Charles III prior to its first leg in Albany, Western Australia, last week. The overall journey of the torch relay will include stops at all 45 legacy clubs around Australia, culminating in Melbourne in October. In all, the torch will travel more than 50,000 kilometres through 100 locations carried by approximately 
1,500 torchbearers, all of whom have connections to legacy or the defence community. The torch will be welcomed in Adelaide on the 11th of May at the Edinburgh Defence Base before an expected crowd of around 200 guests. The badge of legacy is a torch and a wreath of laurel. The torch signifies the undying flame of the service and sacrifice of those who gave their lives for their country. The wreath of laurel is a symbol of our remembrance of them. The badge remains a powerful image to the veteran community to this day. I leave the senators with a few words from Archibald MacLeish's poem, The Young Dead Soldiers Do Not Speak. They say, we have given our lives, but until it is finished, no one can know what our lives gave. They say our deaths are not ours. They are yours. They will mean what you make of them. These words capture the great work of legacy. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Senator Fruki. Thank you, President. 15th May will mark the 75th anniversary of Al-Nakba, the catastrophe that saw the violent expulsion of approximately three quarters of all Palestinians from their homes and homelands by Zionist militias and the new Israeli army during the State of Israel's establishment. This initial reign of terror started in 1948, but lasted years and indeed continues to this very day. Many Palestinian cities were attacked and over 500 villages were destroyed. About 15,000 Palestinians were killed in a series of mass atrocities, including dozens of massacres. The Deir Yassin massacre was particularly infamous. Approximately 100 Palestinian men, women and children were murdered by Zionist paramilitaries. By 1949, at least 750,000 Palestinians had been made refugees. Whole Palestinian communities fled the violence or were violently expelled, never to be allowed to return to their homes. But the Nakba is not just about that day. It is about the continued dispossession of the Palestinians, the denial of their human rights, and their ongoing targeting by Israel. The Nakba is live every day for the more than 7 million refugees, both displaced during Israel's creation and their descendants still awaiting justice. Every day, Palestinians are killed or imprisoned or have their houses destroyed or have their land taken by Israeli settlements and they live under an apartheid system of laws. The Nakba is not a history lesson. It is a lived past and present for the Palestinian people. It is lived every day that they are denied the right of entry to their land. It is lived every day by the people in the Gaza Strip who are kept in an open-air prison camp because Israel and Egypt refuse to open the borders. It is lived with every day in the West Bank as Israel settlements expand and settlers are allowed to behave with impunity. For 75 years, the Palestinians have been betrayed by countries in the so-called West that refuse to hold their persecutor Israel to account and give a blank check of diplomatic cover to anything the State of Israel does. And that extends here to Australia and to this parliament where there is a bipartisan commitment to the denial of Palestinian rights and a minimization of the crimes of the Israeli state. This year, for the first time, the United Nations General Assembly will officially commemorate the Nakba, a simple and long overdue ask, supported by the overwhelming majority of countries that voted to pass the resolution. But guess how Australia voted? It voted no. Disgustingly, the Australian government couldn't even bring itself to even acknowledge the existence of the Nakba and support a public event. In December, the UN General, General Assembly also voted for the International Court of Justice to provide an opinion on the legal consequences of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. Yet again, Australia voted against justice. After a decade under the repulsive liberal foreign policy, we expected better but Australia continues its traditional role as the USA's lackey, running interference to support Israel no matter what crimes it commits. Israel executes journalists like Shirin Abu Akleh, then tear gases the funeral. No problem. Teenagers murdered near Jericho and Bethlehem. Crickets. 
Israel occupies and expels worshippers from the Al-Aqsa Mosque during Ramadan repeatedly, and there is a mild-mannered media statement from Foreign Minister Wong that, of course, leads with the reaffirmation of Israel's rights. Australia still insists it seeks a peaceful resolution in Palestine, but there is no doubt that we are a bad faith actor. We are part of the problem. And the people are awake to this duplicity. The people are with Palestinians and their anti-colonial struggle and for an end to occupation. All around Australia, thousands will come to Nakba rallies. 75 years after Nakba, Palestinians and their supporters remain committed to justice, peace, and a permanent solution to the crisis caused by Israel, including the right to return for all refugees. Silence in the face of the persecution, dispossession, and displacement of Palestinians is not an option. To stay neutral or to use weak both sides' language is to choose the side of the oppressor. There is no two ways about this. We demand justice for Palestine. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Kony. Thank you very much, President. Uh, tonight I wanted to make a short contribution on the uh, Defence Strategic Review that was released last month. The government commissioned this review uh, in the first 100 days after its election, and it set out an agenda uh, for ambition, but necessary reform to defence's posture and structure. The response to the review from the government sets out a blueprint for Australia's strategic policy, defence planning and resourcing over the coming decades. The government has identified six priority areas uh, for immediate action, those being the acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines through the AUKUS uh, agreement to improve our deterrence capabilities, the development of the, Austra the Australian Defence Force's ability to precisely strike targets at a longer range and manufacture them in Australia, to improve the ADF's ability to operate from Australia's northern bases, initiatives to improve the growth and retention of a highly skilled defence workforce, lifting our capacity uh, to rapidly tra translate disruptive new technologies into ADF capabilities in close partnership with Australian industry, and to deepen our diplomatic and defence partnerships with key partners in the Indo-Pacific. I think almost everyone has been involved in national conversations and debates about defence uh, has welcomed the review and the priority, priority areas from the government. Of course, realising these priorities will require enormous effort, and I know that the Albanese government and the Australian people are up for that challenge and will be guided by a national defence strategy that will set out a comprehensive plan for defence policy, planning, capabilities and resourcing. I think the recommendations from the Defence Strategic Review reflect our increasingly challenging strategic environment. On the first uh, priority, acquiring nuclear-powered submarines, I know from spending time with submariners that there is a lot of anticipation for this new technology, and it really is uh, a key to our ability to project that deterrence to where it matters. There is a broad acknowledgement that we cannot re entirely rely on other nations to deter conflict in our region, and we need to acquire the capabilities necessary to be a serious deter deterrent in our own right. It's also positive to see our diplomatic work recognised as an essential part of our efforts to support the international rules-based order. This work needs to be seen as part of an overall effort to stabilise our strategic environment in addition to the acquisition of capabilities that can defer conflict. Of course, the DSR calls out something that I've discussed in this place on numerous occasions, our sovereign capability, being able to manufacture things right here in Australia. Increasing the cap capacity of our own defence industrial base will be an important priority of the Albanese government. In recent times, we have all seen how fragile international supply chains can be, and it's not too difficult to understand the impact an international conflict would have on our ability to use trade routes we usually rely on. And that's why, President, developing the sovereign capability to manufacture weapons here in Australia is so important. And I look forward to the government working with industry, working with people in this place to realise this ambition. And I'd like to thank uh, the former Minister for Defence, the Honourable Stephen Smith, 
and the former Chief of the Defence Force, Sir Angus Houston, for their efforts in putting the DSR together. It is an important guiding document that will be essential in navigating these uncertain times. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, it was good to get back on the road uh, throughout this parliamentary break uh, and go and see some regional towns uh, in Queensland. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been out there, and in the last month I travelled across to the Darling Downs uh, in the first week where I went to Warwick, Stanthorpe, Gundawindi, Dolby and Gatton. Uh, I then came back to the office for a week and then had another two weeks on the road where I went out to Roma, Charleville, Quilpie, uh, Blackhall, Bark Alden, uh, Emerald, Claremont, Charters Towers, Air, Townsville, Bowen, Mackay, uh, Gladstone and Rockhampton and then finished up in Harvey Bay and uh, Gainda. And, uh, you know, many of the problems uh, people face out in the regions are very similar despite the geographical distances between many of the towns and the different uh, landscape and scenery and the industries that uh, these towns may rely on. Uh, and I'll summarise some of those problems now, and that's obviously a, sh a shortage of labour. Uh, I know we have a very high immigration um, in this country, but unfortunately too many people just move into the big cities of Sydney and Melbourne and don't really travel out to the bush where there really are so many employment opportunities. Uh, and I was fortunate enough uh, actually to stop off at the Central Queensland University in both Rockhampton and Gladstone at the School of Manufacturing and the School of Mining. And there are so many opportunities uh, in those particular areas, uh, in, in TAFE and the mining industry and, and the agricultural industry and, and process management uh, areas. Uh, if only we could get more people into TAFE and, and probably less people in the university. I think it's time we had a good look at our tertiary uh, sector in this country uh, and started to focus more on uh, TAFE courses uh, and apprenticeships rather than degrees, because that's where the work is out in the regions. The other thing, of course, as usual, is there's always uh, difficulties with health. Uh, many towns needed GPs, uh, and of course we've got the same old issue of, of closed maternity wards. And I know Roma, uh, Ch uh, Corpy is looking for GPs, and, uh, and many other towns. And then Gladstone, you know, a big town of between 60 and 70 thousand people, its maternity ward has closed down. Now I've often touched on this issue, issue in the past, where we've had over 30 maternity wards closed in the regions in the last three decades under the state Labor government. But to think that a town the size of uh, Gladstone, uh, and not just the size of Gladstone, it's an extremely prosperous town. I mean, it's basically the manufacturing powerhouse of Queensland with so many um, smelters and refineries there. I mean, it's going to be the future hub uh, for more development in the region, hydrogen being one of them. Uh, and it just beggars belief that we cannot get services, particularly uh, obstetricians, uh, in a town like Gladstone. When, when, you know, when I went to Gundawindi, for example, uh, they've got three obstetricians and three anaesthetists. So you've really got to ask yourself why the Queensland uh, government can't sort all that out in terms of uh, keeping the maternity ward open out there. The other thing uh, that really concerned me was when I was in Mackay, uh, there's talk of building a hydro dam upstream at Yungala. Uh, now that's got a, a World Heritage uh, uh, platypus site. The idea that you're going to build a dam uh, that can provide five uh, gigawatts of power, um, and that's going to be pumped hydro, which means you lose another 20 per cent when you pump the water uphill. So you're going to have to basically be able to provide six gigawatts uh, of power um, from the likes of renewable energy. So take, for example, windmills. Uh, sorry, wind turbines. Uh, they have a 40 per cent capacity, so you would have to provide 15 gigawatts of uh, wind power to basically make sure you could uh, have enough power if you were going to use this pumped hydro scheme every day to pump the water uphill. Uh, and to put that into context, Queensland on average uses between 9 to 10 gigawatts of power every day. So basically we're looking at building an enormous number of uh, wind turbines, massive area reclaimed in uh, flooding for these dams. Uh, and really, you know, anyone that tries to tell you that renewables are going to be good for the environment are kidding themselves. Uh, and can I say that if you ever do get up to Queensland, make sure you do go out and explore the Great Dividing Range because it's, you know, we often think about the Great Barrier Reef, but the Great Dividing Range in, in Queensland is a really beautiful part of the world, and it doesn't get uh, enough enough credit. I also spoke to uh, some uh, sugarcane farmers. 
uh, and of course they express their normal concerns about the control of pricing by Wilmont. Uh, that's always an ongoing issue, and I think we, you know, really have to ask ourselves why did we ever let our sugar mills uh, get wrapped up in the hands of foreign owners, only to have our uh, sugarcane farmers be held to the mercy of foreign conglomerates? Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. The month of May is the most painful month for the Ilam Tamils. Ilam Tamils have endured 14 years without any form of accountability from the Sri Lankan state who committed the most heinous genocide on Ilam Tamils. The no-fire zones were bombed continuously without any remorse, and today Tamil Ilam, the homeland of Ilam Tamils, that is being taken away from the Sri Lankan genocidal regime. The regime has committed genocidal actions from 1948, yet 2009 was at its peak. The peak of the genocide resulted in atrocities of rape, children being killed mercilessly and constant bombing, yet the world was silent. Ilam Tamils in the month of May will resist yet remember the heroes that fought till the end for their freedom. There have been intergenerational trauma that has been carried down to the Ilam Tamils due to the lack of justice received for the community. Mali Vakal will be remembered as the land of Tamil Ilam being burnt to the ground with thousands and those being tortured since then. The world must speak up, and the Australian government cannot continue to remain silent on this and stand with Ilam Tamils when engaging with the genocidal Sri Lankan government. Ilam Tamils fled their own homeland and now refugees in Australia are in fear of being deported to danger. I met one woman named Rita whose story reflects the atrocities experienced by Ilam Tamils in Sri Lanka and the ongoing violence suffered in Australia due to our dehumanising immigration policies. Rita's story is one of many, and I'll now read some words that she wrote to share. During the peak of the genocide in 2009, my husband died in Malavakal, in the so-called no-fire zone. My son was only 13 years old. The Sri Lankan army captured me and my son and put us in a camp for all the Elam Tamils who were captured. After I was released from the camp, the army and Sri Lanka police always come to my home to see who was living there. And one day when they came, I was sexually assaulted while my son and mother were in the next room. I live I lived in shame as the Sri Lankan authorities treated me less than an animal and, like an object, tossed me, tossed me over to the side with added trauma. A month after, I, after this, I left my homeland, Tamil Ilam, leaving my son with my mother to try and find a better solution for our family. My son was 16 year, years old when I left, as I had no choice but to leave. In 2009, when my son was 23 years old, he was studying in Sri Lanka, hoping to come here on a student visa. But before this could happen, he left with his friends and came here by plane. He left knowing there was no future in Sri Lanka for him. He has been in detention since then, which is now four years. His protection claim is refused. One of the main reasons was that he could not talk about my assault. It was too traumatic to relive those moments as he was only young when it occurred. He does not have to tell anyone. Now my son has been asked by Serco and Immigration when he would like to go back to Sri Lanka. The only remaining member of my family has been separated from me. Even with the announcement made by the government about people on temporary protection visas and CHEV getting permanent residency, 
I am unable to celebrate as my son is still in detention and facing deportation back to Sri Lanka where he will face a high danger of persecution. I want all refugees to be given permanency in this country. Ilam Tamils also want to acknowledge the ongoing genocide against our people. All refugees should be freed and given a new life, and they're certainly welcome here by First Nations Thank people. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Scar. Thank you, President. During the month of April, there were two incredibly important commemorations that occurred in Brisbane in my state of Queensland. The first was the Holocaust Remembrance Service, which took place on 16 April. And we should remember and we should note in this place that this year is the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was br brutally put down by the Nazi regime, but one reflects on the great heroism of those who participated and pay, pay respect to their courage. It was a very moving service this year, and I was particularly touched by the contribution of a number of young leaders from the Jewish community who made extraordinarily thoughtful presentations. And one of those contributors was Ms Hannah Mendels, who's the director, Queensland director of BTAR, which I understand is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. So rather than me express my views with respect to the commemoration, this important remembrance service. Let me quote from Hannah's speech on that day. And I quote, today is a day of mourning, a day of commemoration for who and what we lost during the Holocaust. As well, it serves as a reminder of what we have been through as a people and what we have overcome. It urges us to be proud of our heritage and wear our Judaism with pride. I like to think of my grandparents not just as survivors, but as heroes. Them, amongst thousands of others, fighting for our right to be Jewish, fighting for us to be here today, standing together with our Jewish community, honouring their memories. For that, I am proud." End quote. Well, can I say to you, Hannah, that I am sure the Jewish community is extraordinarily proud of you of the leadership which you are providing to the youth movement, uh, and I can hardly imagine how proud your grandparents would have been to have a granddaughter who gave such a moving speech at that commemoration on the 16th of April. The second important commemoration took place on 30 April, and that was a commemoration hosted by my dear friends in the Vietnamese community. And it commemorated the fall of Saigon to the communists on 30 April 1975. And this year is the 48th anniversary of the fall of Saigon. And it commemorated the loss of life, the sacrifices which were made, especially by those members of the uh, Republic, armed forces, the Republic of Vietnam, who fought courageously who fought courageously when many of, of their previous allies and international supporters did not support them in those final years. And it also commemorates the some 800,000 800, Vietnamese who lost their lives fleeing Vietnam after the communist takeover. And it is a blessing, a true blessing for this country that so many Vietnamese found a home in Australia and our Australian Vietnamese community is now an outstanding chapter in our history of Australia and makes such a wonderful contribution on so many levels. So it was extraordinarily proud on my, my part to be able to have the opportunity, I was extremely proud to have the opportunity to commemorate this very significant anniversary, tragic anniversary, with our wonderful Australian Vietnamese community. And I'm sure the best respect I can play pay to our Australian Vietnamese community is to tell the story of one of the Australian soldiers who fought in Vietnam and who passed away this year. And I would like to, at the outset, thank my good friend Arnie Peggy Tiderman for bringing 
this matter to my attention. So Mr Richard Dickey Bly passed away this year, having fought and courageously served his nation and fought for the freedom of the Vietnamese against the communists in that tragic war. Richard Bly was a proud Wacka Wacka man. He was born in Kingaroy. He spent a time living in Mitchell in my home state of Queensland. And he married Carol Fogarty from Barcaldon. He and Carol had three children, Sally, Janelle and Terence. And Terence actually followed his father into the Australian Army. But perhaps rather than me uh, say some words about, uh, about Richard Dickey, Dickey Bly, it's probably best if I actually quote from some of his comrades and what they said about him. And one of those comrades was former Governor General, Major General Michael Jeffrey, who was, the commanding, who was his commanding officer in Vietnam and was a long-time friend. And this is what the former Governor General said about Richard Dickey Bly. Corporal Richard Dickey Bly was one of my best junior battlefield leaders in Vietnam and a friend to this day. In the trauma of war, we all learnt it was not the colour of one's skin that mattered, but the colour of one's heart." End quote. One of his comrades at the funeral, which was held in Perth on 30 March 2023, also told some stories of which, which gave an insight into the regard in which he was held by his fellow soldiers. And as I said, uh, Dicky Richard Bly, was a forward scout, so he served in one of the most dangerous positions you could possibly serve in that conflict. And he was deeply respected and deeply regarded. And I think this story reflects better than any how deeply regarded he was. And let me quote. In the Australian War Memorial, there was a photo of Corporal Joe Dunniluck with an Aboriginal soldier taken on the Long High Hills. It was taken in February 1970. Both of these soldiers were from 6th Platoon, and this is a story in the words of one of the uh, veterans who served with Dickie Bly. And this veteran had gone to the Australian War Memorial and seen this photo. When Corporal Danny Luck saw this, he was incensed. He was incensed because what he saw was a photograph of a corporal who was identified, but the actual, actual caption of the photograph was the corporal with an Aboriginal soldier, so it didn't actually give Dickie's name. When Corporal Dunniluck saw this, he was incensed. He rang the Australian War Memorial and told them there was not just an Aboriginal soldier, that was Lance Corporal Richard Dickey Bly. Suffice to say, caption was rectified and, and the Australian War Memorial duly apologised. This typifies the respect and esteem held by his fellow soldiers. Your past will always be remembered and your reunions and get-togethers, your mates and fellow soldiers will have many stories to tell. Rest easy, old mate." End quote. And that's a quote from one of those who served with Richard Dickey Bly. I pay tribute to him. I pay tribute to his family. I acknowledge their deep loss, their sorry business, and I pay tribute in this year, when we, when we, which we note as the 50th anniversary of the return of Australian soldiers from Vietnam. I pay tribute to all those who served in Vietnam. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Throughout history, women have been quietly going about their work. They have been the gatherers, the caregivers, the cheer squad, the homemakers, the breadwinners. Women play many roles. Every single day we are surrounded by amazing, inspiring women who, without fear or favour and without seeking recognition, do things that are ordinary to them, but all add up to something extraordinary. Like precious diamonds, women are forged under pressure. For years, women have worked hard, campaigned for their rights and have earned their seat at the table, even in the political arena like this one. And recent research has shown women are nearly always the carriers of the mental load the term given to the myriad of decisions that need to be made that relate to the management of a household. Women don't often seek out accolades. They just get on with the task of what needs to be done, whether that's at home or at work or in the community. They see a need and they fill it. 
which is why initiatives like the Tasmanian Honour Roll of Women are so important for recognising the women in our lives who are undertaking the quiet pursuit of the extraordinary. The Tasmanian Honour Roll of Women was created in 2005 by the Tasmanian Government to honour Tasmanian women who have made an outstanding contribution to the state. And I'm proud to note that my late mother, Elaine Bushby, was listed on the honour roll in 2017 for community service throughout her life. The honour roll encourages the community to learn and discover the achievements of the women in their lives and honour their historical and contemporary contributions to Tasmania, ensuring these achievements are given full recognition and not forgotten by the passage of time. The 2023 recipients of the Tasmanian Honour Roll were announced at the annual function in Launceston recently, where 35 women and one organisation were inducted, and what an inspiring afternoon it was. The event was hosted by Southern Cross news anchor Kim Miller and was made extra special by the attendance of Tasmanian Minister for Women, Jo Palmer, who before her election as member for Rosevears was the previous long-term MC of the event. Hearing the inspiring women's stories was incredible, and while they are all wildly different, none were less deserving. Every single one of them left me in awe at the depth of talent in my home state of Tasmania. Like the story of the late Gwendolyn Hesketh, MBE, who was awarded for her work leading a team providing relief in post-war Europe and her outstanding commitment to the Girl Guide movement. Gwen, as she was known, joined the Girl Guides in 1924 and became captain of Launceston St Aidan's Guide Company before moving to the rank of commandant. Following the outbreak of World War II, Gwen was asked to help train members of the Australian Women's Land Army and Civil Evacuation Committee. She undertook a gruelling nine-day commando training course in the Welsh Mountains to prove her fitness for the job, which included harsh physical training, semi-starvation and sleep deprivation. She joined the Guide International Service, where she was deployed to Germany, where she acted as liaison officer between the British occupation authorities and voluntary bodies in the field. Though recalled several times, Gwen refused to return home. When the Guide International Service wound up in 1951, Gwen was the last Australian to leave. Women like Gwen have been serving their communities for decades, and it's through community and business organisations like Girl Guides that have opened them up to opportunity. Several of the 2023 Tasmanian Honour Roll of Women inductees have served their communities through local government, the closest level of government, to the communities in which they serve. One of the 2023 recipients is Dr Mary Dunningham, who may well be known to some in this chamber following her elevation as the first female mayor of the Waratah Wynyard Municipality last year. Her son, my colleague Senator John O'Dunningham, has spoken of her achievements in this place previously, but I'm very happy to repeat them. Dr Dunningham was first elected to the Council in 2005 and was elected Deputy Mayor in 2014. Being involved in local government led Dr Dunningham to undertake a research project into female civic leadership in Tasmania. She is actively involved in her community. She is a representative on the Tasmanian Women's Council, Chair of the Australian Local Government Women's Association Tasmania, Deputy Patron of Surf, Surf Life Saving Tasmania and current member of the Rural Clinical School Community Advisory Board. What a list of accolades. Another civic leader worthy of attention who was inducted to the honour roll this year is West Tamer Mayor Christina Homdale, who was elected to that council in 2009 and is the current mayor. She's also the president of the Local Government Association of Tasmania. Christina was born to Polish parents in a refugee camp in Germany and immigrated with them to Australia in 1949. The family lived in camps in Victoria and Tasmania before settling in North Hobart. She started her career in television, film journal journalism at TVT6 in Hobart before working for the Tasmanian Government Film Unit, where she produced contact on issues impacting Tasmania. When Christina retired to Clarence Point in northern Tasmania, an issue that concerned her greatly was the state of the West Tamer Highway, a road she travelled daily. She joined the Northern Ratepayers Association, which successfully lobbied the state government to fix the Supply River section of the highway. Christina remains a vocal lobbyist for continued improvement of the highway and has secured state government funding from the current Tasmanian Liberal government. And I'm pleased to say that improvement works are now underway in preparation for the construction of the new Lagana School. Christina is an active volunteer in the arts and small business community and was the inaugural chair of the Festival of Golden Words, now the Tamer Valley Writers' Festival. Her skill with words has led to great outcomes for the West Tamer community and has led 
to the region becoming one of the fastest growing areas of Launceston and northern Tasmania. The Tamer Valley Writers' Festival has produced some inspiring leaders among this crop of inductees, with outgoing festival director Mary Machen also among the 2023 inductees. Mary has also been inspired by creative talent and is a wordsmith at heart. Beginning her writing career as a cadet journalist at the Examiner newspaper in Launceston, the third oldest newspaper in Australia. In 2009, she took on the role of arts and cultural writer with the paper and had always felt passionate about volunteering and giving back to a sector of the community she felt was often undervalued, the arts. Her first board role was with Tasmania's premier food festival, Festivali, which recently had a bumper 2023 event with its triumphant return to City Park following a COVID-interrupted hiatus. Mary served on the board of Festivali from 2003 to 2009 and since then has also held roles on the boards of Junctions Art Festival, the QV Mag Arts Foundation, the QV Mag Friends and has been co-convener of Friends of Theatre North and judge for the Theatre Council of Tasmania Awards. Mary's passion for words has been a thread that has pulled throughout her life and culminated with her role as president and festival director of the Tamer Valley Writers Festival, which she stepped down from in 2022. The Tamer Valley Writers Festival has come to be recognised as one of Australia's premier literary, literary festivals, and while she was at the helm, a crowd of more than 3,500 people attended the 2019 iteration of the event. The Tasmanian Honour Roll of Women is about ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and no one illustrates that more than Barbara Baker. Hospice care nurse Barb completed her nurse training at Launceston St Vincent's Hospital, where she realised that end-of-life nursing was an area where she could make a difference. Over 30 years, she developed a strong passion for palliative care and was a founding member of Philip Oakton Hospice, which opened in 1993. Barb was one of the nurses at the hospice that cared for my father in the last weeks of life, just months after it opened. When the hospice closed in 2007, Northern Tasmania was left with no public palliative care beds. Barb has been tireless with her advocacy for the need for public palliative care beds and the hospice model for years, and lobbied local, state and federal politicians for 15 years for funding to re-establish a hospice in Launceston. All of Barb's work finally paid off when, during last year's election campaign, Barb was successful at securing bipartisan funding for a new hospice at the Launceston General Hospital. Work on developing that hospice is part of the Tasmanian Liberal Government's LGH Master Plan, which is currently underway. Every single one of the 35 women inducted to the Tasmanian Honour Roll is deserving of the title, but it is only a small fraction of the women who are out there every day creating tangible and positive outcomes for their community. Tonight, I've highlighted just a few. I want to take this opportunity to recognise each one of them and thank them for their hard work in making their communities a better place. We are indebted to you for your work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator Askew. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9 a.m.